The Reverse Cinderella Written by Josephine Beintema Narrated by Josephine Beintema The Reverse Cinderella Chapter 1 As you can see, this is the cafeteria. It's called the green cafeteria because of its wall color. Through that door is the blue cafeteria. The blue cafeteria is for students who need complete silence. They might be studying for an exam while they eat, so it's important not to disturb anyone in the blue cafeteria. Sometimes the blue cafeteria is closed for special events. In that case, you can always go to the silent study room in Wing D. However, there is no food allowed there. Please follow me, and we'll go through Wing C, where media studies are held. Paget droned on about the school and its various features leading two high school age kids who looked way too young to be applying to college. Was she ever that young, she wondered? She supposed so, maybe when she had married Gary. Ugh. They were trailed by their respective parents, who seemed more interested in the tour than the kids, who kept eyes glued to their cell phones or occasionally rolling them in the humiliation of having such caring parents. Excuse me, Paige, is there a washroom around here? Paget smiled tolerantly. It's Paget. Washrooms are back by the cafeteria. Thanks. The parent with the small bladder took his second pit stop in the one-hour tour and forced the small group to wait until his return. Does anyone have any questions while we wait? Paget asked. Are there counseling services available? One mum asked. I think Michelle could really benefit from them. Mom, it's Mitchie, the humiliated teen whined. Why can't you call me by my name? It's not your name, the mother hissed. Michelle is a beautiful name, after your great-grandmother. She gave us an inheritance for your education. The least you can do is honor her. Paget closed her eyes and tuned out the argument. Really, how did it come to this? Thirty-four years old, no job skills, going to college again, heavily in debt, and giving tours of the campus as part of the student work program. Oh, wait, she remembered whose fault it was. Gary. Her double timing, not as rich as he pretended, deceptively charming idiot husband who had at least had the good fortune to die in a freak elevator accident. Probably his fault, of course, so the settlement had to take that into account. But I'm not bitter, Paget thought to herself. Not at all. Okay, maybe a little. Mostly, she just couldn't believe how naive she had been. She married him in college, dropped out, became a perfect trophy wife, dieting, exercising, cooking, having a maid, having expensive clothes, and showcasing his wealth to his clients. She was dutiful. She was perfect, not a hair out of place. She parroted his opinions and was a total flake. Then Paget found out he was cheating with his 22-year-old secretary. How original, right? They took counseling decided to start a family. He was charming, he was repentant. Paget forgave him. Then, four years later, she found out two important facts that he had neglected to tell her. First, he was enjoying extra sessions with his trainer, Misty. Another young blonde. Paget guessed he had a thing for them. Second, he neglected to tell her he'd had a vasectomy. Makes it so much easier not to get caught in an unwanted pregnancy if he forgot the condom. Of course, a vasectomy doesn't stop STDs, especially when Misty had one. Which is how Paget found out he was cheating on her again. He brought home some of his extracurricular activities. Plus, the let's have a family phase of their relationship was a total lie, since he'd done the snip and omit that little detail from his wife, just like so much else in Gary's life. Scumbag, slimeball, sleazy skunk. Worse than the lowest of the low, dung-encrusted. Hi, the small bladder man waved his hand in front of Paget's face. We can get back to the tour now. Paget fake smiled and hoped she hadn't been muttering out loud. Okay, here's our media section. On your left, you'll find the broadcasting booths where we have live radio going out from the campus. Paget automatically droned on about the tour to her little group. She'd been giving them for the past year now and knew the details inside and out. After the first fifty times, she found it boring, but it did give a small count of cash to her meager finances. Ha! <laughs> Who was she kidding? She was worse than broke and needed every penny she could get. 
books were enough to set her into the red, and then there was tuition and other necessities of life. She blamed Gary. She blamed herself. After the Misty incident, Paget threatened divorce, but never went through with it. If she had, she might have gotten something, some settlement. As it was, she hung on for two more years in a loveless marriage because her friends and mother cautioned her not to leave him. She had no marketable skills. What was she going to do? She had no money to her name. It would be a messy, long, drawn-out divorce. And what would Paget live off in the meanwhile? Not that she couldn't reach out to them, poor her. But really, how was she going to live? Please don't take me up on my offer to have you stay in my guest home, said their gossipy eyes. Besides, good girls don't leave their husbands, and plenty of men cheat. Just think of the trade-off of being a trophy wife. Ask for more vacations, jewelry, stuff instead. How naive, Paget reflected. If she would have left, she might have gotten some cash out of the deal. She waited too long, and the economy stopped growing. Not much of a real recession, but enough of a stop that Gary moved money to the wrong accounts, the high-risk investments, hoping to recoup enough to live the lifestyle that he wanted. He was already in trouble, and that didn't help their situation. Of course, Paget was oblivious. She didn't know that he was chasing one credit card with another, overextended already with the latest loans to keep up on the vacation home, the new yearly cars, the vacations in expensive restaurants, club memberships, and whatever else he managed to spend it all on. Then it came all crashing down. Literally, for Gary. How's that for karma? It was hot. One of those really hot, muggy days in summer where the sun just can beat down on you if you are outside for too long. Gary was riding the elevator down from the 26th floor of the financial firm where he pretended to work. Mostly he smoothed people, moved money around in accounts, and hoped no one would notice that he was skimming off the top. Today was not his lucky day. The power went out. The elevator came to a standstill and stayed still for hours. Turns out the company had cheaped out and not gotten the call bell in the elevator fixed. Gary might have rung it numerous times, but no one knew. What they did know was that it got hot in the elevator shaft. Paget knew her husband, and he did not handle the heat well. After approximately three hours in the elevator, Gary decided to take matters into his own hands. He tried to open the doors. He only got them open about an inch. When that didn't work... He went through the access port in the roof of the car. Why didn't he call for help with a cell phone? Turns out the idiot forgot it in his office. It was sitting neatly in a drawer with some lurid text from Sally on it. Yes, another leggy young blonde piece on the side. It really shouldn't come as a surprise by now. What he thought he was going to do on the top of the elevator car, Paget would never know. Nor if he was responsible for what happened next, or if it was just more... Poor maintenance. Since Gary was broke, there was no money to investigate. The company says that Gary must have been at fault and did something to the gears or switches or whatever it is that holds the car stationary. As such, he made his life insurance void, not that he didn't cash most of it out already, and promptly spend it. The car became unstuck, but without electricity to guide it, there was a malfunction, and it plunged down the shaft, taking Gary with it. A one in a trillion chance. Gary was always lucky like that. After his death, Paget found out that while Gary had made lots of money, he'd more than spent it. They were in the red past their eyeballs. She couldn't technically even afford his funeral. It was a nightmare. All their grieving, sympathetic friends dried up faster than the funds. Paget declared bankruptcy. Bankruptcy financially, emotionally, physically, just bankrupt. She nearly moved back in with her parents, but the tight look on her mother's face indicated that this was not the best idea. It was enough that she had blackened the family name by being so gauche as to not have money. It would be worse to have to tell her social circle that one of her children had to move back home. Instead, her mother and her father offered her financial support, which Paget turned down. She still had some pride left. Now she worked at a cafe and attended school while raking up debt. Paget was pursuing old dreams, crossing her fingers, and hoping for the best. "'Hey, Red, you coming to the mixer tonight at Barney's?' Adam asked. It was always calling her Red because of her auburn hair. "'Probably not, Adam. 
Paget replied to a rather approximate replica of Hurley from Lost. Except for the green hair, he was a ringer. Of course, most of these kids probably didn't even know the series. Hardly anyone under twenty-five seemed to watch television any more. Maybe, if the series made it to Netflix, they'd call it retro or something. The thought made her feel old. Come on, it'll be great. We're splitting for the new veggie nacho tray. He waggled his eyebrows at her. Since when are vegetables sexy? She smiled despite herself. He was entertaining and always trying to get her to hang out with his friends. Hey, there's cheese and corn chips. I'm in and so are you. I won't take no for an answer. He tossed over his shoulder as he continued down the hall. We'll see, Paget called back. Mitchie, Michelle, or whatever her name was, snorted. Fat chance, fat boy. Paget smiled in a non-friendly way. Hey, Mom, you mentioned counseling. Why don't we drop in on student services next? I think the offices are even open right now. We can discuss what is and what is not appropriate for conduct at college. After the tour, she headed for the cafe that she was now forced to work at. Okay, Paget thought. She was lucky to get a job there, especially since she had never worked a day in her life until she was hired. It paid for things like groceries when she wasn't nabbing food from the cafe at a discounted price. Paget nodded at Dix, the ever-present co-worker who was waiting for her big break in the art world. She put on an apron to get ready for her shift. How are things going today? Three misguided souls tried to hit on me. Two people didn't know what they ordered and pretended I had made a mistake, and we know that never happens. Dick sighed, blowing her black and blue hair out of her face. It was boring. I'm in the middle of a masterpiece and I have to come to work to pay the rent. <laughs> it's hard when reality interferes with living, Paget agreed. I hear there's a party going on at Barney's tonight. The bar? Dix asked. Do you know another Barney's? Paget raised an eyebrow. I didn't think you'd be into going to a bar. Dick said as she dumped the remains of old coffee and started a new pot. Her movements were efficient on her small body. She was one of the few people that Paget knew who was shorter than her five-foot-four frame. Normally I'm not, Paget replied. She made a face. I should probably study anyway, since by some miracle I have a short shift. <laughs> Don't remind me, Dix groaned. I still have to work three hours after you leave to make up for that stupid launch I tried to do with Giorgio. Good thing I didn't put too much money into it. I thought it was going to make your career, Paget asked as she started sorting packets into their appropriate containers. Total scam, and I fell for it. Giorgio didn't have any big clients looking for new artists. He just wanted money from us amateurs. He didn't even rent the building where the exhibit was supposed to take place. Just took the money and ran. I'm glad I only paid enough for one space rather than the three I thought about. I paid out for a cab, and when I got to the address, there was no gallery. Dix, I'm so sorry, she sympathized. Dix waved away her words. Lesson learned. I just hate that I was that stupid. Next time you'll check it out before committing, Paget refilled the cups. If you need someone to go with you, I can. I think I'll stick to art in the park in the street. You'll never get discovered that way. Plus, you won't make as much money. And how safe can it be selling art on a sidewalk? Maybe I'll get arrested by a cute cop. Dix flashed her a dimpled grin. Stop worrying about me, Mom. Paget rolled her eyes. You are too cool to be my daughter. Got that right. Dix helped a customer and then returned to their conversation. If you do go to Barney's, I want a full accounting of what happened. Why don't you just come yourself? Paget asked. And be your plus one? No, thanks. I'm in the middle of my masterpiece. Dix ran a rag and cleaner over the counter. Besides, how else are you going to meet someone? Dix was always in the middle of a masterpiece. To be fair, she did really good art, and Paget knew that some day she would be pointing to her friend and saying, I knew her before she was famous. Until then, Dix basically devoted her life to the cafe, her art, and trying to deal with her psychologist's parents, who were far too supportive of their daughter. Dix avoided her parents as much as possible. Paget had the feeling she avoided almost anyone else as much as possible, too. Not the plan. Just a fun night out, unless I stay in and study, which is what I will probably end up doing anyways, Paget sighed. Life was dull. She was making progress, working toward her goal, but it was a little boring. She knew that being the top ten of her class was going to be critical, 
to getting her an internship which would propel her onto the airwaves. But it wasn't exactly glamorous studying about rules and regulations. Shrugging, she ignored the voice in her head that wanted to have fun at Barney's, and kept up with the steady flow of customers coming in for the supper hour. Four hours later, Paget was home. She lingered at the mirror in her tiny apartment bathroom, ignoring the steady dripping from the bathroom sink, and critically eyed her body. She felt she had put on the freshman fifteen, only on her it was more like twenty. It was hard to keep the weight off, though. She'd reached that age where it just seemed to want to stay, and Paget had no time for eating or exercising right. She was no longer a size three. If it wasn't for the fact that she had not much money for food, she probably would have gained fifty pounds, because when she was depressed, she ate, and Gary had given her a lot to be depressed about. Wasn't walking great exercise? It wasn't like going to the gym, but she pretty much walked everywhere since she could no longer afford a car with a driver. Yes, Paget had been spoiled, she knew. She couldn't afford the gym or the trainer any more either. Maybe she would pick up one of the home videos, a DVD workout. That could work, she reasoned. Paget leaned forward and eyed a new wrinkle creeping across her forehead without permission. She tried to rub it out with her hand, but of course it didn't work. It wasn't like her finger was a magic eraser. She missed Dr. Leonard and Botox so much. Paget was getting older, had no prospects, no kids, a lot of debt and loans, and now wrinkles and excess fat. If Gary were still alive, she'd ask for liposuction, but that was no longer an option. What a step down life had given her, she reflected. She looked at the pile of textbooks and her computer. She should study. This was the first Friday night off that she'd had in weeks, and she could make good use of it, but Paget couldn't find any motivation. With a sigh, she moved to her closet and remembered that top she'd gotten from the thrift store a couple of weeks back. She'd gone from Saks to Salvation Army. But the top was cute and called to her, even though she really had nowhere appropriate to wear it. Then again, Paget slipped it on and went back to the mirror. With the discount jeans and a pair of heels, maybe a quick brush of her hair, an extra layer of mascara, and she'd be ready to go. Barney's, here I come, she thought. It's been years since she'd been to a college party, and by the time she got to Barney's, it was packed. The bar was four deep in people trying to get drinks, pay for drinks, and get their drinks back to their table. The music was loud and the wait for any food long. She would be lucky to get a chair. Threading her way through the crowd, there was a sudden cheer from her left, and she saw Adam with his friends waving at her excitedly. Part of her was flattered that they wanted her to join this group so much. They'd even saved a seat for Paget. Then she was bumped from behind, and a guy with an enormous tray of drinks sidled past her, putting down the tray on the table and taking the available seat. Everyone reached forward to grab their drinks, and Adam waved Paget over. "'You made it!' Adam shouted. "'We have beer if you'd like some.' "'Oh, no thanks. I'm more of a wine drinker,' she shouted back. "'Hey, take my spot and I'll get you a glass,' the beer guy yelled. He was in rather cute in a grungy, haven't showered or shaved in a weak way older than the regular college crowd, more Paget's age. That's okay, Paget said. I can get it. No, you'll get crushed, or worse yet, some guy will hit on you before I can, he grinned at her and offered her his chair. Please, have a seat. Thanks. It was hard to turn him down. It was rather handsome when he smiled like that. Plus, it was the only available chair, and she had no intention of standing all night in these shoes. "'What kind of wine?' his voice said beside her ear as he leaned down to catch her answer. "'Chateau Margot,' Paget stopped herself. Sometimes it was hard to remember that the places she went to wouldn't have such wines, and even if they did, there was no way she could afford a bottle of that equated to the amount of her monthly rent. "'Sorry, house brand. Red.' "'Will do.' Within a moment he was lost in the crowd. "'Isn't he hot?' one of the girls asked, giggling. Oh, Max is a little old for you, Adam grinned then and winked at Paget. I was hoping to set him up with Paget here. In fact, I think he likes her already. Adam, Paget warned, I'm not looking for anyone right now. Hey, you never know, he said innocently to her. We met Max a couple of weeks ago. Every time we're here, it's such a crush that we just pay for his beer and he gets us our drinks. It makes it so much easier, Mariah said. Plus, he's a lot of fun to hang around. "'You just met him and hang out with him now?' Paget asked. 
Part of her was surprised by the casual acceptance that these kids had with others. Didn't anyone warn them that people could be serial killers? She tried to shoo her mother's cynical voice out of her head, but it persisted. What did an older guy want with a bunch of college kids anyhow? Wasn't it sort of creepy? Never mind that she was an older woman hanging with them, since she was technically a college attendee too. Sure, we met him at the park on Elm Street. Mariah cupped her hands under a nacho loaded with cheese and veggies as she brought it to her mouth. Mmm, you've got to try these. They are so good. Like Freddy Krueger, Elm Street? Once again, Paget's mouth ran ahead of her brain. She grimaced after she made the comment. Huh? Six pairs of puzzled eyes looked at her. A old movie. Never mind. Paget felt she was showing her age again. She mentally winced and braided herself to keep current so she wouldn't endure more blank stares. Sasha typed away into his mobile phone, and then held it up for everyone to see. It's a horror flick. Nightmare on Elm Street. That's funny. A collective of nods went around the table before they launched into a discussion about how to strategize the best way to win the game of Catan. Paget let the conversation wash over her. She'd never played the game and really didn't know what the appeal was. Lost in her thoughts, she nearly jumped out of her skin when a husky voice talked in her ear. I have no idea what they're talking about. Max set the wine on the table. Can I have my seat back? Um, sure. Paget automatically stood and then realized that she would have nowhere to sit. She picked up her wine glass and wondered how awkward this was going to be with her being the only one standing. Have a seat. Max was pointing to his leg, offering her to sit on him. Paget raised an eyebrow. I don't know you that well. But you could, he smiled suggestively. Don't worry, I promise to behave. Nothing the lady doesn't want. Already, Paget's feet were starting to hurt. She walked to the bar in these shoes because they were so pretty, but pretty did not equal comfortable. They were in a public place, and it wasn't like he could really do anything. I promise not to bite, nor fill you up. At least not today. Sit down and enjoy yourself, his brown eyes twinkled. Paget rolled her eyes and perched gingerly on his leg. He was muscular, had slightly curly black hair that was in desperate need of a cut, and smelled distinctly male, like grass and sweat. It wasn't entirely pleasant. He must have come directly from work instead of showering first. She wondered if he did landscaping for a living. He was so tan. "'So, what do you do?' Paget asked brilliantly. "'Me?' "'No, the guy behind you.' Paget said as she cocked her head to the side to study him a little better. Max laughed. I do some consulting and supervising here and there. Right now I'm on a bit of a vacation while I wait for some paperwork to clear, just enjoying life a little while. That's cool. Paget took a sip of wine and noticed that his hand had crept around her and now was resting on her hip comfortably. Planning any neat activities? Mostly just seeing where life takes me. Max took a drink of beer. Are you one of their professors? Me? No, the guy behind you. He repeated her words back to her. Paget laughed without really meaning to. No, I've gone back to school. Sadly, I am one of the students. Why is that sad? I think it's great. It's important to learn new things. When he smiled, she realized he was missing a molar right behind his top left canine tooth. I'm reading a book on astrology so I can name the stars when I see them in the sky. So far, I have only one chapter in, but it's pretty interesting. What are you studying? Media and broadcast studies. When I was younger, I always wanted to be on the radio or in television news. Then why didn't you pursue it when you were younger? Paget shrugged and took a sip of wine. It was surprisingly okay for a house brand. Not that she was any connoisseur of cheap wines. I suppose life got in the way. No, it may be a little late. How's that? Paget nodded at Adam. He keeps telling me TV and radio are dead, that they are on their way out. The world just hasn't realized it yet. Oh, I don't know. There are televisions still in the bar here. Sure enough, there were a number of guys looking at the highlights of the latest baseball games. Hmm, Adam says the percentage of cord cutters and cord nevers is rising. Those are people who never subscribe to satellite or cable, Paget explained. It's risen to 56 million people in America alone. You googled it, he guessed. Yes. Makes me think that I should have chosen something more sensible to study, like insurance. Oh, I don't know. Maybe you're in at the perfect time. He really did have the most amazing chocolate-colored eyes. 
she dragged her attention away from them. "'What do you mean?' "'It's been my experience. When one industry is dying, another industry comes up to take its place. It's not that these people aren't consuming material. They're just getting their material from a different source.' Max nodded to the group. "'See how many of them have a phone? Cell phones are the new television, radio, personal assistant, social network, whatever a person needs. The trend is shifting from one device to another. Rather like the oven to the microwave, only faster this time. And since you're smart enough to realize this, you're ahead of anyone who doesn't. You just need to figure out how to translate what you're learning to the Internet, to social media, to programs like Netflix. That's how you get ahead of the curve.' "'Pretty smart for a landscaper.' During their conversation, one of her hands had crept up to rest along his broad shoulders. It was easier to balance on his leg that way. At least, that's what she told herself. I hadn't thought of it like that. Glad I could change your perspective. Hey, it's so nice you guys could hang out with your mom and dad. A troop of sorority girls stopped and the ringleader's voice was sugary sweet. I mean, it's hard to have real friends, but you'll always have your parents. The group paused, embarrassed by the public taunting that being thrown their way. "'Are we that old?' Max asked Paget. "'We're not that old.' Thanks to the three-inch heels, Paget could look at the ringleader in the eye, who was smiling satisfaction over her barb. "'Really?' Paget asked. "'Do you really need to make people feel bad? Is there something wrong with you that makes you feel better to put other people down? We're just having a nice night, so I'd appreciate it if you'd go away.' The girls glared at Paget, and Paget glared right back. She was through dealing with people like this girl. People who belittled others because they had less. Less money, less time, less knowing the right people, not having the right job. Less, like Paget now was. Did I ask you to psychoanalyze me? She looked at Paget up and down like she was some particularly foul thing. Somebody should, Paget muttered. You need therapy if you're this mean all the time. The next thing Paget knew, a cold beer was being poured down the front of her shirt. Ha! The sorority girl practically yelled her triumph in Paget's face. Let's go, girls! The posse beat a hasty retreat to the crowd, and Paget was left dripping wet, and the next table of college guys were torn between ogling her breasts and laughing. There was clapping from Adam's table, the table of nerves that Paget had just defended. Way to go, Red! Paget gave a weak smile to them and tried to hold her sopping shirt away from her chest. Whoa, who knew girls could be so mean? Max's sexy voice said in Paget's ear, and he offered a handful of napkins, which weren't going to be enough. Paget took the napkins from Max and rubbed uselessly at her front. Why don't you go to the washroom and change your shirt? Because I don't have another one? Look, guys, thanks for the evening, but I will think I'll just head home, Paget smiled through their protests. It's all good. I'll just pay for the wine and go. No, we got the wine, Adam said. Please don't go. We're having so much fun. You can have mine. Excuse me? Paget looked up into those deep chocolate eyes. They really were something. His voice was good, too, low and sexy. My shirt. I'm wearing a tee under this one. He literally stripped right in front of her. Well, one shirt, anyways. Underneath, sure enough, he had a second shirt on. He offered the bundle of shirt in his hand to her. Um, Paget wasn't sure what to do. It wasn't like he was the cleanest person in the world. Then again, she had beer on her. Probably backspit, too, from whoever had been drinking that beer. Hey, sexy mama, I'll give you my shirt. A boy near Paget started to take his tee off, and he wasn't wearing anything underneath. Anyone could tell he'd had gym time. Suddenly, more shirts were being handed her way. Quickly, Paget took Max's shirt and made a beeline for the restrooms. She knew that her face was past fire engine red. She was blushing that deeply. Past her hair color red. She had seen chests before. She had seen a man strip before. Well, she would seen Gary and her husband had been unimpressive. He'd gone to the gym and stuff, but wasn't into having muscles. Mainly, he ran. Had to keep down the paunch. Did it say something that she'd rather risk dirty shirt than dealing with seeing a man's chest when she wasn't married to him, she wondered? Or maybe because it was they were boys, not men. These college kids were half her age. She could have been their mom. If she'd had babies early, she thought ruefully. If she'd had babies at all, which didn't seem like it was going to happen. Tick, 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 said the biological clock. She'd been widowed for a year. She was on year two of her college education. There was no time, nor money to date, and everyone at the college was younger than her or a married teacher. 
Plus, it wasn't like she could date from the pool people she had used to belong to. Paget didn't belong with them any more since she was now poor. And Paget didn't really know how to date. Gary had been her one and only. They'd had dated for half a year, and then he'd proposed. He'd done everything. The chasing, the asking, the paying. Paget had gone along with it and thought her future was set. Big laugh, that was. Paget waited for her turn in a stall, and swapped out the soaking shirt for the dry one after she toweled herself off as best as she could with toilet paper. She smelled of beer. Some men would say that was sexy. Paget thought it was gross. In the old days she would have thrown out the shirt and bought another later. These days she wrung it out as best as she could, wrapped it in toilet paper, and shoved it into her bag. She could wash it and see if it was salvageable. With a sigh, Paget exited the stall and looked into the bathroom mirror to see the now familiar wrinkles stare back at her from her forehead. Now only she had a wrinkled shirt that was far too big for her to match. Too casual as well, since she was wearing heels. Too bad. It was all that she had, she reflected. To give herself confidence, Paget put on another layer of mascara and wiped the lip gloss over her lips. There. Squaring her shoulders in the ridiculously large Henley, she pushed the sleeves up to her elbows and hoped it wouldn't keep trying to fall off one of her shoulders. There was nothing else to do, so she left the safety of the washroom to rejoin the group who were listening with awe to Max. Without skipping a beat, he offered his leg for Paget to perch on again, and kept up the animated narrative. Brian was stuck. He couldn't get out. His arms were tangled straight up in the parachute that had gone wrong, and we were maybe five thousand feet in the air. If he couldn't get untangled and get the emergency chute out, he was going to die when we hit the earth. The problem was, the wind kept getting the bunched-up parachute above his head, and he didn't have the strength to pull it down. No one did. He was lucky it hadn't ripped off his arms. The ground was getting closer, and I thought, he's screwed. I hadn't pulled my chute, and I was the only one besides Brian that was plummeting that fast. I did the only thing I could do. As Paget sat, he wrapped an arm around her again by lightly resting a hand on her hip. That sure looks good on you. Thanks, and thank you for the loan of it, she replied. The entire group leaned forward, waiting to see what he'd say as he took a sip of beer. What did you do? Adam all but screamed, needing to know them right now. Max smiled. I had my pocket knife on me, and I cut the parachute so Brian's arms were free. I pulled the string that lets the damaged parachute release, then pulled the emergency chute. Brian rocketed upward, and I waited long enough for him to clear before pulling my own cord for my parachute. Brian ended up with two dislocated shoulders. I broke an ankle and dislocated my knee when I landed, but hey, what are friends for? The group murmured with awe and amazement over Max's off-handed bravery. Paget herself was impressed, and hope he wasn't just making the story up. Even if he was, it was a great one, and no wonder the kids bought him drinks if he was giving that quality of entertainment every week. Skydiving? Paget asked. I used to, Max smiled. Max used to do a lot of things. Skydiving, mountain snowboarding, scuba diving for shipwrecks. Adam had a bit of a case of hero worship, it was easy to see. Max laughed. Oh, I'm too old for all that stuff. It's a young guy thing. Plus, I feel every bone I've ever broken each time there's rain. Wish I could do that sort of stuff. Adam gulped down some beer. Sasha agreed. I'd be too afraid, but it sounds awesome. You can, Max was confident, and at Adam's look of disbelief he continued. If you can't swim, you can snorkel. If you can snorkel, you can scuba. You might not be a skier, but skydiving is all about pulling the chute at the right time and being safe. It's thrilling. There was more conversation and more alcohol and nachos flowed. Paget had to admit it was a pretty good time, and she wasn't really all that uncomfortable sitting perched on Max's leg. Finally, Paget had to call it a night. She was getting tired, and she had to work at the cafe tomorrow. The kids elected to stay, but Max walked with her outside. "'Why don't I walk you home?' he asked. "'It's okay,' Paget assured him. She'd only just met him, and her mother's voice of warning about all sorts of freaks to avoid was racing through her head, even though he'd been a perfect gentleman all night long. "'I've walked home plenty of times.' "'In this neighborhood at this time of night?' Max shook his head. "'No, you definitely should have me walk you home.' I won't come into your building. Just make sure you get in, okay? Then who will walk you home? Paget raised an eyebrow. Or is this a double standard sort of thing? Definitely a double standard thing. How else do I get to be the hero if I don't get to walk you home? Max swung an arm around her shoulders. He was very friendly. 
Of course, it could be the slight buzz speaking. Everyone should have the chance to be a hero. I recommend it. Unfortunately, it has its downsides. What's the downside? Paget rolled her eyes and pulled his arm off her shoulders. She decided he was harmless as she hooked her arm through his as they walked. He leaned in and whispered in her ear, It's addictive. <laughs> really? Yes, Max nodded. I think I've had one too many. Usually I don't drink. Drink this much, I mean. It makes you very happy, Paget said as she pulled him across the street when the light changed. Are you a hero a lot? I try. It doesn't always work like it should, though. You saved Brian, she remembered the guy from the story he'd told earlier. Brian was easy. It's the ones you work hard for and have no chance of saving that suck. He cleared his throat. Let's not talk about this, though. It's depressing. We're in an amazing city with beautiful stars. He squinted upward, and Paget involuntarily looked up as well. There were a lot of lights, but she couldn't see any stars. Paget giggled. Max, I think I had better walk you home. We're going in the right direction, he smiled down at her. It's light pollution. The reason we can't see the stars? It's light pollution. How do lights pollute? She humored him. They shine upward and blot out the stars. It's a real thing. Paget nodded. He was too happy. What's your address? My address? That place you rest your head? I really think I should walk you home. I'm not totally drunk, Max gently protested. I'm walking straight, with your help. I'm not slurring or sloppy. I'll be fine, and now I learned I can't hold the booze like I used to, I won't be doing that again. Plus, it's more likely that a gorgeous girl like you could be hurt at this time of night. I'd feel really bad if something happened to you when I could have walked you home. Gorgeous girl, she repeated dryly. Okay, beautiful woman. Paget rolled her eyes. So you don't like compliments. Duly noted. However, that doesn't mean I won't think them, or occasionally say them when I see you. You think you'll be seeing me again? Paget admired his optimism. She felt she could never be that confident. I know it, Max replied with a grin. I need to show you the stars, so that you can really see them. We'll see. Paget steered him through Elm Park. It was the shortest way to her building. She skirted around a bench with an old man sleeping on it, but Max halted her. He made his way to the bench, talked quietly with the man for a moment, and handed him money. They shook hands, and Max came back to Paget, putting an arm around her shoulder. Should you be doing that? What, helping Ed? Absolutely. You know him? Paget fumbled with her keys as they approached her building. Ed's harmless. He just has no place to go. The shelters only let you stay for a certain number of days, and he can't afford to live anywhere. His wife had cancer, and he used everything he had, including his retirement, to pay for her care. He gets a small pension, but it can't even get close to covering what he really needs in a city this expensive. Paget turned the lock and looked up at Max. She lived right off the park and had never bothered to find out about the people who lived there. She was a little afraid of them, actually. To hear Max talk about Ed, she now felt ashamed. That was really nice of you. I'm a nice guy, Max shrugged. He pulled out a business card and, in the process, dropped three others. I really would like to see you again, Paget. You're getting a cab, right? Paget asked as she took his card. I'll walk. It's a beautiful night, Max said as he scooped up the extra cards and shoved them in a back pocket. She couldn't help but smile at him. Max knew that she was amused by him and leaned against the door jamb. Do you know the last time I got drunk? I thought you weren't drunk, just buzzed, she reminded him. It's a good buzz, too, Max agreed. The last time I was drunk was six years ago. I don't make this a habit. Then why did you drink a little too much tonight? He took her hand in his. I was nervous. You were nervous? Paget highly doubted this confident man who went thrill-seeking when he was younger was nervous. Adam talked up this poised, beautiful woman who I just had to meet. Part of me wondered if she wasn't too good for me. "'And did you meet her?' she asked. "'I did. She likes expensive wine,' Max smiled. Paget flushed, but before she could say anything in her defense, he spoke up. "'Wine which I can't currently afford, which may have been why I was a little nervous. She seemed to like the house wine, though.' "'I did. It was better than I expected. And I can understand not being able to afford expensive wine any more.' 
Padgett gestured to the building she was now living in. "'Seems like both of us is taking a step down.' "'Maybe,' she whispered. She didn't much like her step down. She wondered what his had been like. His thumb was rubbing along the back of her hand. It was kind of nice. "'I learned a lot from taking a step down. More than I ever learned taking steps up.' "'What did you learn?' Padgett asked. "'Humility, kindness, who my friends were. How to make new friends. Respect.' "'Those are all very good things to learn.' Max nodded seriously. "'Important things.' "'Max, you should go.' Paget gently pulled on her hand. "'Right. Absolutely. As soon as you promise to give me a call. I need to show you those stars yet. Plus, it would be interesting to see what else we have in common.' She smiled at his blatant flattery. Truth was, it was a balm to her soul to have him paying such attention to her. He made her feel sexy and beautiful, which she hadn't felt for a very long time. "'I'll call you.' Max smiled happily and lifted her hand to kiss the back of it. "'That's all I ask.' Paget watched him as he stumbled as he turned. "'Are you sure you're going to be okay?' "'I'm more than okay. I met you.' He then gave her a wave. Shaking her head, Paget closed the door to the apartments and watched through the glass as Max disappeared into the night. She looked at the business card. It simply said, Max R., on time, on budget, followed by his number. Smiling, Paget put it away in her purse and went to her apartment. If you enjoyed this chapter, please don't forget to look for Chapter 2 of The Reverse Cinderella and like this video. Chapter 2 So, how did it go? Adam came up beside Paget as they exited Mrs. Brown's social media class. Did you like our Max? Paget tried to stop from smiling and gave him a firm lick. Setting me up wasn't part of the plan. You liked him, Adam crowed. I knew it. He's sweet, she admitted. I'm not sure if I'll be seeing him again, but I did like him. If you liked him, then what's the problem? I'm really busy with school and work right now. I'm not sure if I have time for a romance. Everybody has time for romance. It's a necessity of life. Adam shifted his knapsack. Besides, when I spoke to Max this morning, he had nothing but good things to say about you. Involuntarily, she asked, did he? He really likes you, too. He said you were beautiful, funny, smart, and kind. He's very into you. Paget smiled. It was nice to be complimented like that. Adam, why are you doing this? You're a friend. He's a friend. I like my friends to be happy, Adam shrugged. It's pretty simple. You don't think I'm happy? You didn't have this goofy happy smile until today, Adam said as he gave her a wave. He went down a different corridor, calling over his shoulder. Call him! Paget tried to restrain her goofy smile. Beautiful, funny, smart, and kind. She held the words close to her heart and decided that maybe she would give Max a call. When her classes were over for the day, she managed an hour of study in the library before catching the bus to the cafe for her shift. Dix was knee-deep in customers when she arrived. Paget quickly put on her apron and got to work helping her co-worker. It was a solid two hours before they finally had a lull and could talk. How was Barney's? Dix created a blueberry smoothie for herself and sucked on the straw. It was fun. They were a nice group of people. You're blushing. Who did you meet? Dix demanded. Okay, he's hot. He's sweet and he's funny. His name is Max. Ooh, Max. Dix swirled the straw. Are you going to call him? I'm thinking about it. Don't think. Do. And do it while we're here so I can listen in. She smiled. Does he have a sexy voice? Very. Then I want to hear it. Paget pulled out Max's business card, and Dix immediately yanked it out of her hand to have a look. Did they run out of ink? Pardon? Paget asked. His last name. It just has an R. Dix sucked on a straw. Weird. Paget looked at the card and saw that Dix was right. She hadn't really paid attention to it last night. Maybe there's a reason. That his last name is only R? You'll be Mrs. R if you married the guy. Or maybe it's unpronounceable. Like Rosiblk or something. Paget laughed. I'm sure it's something normal. 
Don't forget to ask. I need to know. I won't sleep until I find out. Then I'd better call and find out. I'd hate to see you as an insomniac. Paget took out her cell phone and dialed Max's number. She waited as the call connected, ringing in her ear. Looking at the business card, all of her carefully rehearsed opening lines left her head when a voice said, This is Max. Why isn't your last name on your card? She blurted out. Dix burst out laughing before going to help a customer. There was a moment of silence. Then Max asked, Paget? Hi. Paget felt a little embarrassed now. Sorry, I was just looking at the card you gave me. He laughed. I guess it's not on there. I left it off. People remember it, which makes it kind of a self-advertising move. Also, as much as I love my family, I'd rather not get judged by their reputation. I guess that makes sense. As much as Paget loved her own family, she appreciated being judged for herself and not their social standing. Maybe Max's family wasn't quite a reputable bunch. Does this mean I get a chance to take you out on a date? He sounded very pleased by the prospect. Well, you did say something about showing me the stars, she reminded him, smiling. Then I'd better not disappoint. Dix leaned over and stage whispered loudly. He sounds sexy. Tell him you're closing tonight and he can walk you home. Then I get to see what the hunky voice looks like. Dix, Paget hissed. Max chuckled. What time do you close? Eleven thirty. We'll be done our cleanup at midnight, Dix practically sang toward the phone. You don't have to come. It's okay. Paget rolled her eyes and gave Dix a little push away. The young woman laughed and just came back. I'll be there. Like I said the other night, I'd rather walk you home and make sure you get there safe. He's sweet, Dix mouthed to Paget. Thank you, Paget replied to Max, turning her back on Dix. She gave him the address of the cafe. You still didn't find out what his last name was, Dix said after Paget ended the call. Now we'll never know. It's probably something normal, like Richards or Riker. Dix laughed. Or he could be Mr. Wright. Wouldn't that be funny? Max, as Mr. Wright? He certainly had a good start. It would be. Paget and Dix completed the closing routine and Max arrived. Paget introduced him to Dix and he shook her hand. Dix smiled. He matches his voice. Excuse me? Max asked. Sexy. Would you date me? She dimpled prettily. Dix! Paget stared at her friend in shock. She couldn't believe what she'd just asked. Um, no. Max was perplexed. I prefer women my own age. It makes it easier when you have more in common. Dix turned into an interrogator. Do you date more than one woman at a time? No. What's your opinion of men who cheat or abuse? That they should never be in a relationship. Have you ever hit a woman? No. Have you done or do you use any drugs? Weed? In college? Not anymore. Alcoholic? No. Employed? Yes. Any weird fetishes or fantasies? No. Dick, stop it. Paget put a hand on Max's arm. I'm sorry about this. I had no idea. No, it's okay, Max smiled. She's doing what any good friend would do. Dick smiled. I like him. You can keep him. Thanks, Paget said dryly. Now let's go before she starts asking more embarrassing questions. It was nice to meet you, Dix, Max smiled. Paget flushed and grabbed Max by the arm, pulling him out of the cafe and along the streets. So, Paget cleared her throat, how was your day? I got a bunch of the paperwork out of the way for a bid we're putting in on a project, which was tedious, but necessary. Mostly it was just business as usual. However, now my day is complete since I get to see you. How was your day? Max threaded his fingers through hers. Paget had to admit she liked it. It was good. Nothing big happened, but I did decide to call this guy who seems really sweet. Oh, really? Max asked. He even offered to walk me home. Wow, that was really nice of him. Paget smiled. I know. They were approached by a man who had obviously seen better days. Hey, Max, my man, you got some money to spare for me? Nope. But if you're at the bridge in the morning, I'm bringing by coffee and breakfast to the crew there, Max replied. He stepped just slightly in front of Paget, shielding her from the man. What about you, lovely lady? 
You got a dollar for poor me? My disability ain't coming yet this month, then I need to live. Sorry, I don't have my purse with me. Paget was glad that she didn't. There was something off about the man. Max sidled past the stranger, keeping her away from him. Come to the bridge in the morning, Dusty. I'll do that. Dusty raised a hand in farewell and continued up the sidewalk, asking anyone he met for money. Max put his arm around Paget, and she leaned into him as they walked away. If you see Dusty, cross the street. When he's sober, he's unpredictable, and when he's high, he can be violent for no reason. Paget nodded. Suddenly, she was glad she wasn't alone walking home at night. Normally, Paget felt quite safe, but tonight she feared that it might have gone very differently if Max hadn't been with her. Do you know a lot of those types of people like Dusty? Some. Most people are just down on their luck like Ed. Some of them will give you the shirt off their back if you let them, and it's their only shirt. They're just that giving and helpful. There are good people and bad people in every walk of life. Max and Paget walked through the park. We all just want to get through life and find a little happiness while we do it. Are you happy? Paget asked as she took out her key. I'm very happy when I'm with you. Max waited as she unlocked the door. Any time you need someone to walk you home, please call me. It's my new favorite hobby. I will. I promise. She reached out and gave his hand a squeeze. Good night, Max. Good night, Paget. Max held her hand for a moment, then let go. Paget watched him disappear into the park, then headed inside. The next morning, in social media and broadcasting class, Mrs. Brown smiled benignly at her students. There was a three minutes until the end of class, and Paget knew the teacher had something up her sleeve. "'I have an announcement to make.' Everyone quieted down and paid attention as Mrs. Brown continued. "'I'm springing a surprise test on you.' There were groans, and Paget wondered how this was supposed to be a surprise when Mrs. Brown just announced that she was going to give them this test. "'It's important that you study everything that has been taught this term, plus any other materials related to this class. This test is going to encompass everything that you already know, should know, and are going to know. Some of the questions you will not be able to answer, but you must do the best you can. You'll only have the time in class to try to complete the test.' I doubt anyone will complete it. That's okay. This is to gauge what you have already learned and how you would react in situations that we have not already discussed. This test is this Wednesday. You have two days to study. Mrs. B., how is this a surprise if you're telling us about it? A student asked. Mrs. Brown's smile widened. Thank you. The surprise is whoever has top score, the best score... We'll start in the broadcasting booth early. It's extra practice, it's extra commitment, it's extra credit, and it's going to look great on your resume. Only one of you will get this opportunity. The buzzer sounded and the room exploded in talk. This was a huge opportunity. Paget hadn't expected to get time in the broadcast booth until next term. It would mean an additional three months of experience, which would put anyone who got ahead in the pool of potential employees when they graduated. Paget gathered up her books and went to the front of the class to speak to Mrs. Brown. "'Mrs. Brown, could I have a moment of your time?' Paget asked. She sat on the edge of her desk. "'What can I help you with, Paget?' "'Is there anything in particular that we should study for on this test?' "'Everything.' "'Excuse me?' Paget sought clarification. Everything was a lot of material. Everything that we've covered. Everything in broadcast history. Everything in broadcast history. Everything in how broadcasting works. Everything in broadcasting's projected future. Everything, Mrs. Brown said as she pushed her glasses up her nose. The most important question is going to be the first. Make sure you take the time to answer it properly. Good luck. Thank you. Paget wasn't sure what Mrs. Brown's advice had helped very much, but she fully intended to do her best. As she exited the classroom, Adam came up beside her. "'Did you call him?' "'Adam!' Paget exclaimed. "'You're as bad as Dick's, pushing into my love life.' "'Ha! You have a love life!' Adam did a fist pump. "'That means you've called him.' "'I did,' Paget admitted. "'He even walked me home from the cafe last night.' "'Awesome!' 
Someday you'll be telling your grandkids that I was the one who introduced you to. Slow down. We're just seeing each other a little. It doesn't mean we're getting married. Adam just grinned at her. I want a child named after me. It doesn't have to be the first name, it can be the middle. Preferably a boy, but hey, if you want to saddle a girl with Adam, that's up to you. Paget rolled her eyes. He just walked me home. That's all. Plus, he's going to show me the stars sometime. I'm thinking I should get an invite to the wedding. Maybe as a groomsman. I don't know how many brothers you two have, but you can tag me on the end. Adam, stop, Paget laughed. Keep me posted on how it goes. You're coming to Barney's on Friday, right? He winked at her. Max will be there. I have to work. Come afterwards. For an hour? You know the cafe closes at midnight and the bar at one. It seems silly to Paget to come for less than an hour. Sure. Or at least have Max walk you home again. Adam wiggled his eyebrows. Do you match make often or are we your first attempt and that's why you're so excited? Paget asked. You guys are my firsts. Oh boy. Now go away. I have a lot of studying to do for Mrs. Brown's class. I know. I hope I don't win. I do not want to be in the booth to talk. I just want to produce or work on the technical side. Adam knocked on his books. I have no intention of even cracking one of these open. You might want to anyways. It probably counts as part of our grade, Paget advised him. That's okay. Mediocre is my middle name. Adam. She stopped walking to make him look at her and be serious. Your grades are important. They could be what determines if you get hired by a company. I have a job lined up with an online group. I work with them already and I'm just finishing my degree. Once I do that, I'm full time. Adam put a hand on her shoulder to reassure her. I'm already set. Oh, Paget wasn't really surprised. Adam always seemed to know the answers already. It made sense that he would have experience in the field. What happens if they can't take you on full time? What if you have to look for another job? They keep trying to tell me not to finish school because they want me to get to work already. I just need seven more months to finish. I'm okay, Paget. You don't need to worry. Adam winked. What we do need to do is find a place for you. I know you're a year and a half away from graduation, but that doesn't mean you can't start working somewhere part-time. Besides the cafe? I'd love to, but I'm not sure that I have time. We'll make time. Even if I can convince the guys I work with to let you sub in once in a while, it will help your career to have the experience. Thanks, Adam. I'd really appreciate that. No problem. Now, get studying. Paget did study hard. She studied every chance she got at the cafe, and since it was busy during her four-hour shift, that basically meant reading all of a page in the textbook. She walked home, mentally going through all the facts that she knew, and trying to determine what she should brush up on. Paget let herself into the apartment and began making lists, turning her living room upside down, looking for cue cards. In the middle of the chaos, her cell phone rang. Paget saw, from the caller ID, that it was Max. Hello? His sexy voice sent a thrill through her. I was wondering if we could see the stars tonight. Paget closed her eyes in regret. I just don't have the time right now. I've got a major test coming up in two days that was just announced. I have to get top grade. There's a chance to be put in the broadcasting booth early. She sighed. I'm sorry. It will have to be another night. Don't be. What if I come and help you study? Max asked. I'll bring supper and ask you questions. And when you're ready to just read, I've got some paperwork that needs to be done that I can focus on. Are you sure? Paget asked. She didn't want to intrude into his life. Absolutely, he assured her. We can just spend some time together. I'm happy with that. Thank you. I'd like that. Paget appreciated that he was so easy about this. Gary would have pitched a fit and sulked if she didn't do what he wanted when he wanted. Paget told Max her apartment number, and he promised he'd be there with Chinese. Paget spread her notes, textbooks, and her laptop over the kitchen table, and was deep in broadcasting history when she had to buzz Max into the building. She unlocked her door and went back to studying, cue cards of information mounting up. Max let himself in, carrying two bags and a folder. He popped the bags on the kitchen counter and looked at the kitchen table. "'Give me a minute and I'll move everything,' Paget said as she scribbled down another note. "'Don't. You're all set up right there and it works for you. "'If you don't mind, I'll raid the cupboards for cutlery plates and stuff. 
I'll set everything buffet style on the counter. Then you can grab what you want and keep on studying. I know you would probably rather be doing other things, but I need to study. It's important that I get this chance to broadcast early. Max found the cutlery and set them with a couple of glasses on the counter. Actually, this is good. First, I like that I get to help you with something that's important to you. And second, I've been putting off the paperwork for the city for a little while. It's due next week, so I really do need to get it done. Great, Paget smiled and heaped some rice onto her plate. Did you get soy sauce? Of course. He presented it to her with a flourish, making Paget smile. They finished choosing their suppers from the selection and returned to the table. Paget managed to give up a third of it so that Max could work on his forms. Max pointed to her cue cards. A little old school, aren't they? Maybe, but they work. Last test I achieved a 98% because of them. Paget continued writing down small facts that she thought might be important. Wow, good for you. They worked side by side quietly. It was nice having his company in a quiet, unobtrusive way. Max took away her dirty dishes, got her more water, then washed the dishes. You don't need to do that, Paget protested. They can wait. You need to study. Max put the leftover Chinese in the fridge. You don't have time for dishes. Besides, I worked in a diner for two winters. I know all about doing dishes. You worked in a diner? Paget asked, amused. Somehow, that was hard to reconcile with the sexy man before her. I needed something for the winters when the demolition work was slow, Max explained. Now it's been picking up, so I've had full-time work out of it. You work for a demolition company? she asked, curious about his life. I started out as a laborer, and now I'm getting more into the supervision and avoiding paperwork where possible, Max replied. What about your city forms? Paget pointed to them, avoiding them. I'm taking a small break. I'll get back to them. Max swished her scrub brush through the water. Now, go back to studying. Paget smiled and continued until she ran out of cue cards. She would have to get some more tomorrow from the discount store. She started reading through the ones that she had, trying to memorize them. After an hour of doing that, Max set aside his forms and helped her by asking questions and seeing if she got the right answers. Better than that, he asked her more questions as he curiously read the cards. This is really amazing. I had no idea you needed to know all this stuff before becoming an on-air broadcaster, Max said as he read another card. Three years of college, Paget replied. Most of it I'll probably never use, but it's important to know. Thank you for doing this with me. Actually, Paget, thank you for letting me. Max looked at her, suddenly serious. I like hanging out with you. I like that I can help you with something that's important to you, and I'm learning about what you are passionate about. Plus, you got those pesty city forms done, Paget yawned. Sorry, but I guess it's time to quit. Shall we do it again tomorrow? Max asked. He stacked the cue cards together. Are you sure? She didn't want to inconvenience him. Absolutely. I love being your study buddy. Paget laughed. Okay, then. Good night, Paget. Max pushed in his chair. I'll see you tomorrow. She followed him to the door. Good night. Max turned, and for a second Paget thought that he might kiss her. Instead, he softly laid a hand against her cheek for a moment, then smiled and walked away. Fighting the butterflies in her stomach, Paget locked the door and leaned against it. She could really get to like him, she reflected. True to his word, Max showed up the next day with pizza. Maybe he had noticed her fridge was a little bare and was trying to fill it up. Or he didn't want Chinese two nights in a row. Either way, Paget now had enough leftovers to get her through the end of the week if she was careful. Paget had made more cue cards, and they sat on the couch as they went through them, trying to get her prepared for tomorrow's test. After hours of cramming, Paget felt like her head was going to explode trying to keep all of the information in. Finally, Max set down the cue cards. Okay, one more thing. Why is this your passion? What? Paget looked at him blankly. Your teacher said that the very first question would be the most important, Max explained. If I were trying to fill a spot, I'd do an interview question like, Why are you the person I should pick to fill this position? And you would answer, Why this is your passion. Paget thought about it. I've always wanted to be in broadcast. I hear people on the radio, especially talk radio, discussing the news and important things that are happening in people's lives. Everyone has a different opinion, and radio is freedom to express ourselves and to communicate what our community feels. 
what it embraces, what it rejects, where it wants to direct itself. Radio connects us. Every day I turn on a radio and listen. I want to actively participate in the community through radio, to help direct the conversation, to be there in the moment, to belong to that community. I love it. Max smiled. Now you're prepared. If that's even on the test. Paget rubbed her tired eyes. We should go over everything one more time. No. Max laid the cards down. What you should do is go to bed and get some sleep. Tomorrow, go over this stack right here. These are the ones that you've been having some difficulty with. You don't need to go over the rest because you know that information. Then, after a good breakfast, go take the test. He stood and pulled her to her feet, giving her a hug. You're gonna do great. Paget leaned her head on his chest. He was so warm and comfortable. She really must be tired, she decided. I just want this so badly. The worst that can happen is that you don't get it, Max said supportively. Then you'll work hard and wait your turn just like you were going to before this opportunity came up. However, you did everything you could to get to this spot, and you should be proud of it. You're going to be right up there at the top of your class. I'm proud of you. I couldn't get there without my study, buddy, Paget mumbled into his shirt. She had her eyes closed and could feel herself drifting a little. I think it's time I left and you got to bed, Max chuckled. He reluctantly let her go. Paget followed him to the door. This time, Max cupped her face with both his hands. He lowered his head and kissed her, just a whisper against her lips. Good night, Paget. Good night. Paget locked the door after him and floated her away to bed, smiling the entire time. Paget awoke from steamy dreams of Max to find out that she had been hitting the snooze button. A lot. She was going to be late. Suddenly, wide awake, Paget bolted from the bed and pulled on the first clothes she saw. Darting to the kitchen, she grabbed her keys and bounced from foot to foot as she put on her sneakers, quickly lacing them. Forgetting her books, her purse, her phone, everything, Paget locked the door and ran as fast as she could onto the street. Thankfully, she had ten dollars in her pocket so she hailed a cab to get to the college as quickly as possible. The fare was only six dollars, but she didn't wait for the cabbie to make change, bolting to class. Out of breath, yesterday's makeup smeared, hair uncombed, she slid into her seat in Mrs. Brown's class. Class, this is an open book test. You may keep your notes and textbooks and use them at any time. There will be no talking during the test. Mrs. Brown gave Paget a disapproving look over her lateness, but continued talking. Please take a copy and pass the rest back. Do not flip over your tests until I say so. To look at any of the questions before I give the OK is to automatically get a zero grade. She handed out stacks of paper and everyone handed them back in the rows. Paget took a copy and passed the rest to the next student. There must be thirty pages or more. She swallowed thickly. She wasn't prepared. She had left her textbooks at home. She had no notes. She hadn't finished studying her difficult cue cards. She had no pen. She had no pen! Frantically, Paget felt the pockets of her jeans. All she had were her keys and pocket lint. That was it. Paget tried not to panic. Surely someone could lend her one before this test started. Paget raised her hand. Turn over your test and begin. Remember, absolutely no talking. Everyone turned over their pages. Paget slowly lowered her hand. Mrs. Brown had sat down at her desk and was marking papers from another class. She was ignoring the students in general. Paget turned over the test. Right there at the first question was just as Max predicted. Why should you be chosen to receive the open broadcasting spot? The most important question, the most important test of her life at this moment, she couldn't answer it because she didn't have a pen. Paget put her head in her hands. She didn't deserve the possession, Paget reflected. She was obviously unprepared. Paget sighed and watched as others furiously scribbled down answers. Adam caught her eye and gestured as if to say, What are you doing? Paget mimed a pen and then put her hands in the air, shrugging. He gave her an incredulous look, then tossed Paget his pen. Paget dropped it. She quickly scooped it back up. Mrs. Williams, is there a problem? Mrs. Brown asked from the front of the room. I dropped my pen? Paget explained. Please do not disturb the class again. No, ma'am. Paget turned her attention to her test and began to answer the first question. 
Today I came unprepared. I forgot my textbooks, my notes, my cue cards, even a pen to write this test with. I was barely on time. I expect I'll continue to make mistakes, off air and on air. Everyone does. But this is my passion. I hear people on the radio, especially talk radio, discussing the news and important things that are happening in people's lives. Everyone has a different opinion, and radio has a freedom to express ourselves and to communicate what our community feels, what it embraces, what it rejects, where it wants to direct itself. Radio connects us. I can't believe you forgot a pen! Adam walked with her through the hall after the class was over. That's not all I forgot. No textbooks, no laptop, no money. I even forgot my bus pass. All I have is my keys. Paget jangled them for fur effect before putting them back into her pocket. I'm amazed I made it on time. What happened? Max happened. Adam paused for a moment. Anything I should know? You two kids use protection, right? Paget blushed and swatted him on the arm. Nothing like that. We studied for the test late last night, and he left. I was really tired, and I kept hitting the snooze button this morning because I was dreaming about him. Dirty dreams, Adam suggested. Go away, Adam, Paget rolled her eyes. You've got it bad. He was absolutely gleeful. I'm such a good matchmaker. She stopped walking. Is there even a point to me going to my other classes? All I've got is your pen. Do you want it back? No, it's yours. I've got others. Adam waggled his eyebrows. It's infected with Max cooties now, anyways. Paget put her hands on her hips and cocked her head to the side. Really? Have we sunk to that juvenile low? Yup, he replied serenely. Seriously, though, how are you going to get back to your apartment? It's a long walk without a bus pass. Paget sighed. She had no money. There's nothing else I can do but walk. I've got a twenty if you want to borrow cab fare, Adam offered. No, I think I need to exercise. Plus, the cafe is on the way. Maybe I'll drop in early and see if I can get a few extra hours. Okay, have fun. And sweet dreams of Max tonight. Paget shook her head and started the long trek to the cafe. It was nice weather, but her feet were sore by the time she got there. Paget grabbed a tea and muffin then sat down, putting her feet up on a chair. The cafe was quiet, so Dix joined her. What does it mean if you barely kiss a guy and then you dream all night about jumping him? Dix raised a pierced eyebrow. You think that just because I have two psychiatrists for parents that I'll be able to analyze that messed up mind of yours for free? Maybe. It means you're a red-blooded woman with needs and he's sexy enough to flame your fire. Dix took a sip of strawberry smoothie through a straw. Max is hot for an old guy. Thanks, Padgett said wryly. Max couldn't be very much older than her. What was the kiss like? Paget smiled dreamily as she remembered. Promising. That's an interesting way to describe a kiss. That's what it was. A whisper of a promise of something more. Something good. Oh boy, she's spouting poetry. Dix licked the straw before dipping it back into the smoothie. You're half in love with this guy already. I am not, Paget denied. She picked a cranberry out of the muffin and ate it. I really like him, though. Hmm, Dix grunted. Why are you here so early? Paget explained this morning's fiasco, and Dix laughed. I stand corrected. You are not in love. You're in lust. Dix stood up. Sure, grab an apron. We'll do some extra cleaning today so you can fill a few hours. The boss won't mind. Paget tried on her apron and grabbed some cleaning cloths with a spray bottle. What do I do about Max? Make your dreams into reality. Paget rolled her eyes. Very helpful. I am, Dick said sweetly. Now, get to work. Thank you for listening. If you enjoyed this chapter, please look for the next chapter of The Reverse Cinderella. Also, please subscribe to this channel to enjoy the other audiobooks, helpful videos, and insights into writing. This is free for you and would really help me grow my audience with the algorithms. Thank you. Chapter 3 Someone was knocking on Paget's door. She figured it was probably the landlord asking if this month's check was going to bounce again. It was his way of asking her for the rent. Plus, the question was usually legitimate with most of the tenants here. 
dragging herself from her nap on the couch, which she had needed after an extra long shift at the cafe, she released the locks and pulled it open. What? Max stood there, hand half raised to knock again, the other holding what looked to be a music instrument case. He looked Paget up and down. Hi? Paget's face instantly flushed, and she knew she wasn't going to be looking pretty in her cut-off sweats made into shorts with an I Heart New York t-shirt. It didn't help that she was braless, or makeupless, or probably had an imprint from the couch cushion on her face. Did I forget something? The stars? Max raised an eyebrow. You said you wanted to learn about the constellations. Was that tonight? Paget couldn't honestly remember. Between nervously waiting to hear if she'd gotten the coveted early broadcasting position, working extra hours at the cafe, and studying for school, she was wiped. She had probably agreed to do this when he was being her perfect study buddy, and she had forgotten. She felt so bad for the mistake. I'm so sorry. Let me get changed. We can do it another time if it's better for you, Max offered. No, Paget knew she would probably forget about it again, and it had sounded really interesting when he'd talked about it. Plus, she had now gotten some sleep, so she was wide awake. Give me two minutes. Paget rushed into her bedroom, grabbed a bra. The t-shirt could stay, but she added a hoodie and swapped out the ugly sweatshorts for capris. How did the test go? She ran a brush through her hair. It started out rough, but then I think I did really well. I won't know the results for a little while. You were right about the first question. It was asking why we wanted the position. That means you were prepared for it. Good. She could hear Max move around the living room. Who's this? Paget looked as she went into the bathroom and saw him holding up a picture frame. The cheesy Christmas photos? Tiffany and Charles with their children. Tiff is my sister. Paget and Tiffany? Your parents have a thing for jewelry? Max chuckled. My mother did. Not sure my father had any say in the matter. Paget swiped on some mascara and lip gloss. It was quick and easy. Plus, they were going to see the stars, not anything terribly special. Paget flipped off the lights as she came back into the living room. Ready? Wow, that was fast, Max smiled. You look great. Paget shrugged, but secretly she was pleased by his compliment. Thanks. Should I bring anything? Just yourself. And maybe a blanket in case it gets cold. He held up the blanket that usually covered the couch. It was folded neatly over his arm. I've already got the telescope, so we are all set. Where did you get the telescope? Paget couldn't help but ask as she laced up her sneakers. AAA. Amateur Astronomers Association. I borrowed it from a member. As long as it gets back to him soon, he's cool with it. Nice. Paget locked up her apartment door and was surprised when Max let her up the stairs instead of down. I talked to the superintendent and he was kind enough to give me the groove key. Turns out, you're one of his favorite tenants. He says you pay on time the most. I do try, Paget said wryly. Five floors later, they managed to get to the roof door, and she held the blanket while Max worked the key in the lock. On top of the roof, it was a little cooler with a breeze in the summer air. Paget could hear the traffic far below, and the lights of the buildings around had a different perspective from this high up. It was rather nice. She wondered why she had never come up here before. They spread out the blanket and Max set up the telescope. They had fun looking around the neighborhood with it, finding places that they knew and spying on a few people eating at a local diner, before pointing it to the stars. How many people belong to this amateur astronomer's club? Paget suddenly asked. Quite a few, Max said absently as he worked on the focus and she looked thoughtfully at the street below. How many of those people are shady and probably using their telescopes to look into people's apartments? At least part of the time. It was her mother's voice in her head. Paget tried to see the world through less biased eyes, but it was hard when she had such a critical woman to raise her. Probably only a couple. Why? Worried someone's going to spy on you? Max teased Paget. You are gorgeous, but anyone with binoculars and a good vantage point can do the same. I think I'll start closing my drapes a little more. Paget came back to the blanket and sat near the telescope. With a flourish, Max presented the sight of the telescope to her, and Paget took a tentative peek. The stars were numerous and bright compared to the night sky in the city. Wow. It's the light pollution. Because there are so many lights on in the city, a lot of them pointing to the sky as well as the ground, they create what's called light pollution in the atmosphere. It makes it hard to see what's really up there in the heavens. If we were to go outside the city... The sky would be amazing and we could see a lot more with the naked eye. 
The telescope makes a great difference. Max leaned in close and gently showed Paget how to maneuver the telescope. He led her through a cosmic tour of various constellations that he knew. It was pretty interesting. How do you know so much about this? Paget asked. I studied it from a book. It's the myths that I like the best, because nearly every star or constellation has a story attached to it, Max said in that sexy low voice of his. It sent a little thrill through Paget. Plus, I've been going to some of the free seminars the Amateur Astronomers Club hosts. What about that one? She leaned back so that he could have a look. Max tilted the telescope for her. The star is called Vega, but in Chinese myth her name is Qin Ni. She was a weaver and made amazing things like gowns from brocade and the clouds. She was married to a cow herder and fell deeply in love with him. But because of her love, she forgot all of her talent to weave, and her parents became very angry. Her father made her into a star, and then made her husband into a star called Altar. In his anger, her father separated them by the Silver River, otherwise known as the Milky Way. Once a year, on the seventh day of the seventh lunar month, a flock of magpies form a bridge to reunite the lovers. He leaned back until he was laying on the blanket, hands under his head and looking up into the sky. He looked so comfy and relaxed that Paget laid down beside him. That's a sad story. It is. A lot of the myths are sad or have lessons to be learned from them. What about your story? Paget dared to ask softly. He reached out to tuck a piece of hair behind her ear, then gently took her hand. My story? Well, once upon a time, there was a boy who was given everything he ever wanted. He did good in school, he had a lot of fun, he worked really hard. Then he had a disagreement that couldn't be resolved, and because he stood his ground, he lost everything he had and almost everyone he knew, but he wouldn't change it for the world because he did what was right, and because now he has real friends, a real purpose. He also met you. A real purpose? she asked curiously. Paget knew that he helped out Ed, but she wasn't sure if there was something else that he was spending his time on. Trying to make the world a better place. That's definitely a good thing to do, Paget agreed. It was a little vague, but maybe he just meant helping other people like at a soup kitchen or something. And that was okay, he was at least doing something. Paget liked this. Laying down next to each other, holding hands, and just talking. It was the first time she had ever done this, and she hoped it wouldn't be the last. "'What is your story?' Max returned the question to her. "'Mine?' "'I gave you mine. Barely. There are no real details. Wife, kids?' Paget raised an eyebrow. "'No wife? No kids?' "'Now stop stalling. Unless it's really terrible,' he teased. "'I'd hate to spoil such a nice night.' Paget rolled her eyes and looked up at the sky. "'I had a good childhood. I loved my life. I went to the right school, did the right things.' I was wooed and married in my first year of college. I dropped out and became the perfect housewife. No kids. Did you want kids? Max inquired. Very much. Paget didn't mean to, but she couldn't help a tear. She wiped it away angrily. It was an old wound, and her situation wasn't likely to change any time soon, so she didn't know why she kept tearing at the scab. He passed away in an accident last year. I feel like I'm just finally figuring my life out. Max slowly pulled her into his arms, and she took a deep breath, settling into his embrace. He felt warm, solid, dependable. He was also so nice and comfortable. A soft, worn shirt with a steady heartbeat. Paget could feel herself relax. I think you're doing a good job. Really? Paget asked dryly. She felt like she was a wreck. She cried. She was a klutz. She was trying, but she felt like the bills were going to eat her alive sometimes. Paget loved what she was working towards, to become a broadcast personality, but that wouldn't happen for some time yet. Until then, it was going to remain a struggle. You've got a roof over your head. You pay your rent on time, according to your landlord. I know you have food in your cupboards. You have friends who really like you and wish you'd spent more time with them. You're trying to learn to do something you've always wanted to do. I'd say you're pretty blessed. Paget realized that her situation could be much worse than what it was now. She was blessed, and Max had gently reminded her of that. Thank you. For what? For tonight? Paget yawned and closed her eyes. It's been really nice. She must have been tired still, because the next thing Paget knew, she was being laid down on her bed. Someone took off her shoes and pulled the covers over her. The hall light was on, but the bedroom was dark, and in her sleepy confusion, Paget asked, Gary? The figure arranging her covers paused, and reality dumped back on her. Gary was dead. 
This was Max. He gently pushed her hair out of her face and gave Paget a lingering kiss on her forehead. No, sweetheart, not Gary. Paget was glad that the dark hid her humiliating blush. I'm sorry, Max. It's okay. Get some sleep. I'll lock the door after myself. But it wasn't okay. She knew he was interested in her, and she had accidentally called him her dead husband's name. What could she say to make it better and not worse? Paget listened miserably as he left, the door clicking softly. She curled up into a ball and wished her mouth would just stop talking before her brain could think. The next day at the cafe, Paget was surprised to see both Max and Adam come in together. It was obvious that they didn't realize she was working since she had just come back from the washroom and spotted them first. Paget hung back for a moment indecisive. She wasn't sure she was ready to talk to Max after last night. Calling him Gary was a huge blunder, and she had no idea what to say to him to make things better. Paget didn't mean to eavesdrop, but she must have stood there in the corridor too long, and they were choosing a table right beside the washrooms, and she could hear them clearly. Paget realized they were talking about the other night when Max had taken her to see the stars, and the next thing she knew, she was pressed up against the wall, one ear cocked around the corner, hoping to know what Max thought of the whole thing. Cowardly of her, for sure, but she desperately wanted to know. How did it go? Adam was positively beaming as he sipped his frothy coffee. It was going great, Max said with a grimace. Was? Adam picked up on the important word quickly. What does that mean? Did something happen? Sort of. Things were going really good, and then at the end of the evening, she said something. Max shrugged. What? Adam looked at Max in concern. I thought that there was some chemistry between you two. Max sighed. I think she still loves her husband. Her ex? She's been divorced for about a year. Did she tell you she was divorced? She told me she was a widow. Adam thought about it for a minute. Wait. No, I think I just assumed she was divorced. I don't think she actually said. Puts a bit of a different slant on things. Max slowly drank from his black coffee. Wow, still in love with a dead dude? That's hard to compete against. What are you going to do? asked Adam. I wouldn't have set you guys up if I didn't think it wasn't going to work. I'm sorry, man. Relax, I'm not blaming you. I really do like her, and I'm not in this for the short game. I'll just be patient. Wait and be her friend. At some point, maybe she'll be ready and I'll be there. Paget is worth it. Adam sighed. What if she's never ready? Then I will make an amazing friend, and hopefully I won't be too disappointed if nothing more happens. Max studied Adam, who was watching Dix. What about you? You've been trying to set up Paget and I, but isn't there someone special in your life? Adam snorted. Dude, look at me. Is there a problem with you? Max raised an eyebrow. Guys like you get the girls. Guys like me don't. I'm six foot, pushing 300 pounds. I don't play for the NFL, so I'm just a fat guy. Girls aren't into that. Max looked at Dix with her colorful hair and piercings. Somehow, I don't think she's into the NFL or the conventional. Maybe if you talked to her, it would help. What would I even say? Adam hid behind his drink, staring into its depths rather than look at Dix or Max. What does she like to do? What does she like to do? Find out an event that you think she would go to and ask. Or tell her that she makes really good coffee. Or say that you like her hair. As long as you actually like her hair. Otherwise, that could get messy. Adam liked Dix. Paget had no idea. She was also incredibly happy that Max still wanted to go out with her. She didn't know why, since she wasn't exactly looking for a relationship, but she liked Max a lot. Dick spotted Paget hiding out and pointed to her wrist, phantomiming a watch that she didn't wear. Fortunately, neither Max or Adam had noticed. Paget helped up a finger, asking for a moment, to which Dix rolled her eyes and then went back to forcefully, pleasantly serving customers. Paget came up behind Adam and Max, laying a hand on each of their shoulders, leaning in. Dix is an artist. Adam jumped a mile and almost spilled his drink. Max was laughing at Adam's reaction and trying not to, hiding his mouth behind a hand as his shoulders shook. You nearly gave me a heart attack, Adam hissed. There's an exhibit at the Meyer Gallery. They're taking up-and-coming artists, but Dix is worried that her art isn't good enough. She wants to scope it out and see what's being accepted. You should take her. Paget turned to Max. Thank you for the stars. 
I'm sorry I fell asleep on our first date, but if you're willing to go out again, I'd like to try a second date. I'd like that, too. He really was very handsome when he smiled. Are you working closing? She happily nodded. I'll come by and walk you home, Max offered. Thank you. Paget gave his hand a squeeze, then made her way to the counter to help Dix. As she left, she could hear Adam say, She fell asleep? Dude, that is so not exciting. You're lucky she's giving you a second chance. Where have you been? The rush came in, Dick said as she efficiently put together an order of drinks with all sorts of twists and shots of chocolate or caramel. Paget rushed to fill the bakery orders for her, hoping to get on her good side again. Eavesdropping, Paget smiled. I hope it was a soap opera worthy, because if you don't share and it isn't good, I'm not going to forgive you for leaving me high and dry. Dix pushed the tray of drinks at a customer with a smile that didn't reach her eyes. Thank you for your order. Please come again. We'll talk, Paget assured her as she took another customer's orders. Just as suddenly as the crowd came, it thinned out and they managed to handle it. Paget looked at the clock and twenty minutes had disappeared in the blink of an eye. Dix wiped down the counter and Paget restocked the bakery display. Finally, Dix turned to Paget, crossing her arms and raising a pierced eyebrow. Spill. Hi, Adam. Paget smiled at Adam, who had approached the counter behind Dix, and grabbed the tote for bussing tables, leaving them alone. She went to Max and picked up Adam's now empty cup. Did you coach him? Max pulled out a chair for her, and she sat down to watch the show. I did, but I'm betting every word I'd said just disappeared on the poor guy. Adam was stumbling over his words, and Dix was looking at him much the same way she might an insect that had dared to enter her space. Not that she wanted to kill it, but why was it even there? This is not looking good. Max quickly grabbed Paget's hand to stop her from interfering. Don't rescue them. This is a momentous occasion for Adam, whether he gets turned down or not. He needs to do this on his own. Paget left her hand in Max's, liking the feel of it. I want to apologize for the way the other night ended. You don't have to. No, I do, Paget insisted. I didn't mean to fall asleep on you, plus I definitely did not mean to call you Gary. Gary was my husband, and it's past time that I let go of all the feelings I had. I really do like you, Max. Maybe we could take it slowly and see how things go. I think you're someone amazingly special, Paget. If you want to take things slow, then that's what we'll do. Max brought his other hand over their joined ones. Thank you. He really was an understanding guy. Paget could feel herself slipping further under his spell, but was interrupted by Dix at the counter. You what? Dix practically shrieked. Just because I have blue hair, piercings, and maybe a tattoo does not mean that I am that kind of girl. Adam gaped in surprise. I meant, I mean, I... Out! Dix pointed to the door, and when Adam didn't move, she grabbed a blueberry muffin from the display and made like she was going to throw it at him. Now! Quickly, Paget went to the counter and put a hand on Dix's arm, rescuing the muffin. What is going on here? This perverted Sasquatch asked me if I was an exhibitionist. I have two psychiatrist parents. I know what the clinical term means. I was trying to ask you if you were an artist, and if you were interested in going to the Meyer exhibition, but my mouth mixed up words together, Adam nearly shouted. He looked surprised that he had gotten a full sentence in Dix's presence. I do that when I get nervous sometimes. What? Dick stared at him. I heard you like art. I was asking you out not to see, he gestured at her. Not that it wouldn't be nice to see. Oh, boy. Out! Dick's practically vibrated. Max grabbed Adam by the shoulders. Come on, big guy. Retreat might be in order. Paget watched Max lead a disappointed Adam out the door. She put the blueberry muffin away, warily watching Dix furiously sweep the floor. He didn't mean it. He's a sweet guy, and he likes you. There was a snort. He's had a crush on you for a while now? He just got up the courage to talk to you. I told him about the Meyer exhibit. Paget grabbed some napkins for the dispensers. He gets stage fright, and apparently has trouble talking to girls that he likes. Dix's shoulder shook, and she burst out laughing. I thought he was gay! What? Paget asked in disbelief. All this time, I thought he was gay, she howled, holding onto the broom for support. Every day he comes in and he has a drink or eats something, and I thought he was gay. I thought he was into your boyfriend, which was funny because he set you two up. 
Paget really didn't know what to say to that. He's been checking me out the whole time, and I thought he was gay. She wiped her eyes. I really have no ability to judge people. First Giorgio, then Adam. Paget put the napkins down and leaned against the counter. I don't think you can put Giorgio and Adam into the same category. Giorgio stole from you. Adam actually likes you. He asked me if I liked exhibitionists or if I was one, Dick said dryly. If you're outgoing? Paget shrugged, not seeing the big deal. You are, sometimes. Besides, he explained that he mixed the two words of artist and exhibition together accidentally. A clinical exhibitionist is a flasher. Dick's mimed flashing with a pretend trench coat. No. Paget looked at her in some horror. She could feel poor Adam's pain. Poor Adam. Poor Adam, Dick snorted. Goes to show what always on a guy's mind. That was some Freudian slip. He didn't mean it, though, Paget said, defending him. She wondered about her own slip in calling Max by Gary's name. He really does like you and was very nervous to try to ask you out. Dix rolled her eyes. Tell him Thursday at five, be here at the cafe. Tell him not to speak. It's probably better that way. Thank you, Dix. I'm sure you'll have a wonderful time, Paget smiled happily. Are you going to put napkins in those dispensers? They won't do it themselves. Dix resumed sweeping, her version of saying the subject was closed. Paget grinned as she grabbed the napkins. She couldn't help but tease Dix. Maybe we can go on a double date sometime. Mrs. Brown's social media and broadcasting class felt like it was going so slow. Paget thought Mrs. Brown was going over the most boring material possible. She didn't care about how signals ran through electrical currents or how it was all translated through the air and finally came to life in a radio. She didn't want to take away the magic and know the specifics. It was enough to know that what was said in Broadcasting Booth could be listened to miles away, with the Internet even all over the world. She sighed and dutifully typed a few notes in her laptop. She didn't fully understand this part of the course and worried it was going to badly affect her grade. It didn't help that her mind kept wandering to Max, the way he smiled, how good he smelled lately, the fact that he easily carried her from the roof of the apartment to her bed and behaved like a perfect gentleman. It was kind of like a fairy tale, and her stomach flipped at the thought. He was so wonderful in so many ways and seemed to really like her, if his conversation with Adam that she had overheard was anything to go by. What did he said? He was in it for the long term? That she was worth waiting for? Paget bit her lip and tried not to blush with pleasure. She found that she had been typing like a silly schoolgirl, Paget R., Mrs. Paget R., Mrs. Max R. She quickly deleted the silliness on her screen. She really did need to learn Max's last name. Not to doodle it with her own in hearts, of course. Probably. Mrs. Brown shut off the projector, and Paget realized that she had daydreamed through an entire section of class. As much as she liked Max, she had to start paying attention and stop thinking about him. Paget shut her laptop and put all her materials in her messenger bag. Class was nearly done. If I could have everyone's attention, Mrs. Brown clapped her hands. I'd like to announce the top grade and student who will be starting early in the broadcasting booth. The student will be paired with student producer Melanie Krauts, who is in the senior year of the program. Everyone in the class paid close attention. It was a coveted spot, and Paget could feel herself tense. She wanted it badly. She only hoped that she had done enough to on the test to achieve the opportunity. The test was a nice indicator to learn exactly how much you've all retained and have studied ahead in the course. It also was extremely important to know what motivated each of you. This meant that the very first question of the test was worth 50% of the mark, she said. Some students in the class groaned. It was obvious they wished they had spent more time on the first question now that they knew it had been so significant. Paget was glad Mrs. Brown had given her the tip to pay special attention to the first question. She had done her best to answer it fully before continuing with the rest of the test. With a score of 92%, our new amateur broadcaster is Paget Williams, Mrs. Brown announced happily. Paget couldn't believe it. She'd worked so hard and she wanted it. Truthfully, she hadn't expected it. Especially after a rough start that day. This was wonderful. It was going to build her portfolio. This was going to give her the best chance in her future career. Adam, Sasha, and Mariah came over to congratulate her, as did some of the other students. 
Paget received their goodwill in a happy daze. As the class ended, Mrs. Brown approached her and held out a file. "'You'll need to look over the forms, sign the waiver, and return them to me,' Mrs. Brown added another file. "'This is your training package and schedule. Once you've passed the training and Melanie is satisfied that you're ready, we'll start you with a half-hour segment twice a week. Welcome to Radio Broadcasting, Paget.' Paget shook her teacher's hand and took the files. I am so thankful for this opportunity, Mrs. Brown. I really appreciate it. You have earned it, Mrs. Brown smiled. I enjoyed reading your answer to the first question. It seems like you have a real passion for broadcasting. I do, Paget smiled gratefully. Thank you again. Paget took her leave of Mrs. Brown. Right in the middle of the noisy hall, she grabbed her cell phone and called Max. She couldn't wait to share the news with him. It was three rings before he picked up. Hey, beautiful. Paget smiled. Hi. Aren't you supposed to be in school? Max asked. Paget could hear machinery running in the background. I had good news. I got the spot. The all-important broadcasting spot that you've been worrying over for the past two weeks? Max whistled sharply at someone. Shut it off. I'm talking to my girl. Talking to his girl, Paget blushed. She liked the idea of being his girl. The machinery quieted down. Yes, the very one. Then we need to celebrate, Max said. I'm so proud of you, Paget. You're amazing. Paget smiled. I had a little help from you. Thank you, Max. You wrote and aced the test. We are going to celebrate this. Are you working tonight? Paget stifled some disappointment. Yes. That's okay, Max said easily. If you're not too tired afterward, I've got an idea for an hour or so. Just bring your appetite. Okay, Paget said happily. His idea turned out to be a picnic event in Eden Park, a park about twenty minutes away by cab. The park was beautifully landscaped and impressively large. Old-fashioned looking lamps lit the paths, lending it a peaceful atmosphere in the warm night. Max brought her to the fountain, where a little bistro set was waiting with a checkered tablecloth, a vase of flowers, two glasses of wine, and a small plate of assorted appetizers waiting on her pan lid and towel to keep them warm. He removed the reserve sign and seated Paget. How did you set all of this up? she wondered. I have good friends, Max smiled in satisfaction. This is just stop number one. Really? Paget was amused. He really was such a romantic. We are celebrating, Max responded as he took her hand. He proceeded to ask her all about her new position and what it entailed, what her schedule would be like. Soon enough, the appetizers were gone, and Max offered his arm so that they could move to the next spot. Paget leaned into him and enjoyed the walk along the paths in the summer night air. She couldn't believe he had gone through this much trouble for her. He led her to a small garden maze, full of hedges that were hip height. A checkered tablecloth covered the bistro table that waited with their main course, a lit candle and two red wines. Paget allowed him to seat her again and enjoyed unwrapping the foiled salmon, potatoes, and mixed vegetables. She didn't know who had cooked them and gotten the meals to the park, but their timing was perfect because the plate was still hot and the fish perfectly cooked. Idly, Paget wondered if Max was this romantic over a simple celebration dinner, what would he do when he proposed? Paget put the brakes on that thought and concentrated on the lovely meal with Max. She had no right thinking along those lines. They were barely dating. Dessert was on the edge of the band shell. It consisted of chocolate cheesecake, Paget's favorite. Coffee for Max and tea for Paget were waiting, hot and ready on a tiny bistro set. This time, the tablecloth was floral and a small speaker was playing music. I think you cheated, Paget closed her eyes as she took a small bite of the cheesecake on her fork. It tasted divine. How is that? Max asked, sipping his black coffee. His eyes twinkled. I think Dix helped you with the menu choices, Max nodded. She may have had a little input. I have no idea how you are going to top this, Paget said honestly. It's been a perfectly wonderful night. Well, I look forward to trying, Max smiled, gazing at her. And if I succeed, I look forward to topping that experience, and then the next one, and the next. That's a big commitment, Paget remarked and speared another forkful of cake. Max nodded, content. It is. Paget smiled, finishing the cheesecake. She was too full, but didn't regret it one bit. They finished their drinks, and Max led her back through the park again, back to the front gates where the cab was waiting. Back to her apartment building, he waited patiently for her to open the door. Thank you, Max. It was an amazing evening. Paget smiled up at him. 
He really was wonderful. She was going to have to thank Adam for introducing them. He dipped his head and gave her a tender kiss. Paget leaned against him and enjoyed the gentle caress. The thought of inviting him up to her apartment flitted across her mind, but he reluctantly broke off the kisses. Good night, Paget. She leaned against the wall and watched him disappear into the night. Hugging the sensations he had released in her, she made her way upstairs. It had been an amazing day. Thank you for listening. If you enjoyed this chapter, please look for the next chapter of The Reverse Cinderella. Also, please click the bell for notifications so that you don't miss any videos. This is free for you and would really help me grow my audience with the algorithms. Thank you. Chapter 4 Paget opened the door to find Max standing on the other side with a toolbox. She cocked her head to the side. You need to call before you knock. I might not have been home. Or, at the very least, I could have put on makeup and jeans. Makeup only enhances your natural beauty, which you have in abundance. He gave her a quick kiss on the cheek. Plus, I get to see those beautiful legs. Paget shook her head and decided to ignore the comment. What's with the toolbox? This? He hefted the box. I thought I'd wow you with my skills. How long has the bathroom tap been dripping like that? For as long as I've been here? Paget watched him make his way to the washroom. Come on in. Max grinned over his shoulder. Thanks. Paget followed him, watching as he opened the cabinet doors and started taking things out. Why doesn't the superintendent fix it? he asked, his voice muffled as he pulled out a handful of salon products. Sitting on the tub, Paget eyed her cut-off sweatpants and debated throwing them away. She probably should replace them with something more appropriate, but they had been comfortable since she had put on some weight. However, if she was going to have unexpected visitors like today, then she really needed to get rid of them. I live in a building with an inexpensive rent. It's kind of an unwritten rule that nothing gets fixed. I learned that after I complained about the tap multiple times. Well, it's getting fixed today. Max turned the shut-off valve, then drained the water from the faucet. I watched some YouTube videos and got some advice from a guy at work. Piece of cake. You'll have to forgive me if that doesn't sound too confidence-inspiring, Paget said dryly. It'll be fine. It's either one of two problems. The first option is your filter is dirty and needs replacing. He unscrewed the end of the faucet, revealing a small grid-like covering. Grabbing a package out of his pocket, Max unwrapped the replacement and screwed it onto the faucet. He ducked under the sink and turned on the water. Even with the taps off, it began the steady drip again. Option two, Paget asked doubtfully, is changing the cartridges. Max shut off the water again. This is a little bit more involved. Paget watched as he selected a screwdriver and carefully began by dismantling one of the handles on the faucet. He popped them off and then had to use an adjustable wrench to free the cartridge inside the handle. In moments it was out, and there was a fountain gushing water all over the sink, countertop, mirror, floor, and Max. Paget threw her bath towel on top of the sink. I thought you said the water was turned off. Um, let me check. He crouched under the sink again. What about now? The spray of water picked up force. No! Okay, then it has to be this way. The fountain resumed its original gushing pace. I don't think this is supposed to be like this. He did say there would be some water. Now there's a washer and a spring that have to come out. Then I have to insert the new ones and the new cartridge. Tighten it up, and if it's not this side, then we repeat with the other handle. Max looked around. Do you have some tweezers? I think you should call your plumber friend and get him over here to help. Paget rummaged in the medicine closet behind the mirror and tried to ignore the box of tampons staring them both in the face. She quickly grabbed the tweezers and slammed the mirror shut. Here! He's not exactly a plumber. Plus, he's away for the weekend. Max lifted the towel and began poking in the fountain of water with the tweezers. He told me, step by step, what needs to be done. So what can possibly go wrong? Well, my feet are getting wet. I don't think that's supposed to happen. Paget grabbed more towels and laid them on the floor and on the counter, hoping to soak up some of the water. She then grabbed some of the items that he had taken out of the cupboard and moved them to higher ground, namely the bathtub. If you have anything plugged in, you might want to unplug it, just as a safety precaution. Ha-ha! Max grinned as he held up the spring and rubber washer. 
He frowned as he compared the cartridge and components to the ones in the package he had brought. I was sure that I had gotten the right one. Don't tell me. Even Paget could see that the spring and washer were a different size than what was in the package. I need to go to the hardware store for just a moment. Max grabbed the receipt and the two packages. I'll exchange these and be right back. What am I supposed to do in the meantime? She called after him as he left. Channel the water down the sink. Paget heard the door close after him. She stared at the gushing water. This is ridiculous. By the time he came back, all her towels were wet, and she was alternating between mopping up water with them and wringing them out. He still had a smile going, and the thought crossed her mind that this was sort of a rush for him, doing something that he admitted never having done before and having to problem-solve it. She only hoped her bathroom would survive the experience. "'I need something long and thin. Strong, too,' Max looked around. "'Do you have any really thin knitting needles?' "'Do I look like a woman who knits?' Paget gave him a look that clearly communicated that she thought he was out of his mind. How had she let him start this mess? Why had he been so confident when it was clear that he had no idea what he was doing? What, what do you need it for? I need something to hold down the spring until I can insert the cartridge, Max explained. These tweezers are too fat. If I don't hold down the spring, the washer and it get displaced by the water pressure when I try to put in the cartridge. Wait a moment. Paget got a sudden idea. She ran to the kitchen and fumbled through the drawers, looking for the skewers that she had. Finding them, she brought one back to Max. Will this do? Perfect. He grabbed it and carefully did a sort of plumbing surgery on the tap. A minute later, he used the wrench and the water mercifully stopped flowing. Max crouched in front of the sink. Fingers crossed. He turned on the water and nothing happened. They stared at the sink. It wasn't dripping steadily any more. It wasn't dripping at all. Tentatively, Max turned one handle and the water flowed. He shut it off, then tried the other handle. Water flowed and shut off as it should. They looked at each other in amazement. It works! Max was ecstatic. There's no drip any more. Paget could hardly believe it. You fixed it. We fixed it, he held up the tweezers and skewer. It drove me crazy for months, but I couldn't afford a plumber, and now in an hour you fixed it. Her bathroom looked like a bomb had gone off, yet she didn't care. Paget gave Max a hug. Thank you. Admit it. For a moment you thought I'd totally screwed it up, Max said in her ear as he hugged her back. Maybe, Paget allowed, smiling. Well, I might have thought the same thing. For a moment. Max let her go, and she realized they were both sopping wet. Paget pushed her hair at her face and tried to ignore the butterflies in her stomach. Um, I'm going to change into something dry. I have your shirt if you want it. I washed it. That would be good. He tightened the handle and began putting away the tools. Have you had breakfast yet? No, she replied. In her bedroom, Paget grabbed clothes at random from her closet. No, not that shirt. She threw it on the bed and grabbed another. I know a place that makes great omelets, Max said from the bathroom. Sounds good, she said as she shed her cut-offs and pulled on a pair of jeans. Paget hoped it wasn't an expensive place because her cash level was low and she didn't get paid until Friday. The good thing was, Max didn't strike her as an expensive type of guy. It's just a mom-and-pop place, but it's clean. I like the owners. They remember their customers. Nice, Paget shrugged into a shirt. She was going to have to use the disaster of a bathroom to do her hair and makeup. Grabbing Max's clean and folded Henley off the top of her clean clothes pile, Paget made her way to the washroom. Here. Thanks. Max had wrung out her towels and had them hanging over the shower rod in the side of the tub. He had put away everything back under the sink where it belonged. Here's your skewer. You didn't have to clean up. Not a big deal. He exchanged the skewer for the shirt, and Paget left him to get changed. Thank you. Paget quickly shoved the stuff back in the drawers of the kitchen, which she had rifled through to find the skewer and close them. Max came out wearing his Henley, which looked much better on him than on her, and carrying the toolbox. I'll be just a moment. In the bathroom, Paget swiped on some mascara and lip gloss. She ran a brush through her hair. It was all she really felt comfortable having time for, considering Max was waiting in the other room. Besides, it was only breakfast. The restaurant turned out to be a cramped little space that used to be a store along the old downtown area. It was brightly painted and cheery, but not much in the way of seating. Fortunately, someone vacated a table, and they were able to sit in the busy little eatery. The food smelled amazing. 
it only took seconds before the owner and his wife were at their table greeting max and introducing themselves to her in broken english it was obvious max was a favorite among their patrons they promised to take good care of paget and max leaving them to enjoy their drinks they seem really nice paget sipped her tea and watched as the owner greeted a pregnant woman kissing her on the cheek and grabbing her bags of groceries he pointed in Max's direction, and she frowned as she spotted Max. Uh-oh, incoming. Max stood as she waded over, a stream of language following her as she said something to him. Max looked a little shocked and repeated a word before he hugged her. She was exotic, gorgeous, pregnant, and hugging Max. Paget felt a little trepidation. This is all your fault, the woman said as she sat down in Max's chair and rubbed her stomach. Hi, I'm Elle. Paget. Paget introduced herself politely. Nice to meet you. Two? Is the doctor sure? Wouldn't they have found that out before now? Max asked as he purloined another chair from a table and sat down. They say the heartbeats were synced together, and he was hiding behind his brother during the first ultrasound. I'm going to be fat. She eyed Paget and turned to Max. She's very pretty. Max grinned. Yes, she is. You said his brother? Two boys? Don't remind me. One was all it was supposed to be. El wagged a finger under Max's nose. Is she the reason you haven't been here recently? How long have you been dating her? Um, I'm right here, Paget weakly waved a hand. Max took Paget's hand in his. She is the reason I've been a bit busy to come by lately. Paget began to wonder if they were in one of those modern open relationship things. Was this Max's way of introducing her to his pregnant other girlfriend? If so, Elle seemed to be okay with it. Paget sure wasn't. Um, Max, how do you two know each other? Paget asked carefully. Elle is my sister-in-law, Max explained. She married my brother. Okay, I have to ask. Paget was relieved. She pointed to Elle's midsection. How is the baby Max's fault? Elle laughed. He introduced me to his brother, Noah. Those are my first nephews in there. Max grinned and gestured to Elle's midsection. "'And don't tell your brother. I just found out.' The owner's wife came with three plates of food. She set one in front of each of them. Elle smiled at her. "'Thank you, Mama." The restaurant owner's wife smiled back and chatted something in her language, before continuing with her work behind the counter. Elle salted her eggs. "'Max used to work here during the winters. His brother Noah would come in to bother him, and Max introduced us.' Noah has a bad habit of following me around, which is funny because he's older than I am, Max said as he spared some home fries. He was worried about you, Elle said as she sipped some coffee. Worried about you? Paget asked Max. The food here really was delicious. There was nothing to worry about. I was fine, Max gave Elle a look like he'd wish she wasn't saying quite so much. You were living in the streets. You still are, she shook her head. You're crazy. No and I have a spare room that you could use. Paget felt like she was only hearing half of the conversation. What? Living on the streets? Surely she meant that he just lived in a rough area of town. Besides, Ed and a few others that came and went in the park, Paget didn't know anyone who actually lived on the streets. Max really didn't seem like the type. He was the one who was giving them food and money. Max looked uncomfortable, and Elle dropped her fork. You haven't told her. Haven't told me what? Paget's voice may have been a little sharp. Gary hadn't told her a lot of things, and she did not need a repeat of that. We've just started dating. Max set down his cup of coffee. It hadn't come up just yet. Tell me what? Paget repeated sweetly, looking at Max, who looked daggers at Elle, who kept shifting her gaze between the two of them. Elle sighed. He's homeless, honey. Excuse me? Paget couldn't absorb the words. Surely not. Max used to come in here all the time when he was looking for work. We have a jobs board at the back. Anyhow, his brother would come in and check up on him. My parents own the place, which is how I met Noah. She was sympathetic. Max is homeless. I thought he would have told you. You're the first girl he's brought here. Paget looked at Max in stunned silence. I was going to tell you. Just not quite yet gave Elle a tight look and reached for Paget's hand, which she pulled away. Paget? I think I need a moment. She looked at Elle. How much was the breakfast? 
"'It's covered,' she said, pity in her eyes. "'I'm buying,' Max said at the same time. Paget fumbled for her purse. This woman pitied her. This beautiful, pregnant woman who was married to Max's brother Noah and had a home with a spare room to offer. Of course she would pity Paget. She was the one who had been going out with Max, the homeless brother. Another step down from her post-Gary era. She felt so dumb. Did she have gullible stapled across her forehead? Or was it in a blazing neon sign? Excuse me. Paget, you don't need to go. I can explain. Max rose to his feet as Paget did. Paget walked away before she could start to cry. There was a time enough for that later. She could hear Max follow her, but she stared resolutely ahead. He circled around until he was right in front of Paget, walking backwards. Paget, please stop so we can talk about this. Max pleaded as Paget simply walked around him. I said I needed a moment. Paget was surprised the words came out steady because she didn't feel steady at all. She wondered if it was too much to expect from a man, any man, that he be honest, completely and totally honest. Why, Max persisted, because I'm homeless? Paget hurried her steps. Because you lied to me. She could see Max's frustration, yet it didn't make her feel any better. I didn't lie. I just chose not to tell you yet. Please get out of my way, Paget said. The sidewalk had narrowed and there was a lot of people crowding it. Max grabbed her hand and kneeled in front of her. A few people cheered, thinking there was a proposal going on. Most just simply walked around the two, intent on going about their daily business. Paget, the key word is yet. I didn't tell you yet. I fully intended to. We've just started dating, and it's not exactly something I lead with. Hi, I'm Max, and I don't have a home. I sound like some dog from the pound. It usually turns people off. I know, because I've been doing this for a few years. Please let go of my hand, Paget whispered furiously, her face turning red. It was humiliating to have people staring at them this way, some blatantly eavesdropping. It's not a personal thing. I'm just saving the money that I would put in rent and utilities toward a debt that I have. Once it's paid off, I fully intend to find a place which is going to happen soon, he explained. Please, Paget. I believe we have something special here. Don't walk away from us. Paget shook her head and could feel hot tears well up behind her eyes. Max rose and tried to cup her face in his hands, but Paget jerked back, putting her hands up to ward him off and shakily said, Don't touch me. Gary had always tried that move with a smooth babe in it to try to convince her of whatever lie he was brewing, like when she found some other woman's panties in his suit jacket. Paget was never going to fall for that move again. Max dropped his hands, looking down at her with sad eyes. Paget, I don't want this to end. Please, I am so sorry. I didn't mean to hurt you. Paget held up a hand to forestall any further talking from him. The crowd thinned at the crosswalk, and she took the opportunity to get by him. This time, he didn't follow. She spent an hour staring at the tap that they had just fixed that morning, willing it to drip, but it didn't. She spent the next hour crying in the shower, and then she had to reuse a sweatshirt to dry herself off with because she only had wet towels. Paget didn't know what to think. She didn't appreciate not knowing and having Max's situation sprung on her in that sort of way. She didn't like being the last to know, because she had learned the hard way that being the last to know something usually meant it was bad news for her. How Paget wished he had told her sooner. Then again, he was probably right. She wouldn't have gone out with a homeless man. She wouldn't have trusted him. How often weren't people told that homeless people had mental health issues, or were on drugs or psychotic or something? Max seemed perfectly normal, but people didn't choose to live on the streets, did they? In retrospect, Paget could see some warning signs. He hadn't told her his address. He wasn't exactly the cleanliest, but that had improved. He'd been skimming free drinks from the college crew. He liked to do free activities. Paget liked free activities, too. She was poor, she reasoned. What if he did have some sort of mental health issue that caused him to like living on the streets? How do you date a homeless man? Finally, Paget sighed and got ready to go to work. It was going to be a really long day, and she wished she could afford to call in sick. Dix was already there when Paget got to the cafe. She set her purse under the counter and wrapped an apron around herself. What, no cheery greeting? 
Dix asked. Trouble in paradise? Text or call your boyfriend, Paget said suddenly. Tell him to come here. Why? She stacked paper cups. He's not my boyfriend. I just tell him to do things for me, and he does. Like a minion. Well, tell him you want him at the cafe. Again, why? So I can ambush him. Paget smiled insincerely at a customer. Hi, how can I help you today? This sounds promising, Dick said as she whipped out her phone and began texting. When a customer at her till cleared his throat, she gave him a dirty look. I'm on break. She wasn't, but the ploy worked. The disgruntled customer joined Paget's line. She served three customers, and then Dix announced that she could help the next person in line, which happened to be her original customer. He muttered something about reporting her to her supervisor. Dix ignored the remark and served him his requested items. When the customers were gone, Dix began sorting through the fridge, looking for any out-of-date items. What did he do? You'll hear all about it when Adam comes, Paget said grimly. Adam is here. Adam puffed a little as he approached the counter. I came as fast as I could. You said it was an emergency. Suddenly furious, Paget grabbed Adam's shirt and hauled him as far across the counter as Girth would allow her to. She got right up in his face. Did you know? Whoa! Adam's eyes were real big in surprise. Know what? Dix leaned both elbows on the counter, propping her chin in her hand and watched fascinated. I don't think I've ever seen her this way, Adam. Better fess up and deal than to make her any more mad. Fess up and deal? Who says that? Adam gave her a strange look and tried to untangle Paget's fist from the collar of his shirt. I think I was parroting my parents, Dix shuddered. What is he supposed to know? Paget unclenched her teeth in her hands, allowing Adam to have his shirt back. Did you know about Max's situation? Adam froze from straightening out his shirt. He tried to be innocent. What situation? The one where he doesn't have a house, or an apartment, or a room. Paget leaned across the counter, and Adam backed away. The situation where he lives out of a cardboard box. Oh, that situation, Adam said weakly. What? asked Dix. Seriously? Max is homeless? You knew, Paget accused, pointing a finger at him. I told you I met him on Elm Street, he shrugged. I didn't think it would matter. Oh, it matters, Dix and Paget exclaimed at the same time. Max is a nice guy, Adam protested. He doesn't do drugs. He barely drinks. He's kind, and he bothered to be my friend when he didn't have to. He's currently homeless. So what? When I get out of school, I'm going to have debts to pay, too. He's paying back this loan, and he's got a plan to stay on track. He'll be done before the year is over. I thought you liked him. I did. I do, Paget sighed. I just wish you would have told me. Would you have gone out with him? Adam asked. I don't know, she said. Probably not, if she was being truthful to herself. Who was she kidding? No, I wouldn't have. When you're dating someone, you expect that they'll be employed and at the place of residence. You would have missed out on a really great guy, Adam pointed out. And you wonder why I thought Adam was gay, Dix raised an eyebrow at Paget. Adam looked at her in shock. You thought I was gay? You keep talking Max up like he's the greatest thing, Dick said dryly. He's my friend, Adam said defensively. I'm being his wingman. His wing is broken. He's homeless. There's no making that truth soar like an eagle. Dix shook her head. Give it up, Robin. Your Batman is broke, and Alfred is on the unemployment line. I don't like your analogies, Adam said. I don't care, Paget inserted. The important thing is that... Both you and Max didn't tell me. I had to learn the truth from someone else, which hurts because I thought we were friends. I'm so sorry, Paget. Adam apologized. You're right, I should have been a better friend and I should have told you. Paget buried her head in her hands and leaned on the counter. I don't know what to do. Are you going to see him again? Dix asked. I don't know. I don't think so. Did he grovel? Dix questioned. Really, she asked too many questions, thought Paget. I usually base my choice on how long I punish a boyfriend on how well he grovels. Adam laid a hand on Paget's arm in sympathy. I honestly think you and Max were made for each other. I never would have introduced you otherwise. I feel like he lied to me. 
I know he says he just omitted the truth and had every intention of telling me, but... Paget shook her head. I won't be in a relationship with someone who isn't telling me the truth. Adam nodded. I'm sorry, Paget. I'm sorry, too. I also apologize for grabbing you. It was uncalled for. Paget gestured to the menu. Have anything you like on me. No, I can't do that. I know you're as broke as I am. He gave a smile. I'll still take my frothy coffee and Cinnabon, but I will pay for it. Dix pretended not to flirt with Adam for the next couple of hours while she and Paget took care of customers. Finally, they reached the end of their shift and began closing. Paget leaned on the broom and asked, "'Aren't you ever worried that one of the customers like that guy today will actually report you to the manager?' "'Who would they report me to?' "'You'll notice our boss, Absent Allen, is gone yet again. Besides, most customers never actually complain to management. They just say they're going to.' Dix finished the cash drawer accounting and put the money in the safe. "'As long as the till balances, the place is clean, and no one is really busting Alan about a worker, all is good in his life. He's my cousin. He gave me a job as a favor to my mother.' "'He likes your mom that much?' Patchett asked. "'No. He thinks she's a nut. I told him if he didn't give me a job with enough hours, I'd be homeless and starving artist. When my mom asked me why, I'd tell her it was Alan's fault for not hiring me. She'd camp on his doorstep and make his life misery. Dix folded up her apron. Which is why I'm now employed here. You really need to learn how to manipulate people. That is a gift I do not possess. Paget didn't want to possess that gift. She folded her apron and stacked it with Dix's under the counter. When she looked up, there was Max waiting by the door. Paget felt a moment of pain before she walked over and pointed to the clothes sign hanging there. I know. Max said to the glass door. I want to walk you home. We don't have to talk. I just want to make sure you get home safe. That's all. Paget pulled down the blind, shutting him out. Do you want to split a cab and come to my place? Dix asked quietly. Do you have ice cream? And Netflix? Deal. Paget leaned on the counter, burying her head in her hands and concentrating on breathing evenly until the cab came. I told Elle, no deal, Noah snorted. She's out of her mind if she wants to name the babies Colton and Corbin. Max grabbed at the ball, dribbling it across the court. He held out a hand to try and hold off Noah as he sprinted for the end, making a one-handed shot that missed the basket. Noah grabbed the basketball off the bounce. You are off your game. Max quickly wiped the sweat out of his eyes. He waited for Noah to make a move, but his brother just stood there, chest heaving from the workout they had been putting each other through. Max sighed. Noah wasn't going to budge until he talked to him. Maybe. Noah grunted. I'm up by twenty. You're not paying attention. Twenty? Max grimaced. Are you sure about that? Spill it already, Noah said as he went to the edge of the park and grabbed his water bottle. Max hesitated but decided to confide in Noah. Noah had experience with trying to win over a woman. He was married to Elle, one of Max's friends, and it hadn't been a smooth courtship, but the couple were completely happy now. "'There's a woman.' "'This is a first. Noah remarked mildly. "'A woman having you in knots, when usually it's the other way around.' "'She's special.' "'How special?' Noah cocked an eyebrow. He was slightly amused to see Max this way. "'Knock the breath out of you the first time you see her, ring-worthy, future-sharing,' Max reflected. She's kind, she's accomplished, she's sweet. That is special. Noah studied Max. You're in love with her. That's not the problem, Max said ruefully. What is? She's mad at me because she thinks I lied to her, Max admitted. He wiped his face with his shirt, then took the ball from Noah. He tossed it from hand to hand, feeling fidgety. Did you? Noah raised an eyebrow. Lying to a woman was a sure way to get on their short list. Max gave Noah an unamused look. No. Noah waited patiently. There was more to this story than what Max was telling. I may have omitted an important detail about my living situation, Max allowed. She didn't know you've been living at the men's shelter again, Noah said flatly. He hated that his brother refused to live in a regular apartment or a house. Max had some idea about paying off a debt he had before paying out for rent or utilities. The shelter is better than the truck. At least I can get regular showers there. 
Max threw the ball, and it sunk through the basket perfectly. He watched it bounce across the tarmac. Women tend to appreciate the fact that a man has a place of residence, a house, a condo, an apartment. It makes them feel like he can provide for them, Noah gently said. It may have been a bit of a shock to her. I want her back, Max groused. And I would suggest groveling long and hard, preferably with gifts, Noah retied his sneaker. It should explain why you're living in the shelter or out of your truck. Maybe she'll understand. And if she doesn't? Then it wasn't meant to be. Noah laid a hand on Max's shoulder. Look, I don't agree with what you're doing, because I think you could at least take care of yourself in a cheap apartment, or let me pay for one. And while I don't agree with the how, I still understand why you are doing it, giving the money you earned to those kids. You know, if you want me to up my annual donation to your fund, I will. Max shook his head. You have L now, and two kids on the way. I'm not going to ask you to do that. I'm offering, Noah insisted. I'm turning you down, Max sighed. Most of the beneficiaries have passed away. There's only a couple left. Once I catch up on the bills, I'll be okay. I almost wish I had met Paget a year from now, when it's all finished. No, you don't, Noah admonished him. Then she couldn't understand the sacrifice that you've done as well as she can by seeing you go through it. Max nodded morosely. Oh, you're going to have to tell her about everything. I don't want to. At Noah's inquiring look, he clarified, I don't want her to know I'm a Ramsley. Not yet. We just started dating, and I just want to keep it to myself for a little longer. What's wrong with being a Ramsley? Noah asked, confused and a little offended. All the other girls I used to date. They knew I was a Ramsley. They were in it for the name, the cash, the adventure. Not one of them knew me, which is why it was easy to leave them. Max got up and retrieved the ball. He tossed it back and forth with his hands. Paget knows me. I'm not part of the Ramsley Empire anymore. I'm just a guy making it on my own. I like that. Right now, she likes that. She'll admire you all the more for it. Noah didn't really see the problem. Max shrugged. She's important. <laughs> you fell hard, Noah observed. I don't think I could even describe it. Life is just better when she's there. Then maybe you'd better think hard about getting an apartment or some place to live. Noah grabbed the ball out of Max's hands, unless you want to convince her to let you move into her place. Noah took his shot, and it floated through the basket perfectly. He retrieved it and tossed the ball to Max. Not yet. We aren't at that point. Max took his shot, and it bounced off the rim. Excuse me? Noah laughed as he grabbed the ball. This from the playboy who used to live with a new honey each week? I wasn't that bad, Max protested. He ran a hand through his hair in frustration. I want to do things right with Paget. When do I get to meet her? Noah asked. The way you are with women? Hopefully never, Max joked, grabbing the ball from Noah and sprinting to take a shot. It went wide. He shook his head. She really is affecting my game. You'd better get her back. Otherwise, I'm going to have no one worth practicing with, Noah observed dryly. Max sent her flowers. He sent her candy. He sent her cards. He sent a trio of men in suits with two violins and a cello to serenade her. She slammed the door on them. Max placed an ad on the radio apologizing. Her radio at the college. She was incredibly embarrassed. She put her head on the desk and covered it with her hands. The girl swooned at how romantic her boyfriend was. The guys glared because they didn't want to go through the same lengths to keep their girls. He sent her a wrapped box, which, out of curiosity, she had to open. It was a diamond necklace by the jewelry brand Paget. He couldn't afford a place to live, but he bought her one of the most expensive brands of jewelry in the world. Paget brought it to Elle at the diner and told her to tell Max to stop it. She didn't give the pregnant woman a chance to respond and promptly left. He sent her a gourmet food package. She gave it to Ed. He sent a bottle of Chateau Margot. She pawned it and gave the money to Ed. Every time he came to the cafe, she let Dix handle him and went to the ladies' room until he left. She wondered if she was going to have to take out a restraining order. She didn't want to. He kept apologizing, and she kept avoiding him. Finally, he left a note taped to her door. Paget sighed and unfolded it to see his now-familiar scrawl. Paget, 
I'm sorry I didn't tell you. I did intend to, but I wanted to wait because I was afraid that you would reject me. I have a debt that I owe to some amazing people who are having a hard time in life, and I am trying to pay it off before I pay for any luxuries for myself, including a place to live. It might seem silly, but it's important to me. The money is almost repaid. Afterward, I fully intend to go back to living inside like a normal person. I'm sorry that you had to go through all of this. You're an amazing, beautiful, talented, sweet woman. I never meant to make you unhappy. I promise I'll leave you alone. Max. Paget shut the door, went back to bed, and burst into tears. Chapter 5 Good morning, Mayor Johns. Welcome to 88.5 Studio Radio at Uni 5, Paget said nervously. It was her first live show, and for some reason Mrs. Brown had set her up with an interview with the mayor of the city. She really didn't need the extra pressure. "'Good morning, Paige. It's a pleasure to be here,' he smiled toothily. Paget, she quietly corrected him. "'Excuse me?' "'My name?' Paget clarified. "'It's Paget, like the jewelry brand.' The mayor gave a jolly little laugh, making his potbelly move up and down. "'Sorry about that, Pagey.' Paget gave a tight smile and adjusted her microphone. She looked at the clipboard full of talking points and chose one at random. Moving on, I see that you have some pretty amazing campaign promises that you are building your platform on. Would you like to talk about your three most important ones? Sure. Obviously, I view education as a fundamentally important... He blathered on, and Paget mentally tuned him out, even while smiling and nodding politely, which was all the encouragement he needed to continue. Paget sipped coffee and made a few notes on her clipboard, but her attention snapped back to the mayor as he began to talk about the homeless people in the city. We have a homeless problem. Despite shelters, despite clinics and employment assistance, there are too many people living on our streets. I plan on tackling this issue head on. Paget nearly choked in surprise. What do you plan to do, mayor? I'm offering a great program that will solve a lot of issues. Budgets are constrained. We can't afford services to those who continually leech off the system. Money needs to be better spent, so I propose that we give each homeless person the opportunity to relocate, paid by the city. Paget's brain scrambled to keep up at this unexpected turn of events. So, essentially, you're paying the problem to go away? We're allocating funds to help them choose a different home. This way, they no longer represent a drain on our resources. Plus, after the relocation program is finished, we will no longer be giving financial assistance to those without a permanent address. Call it an incentive to use the relocation program, John said. The mayor seemed very pleased with himself. You're kidding me, right? This is some joke? Paget couldn't believe what she had just heard. You're blackmailing these people who have mental health and other issues, who are at one of the most difficult times in their lives. You're forcing them to move so that you don't have to look at them any more? Mayor Johns gave an another jolly laugh. I wouldn't call it blackmail. It's incentive to choose a new path. You're telling them they can't get more funding unless they leave. Paget felt outraged. You're making them even poorer than what they are. Paige, the homeless problem is one that is very difficult, and I've been tasked with solving it. He talked to her as if she were a little child who was having a hard time understanding a perfectly easy math problem. This is a viable solution with a win-win scenario for all. It's Paget, Paget corrected, her voice cold. And homelessness isn't a problem. It's a symptom of a society which has grown apathetic to those in need of assistance. We should be helping them, not displacing them. There simply isn't enough money for all the public assistance programs that we have. We need to choose between someone who is chronically on the streets, usually addicted, has mental health issues, or the children who need assistance in school, who might have ADD or ADHD, and with the right programs can have a bright future. I'm choosing the children. How can we deny our children? And it's not that the homeless still won't get help. They'll just need to move out of our city to find it, and we have generously offered to help with the relocating. That's very magnanimous of you, Mr. Mayor. Sarcasm crept into her voice, and Patchett's mouth started running without her brain. She was so furious. 
Have you even met the homeless people that you are now trying to deport? Who are you going to deport after them? Senior citizens? They're a drain on our resources, too, having all these health and social needs. Let's throw them on the bus, too. Or maybe under it. Who else would you like to discriminate against? Whoa! No one is discriminating against anyone. Mayor Johns's laugh became a little nervous. We're trying to help everyone through this initiative. I fail to see how shoving your problem onto some other city is going to help anyone. Did you even contact the city where you intend to bus all these people to? Paget ignored her student producer, Melanie, who was making slicing motions at her neck, trying to get Paget to shut up. Are you sure they are willing to take these people in? The program allows the participants to choose the bus route that they would like to purchase, the mayor explained. Well, isn't that nice? Finally, giving the homeless person a choice, Paget said as she hit the applause button on her desk board, and laughter with clapping flooded the airway for a two-second interval. I have a question. Is there no one that will oppose you and your policy of discrimination? Again, I wouldn't call it discrimination. We're trying to help with an innovative solution. Mayor Jolly Johns laughed again, his wide girth giggling with the effort. And I am, as of yet, running unopposed. If no one steps up this week, I'll return to office after the application date closes. And what qualifications does one have to have to apply for the position? Paget asked crisply. Well, you should have an interest in your community. Some business or social background is an asset, but most of all, you need to be willing to listen to your constituents and help them. A dream of making this city a better place to live is essential. All these qualities I have, and I know you won't be disappointed with me for another term in office. Is it difficult to apply? Why, no, it's just an online process. Then you need to run a campaign, which can get very expensive. Then the best man wins, Mayor John said. By his smile, Paget could tell that he felt that was himself. Perhaps the best woman will win, Paget smiled back, teeth bared. I'm going to apply today. That's right, everyone who is listening, I need your votes so we can get this pompous, self-important, slimy, sleazy. Suddenly, Paget was just talking to herself as her microphone was cut off the air and her producer spoke over the airwaves. That was Mayor Johns, everyone. I hope you enjoyed the interview. It was a pleasure, Mayor. Glad to have been here, John said. Well, he didn't sound that way any more. The live on-air light went out, and he grumpily put up a finger right in front of Paget's face. I don't know what you think you're up to, lady, but this isn't going to fly. You can't just announce that you're running against me. I own this town. Anyone can apply as long as they have a dream of making the city a better place to live. She echoed his earlier words right back at him. You'll lose, Mayor Johns growled and swept out of the room. <laughs> you better win. Every year we get money from the city to run this program. After the way you just spoke with the mayor... If Johns wins, I don't think he'll ever fund us again. With a dubious look, Paget's student producer took off her headphones and headed for the door. No money, no radio. Sighing, Paget took off her headphones. Why did she have such a big mouth, she wondered ruefully. She gathered her clipboard and left the booth. She was sure that this was not going to go over well. In her anger, she had said she was going to run for a position she knew nothing about one that she wasn't sure she even wanted. She was supposed to be focused on school. She blamed Max. Paget had been going through life in a sad, dazed sort of way since she'd broken up with him. It was worse ever since he had sent that note, the note that she cried over at least once a day. She realized that she didn't want him to give up. Paget wanted him to convince her to take him back. She felt entirely conflicted. She wanted him to tell the truth, but what if he already was? What if he had intended to tell her, but just hadn't been ready? Paget sighed. She didn't know what to do. Thankfully, she was done with school for the day. She could avoid the consequences of what she had said on air to the mayor for a few more hours. Hopefully, she wouldn't get into too much trouble. She needed to stay in the broadcasting booth. When Paget got to the diner, Dix had the pieces of the smoothie machine strewn across the counter. She glared at the offending machine. Broken? Paget asked dryly as she tied on her apron. Yep. Dix reached in and tried to wriggle a piece. Piece of junk. Life is junk, Paget muttered. She grabbed napkins to stuff into the napkin holders. Hey! Dix held up a part of the machine, pointing it at Paget angrily. 
I'm sick of you moping around. You were somewhat happy before Max came into your life. If you can't find your somewhat happy state back, then you need to get back together with Max. Dix, I'm not going back to him, Paget protested. Sure you are. You've made him grovel. He's done more than any man that I've ever met would do, which proves he's super into you. He makes you happy. You're miserable without him. He didn't tell me the truth. I've been thinking about that, Dix fiddled with the machine. I'm wondering if he wasn't telling the truth about intending to tell you later. You should have told me already. I didn't need to find out from L. Paget stubbornly insisted as she finished the napkins. Don't you think it would be embarrassing to tell your new girlfriend that you're homeless? Guys are traditionally seen as the breadwinners in society. He can't even take care of himself. How is he going to take care of you? He has to be slightly humiliated by his living situation. Most women would probably run once they found out, so you have to think he might be a little justified in being reluctant to say anything, Dix said. Something clicked and she straightened. Huh, that's where that goes. You're taking his side? Paget asked. She felt a little offended that her friend would do so. No, I'm saying you're both right. Plus, I fed you ice cream and Netflix, so I feel I have the right to say it. Dick started to reassemble the smoothie machine. I understand that you want the truth in your relationship. Tell him that, then give him a second chance. I don't think I'm talking to you right now. Paget got her till ready for the shift. You're only angry because you know I'm right. Dix observed. She put the cover back on, plugging it in, and ran the machine. It works! Paget did not respond. She chose to ignore Dix for the rest of the night. Maybe because she knew deep down that there might be a little truth to what her friend had said. The next day, Paget was called to Mrs. Brown's office before classes. With trepidation, Paget entered the, and took a seat. Mrs. Brown and the dean of the college were there. Paget knew she was in real trouble and hoped she would be able to salvage her broadcasting position. "'Do you know why I've called you here, Paget? Mrs. Brown asked her. "'I would assume it had to do with the conversation I had on air with Mayor Johns yesterday.' Paget tried to keep a pleasant expression on her face, even as she tamped down her fear that she was feeling. She really could not afford to get suspended over this, and the dean was hovering over the teacher's shoulder. "'Your conversation with Mayor Johns was inappropriate.' We welcomed him as an honored guest, and you chose to attack him on air. This is unacceptable. The dean was very precise with his words. I understand. Paget was doing her best to be conciliatory. She needed to stay a student in good standing, even if it hurt to say it. I was angry about his policies, and I chose to express that anger in a less than constructive way. I apologize and will make certain that I don't do it again. Mayor John's office is responsible for a good portion of the radio broadcasting funding. We rely on that funding to supplement our budget so that we can continue to afford licensing for our on-air programs. In return, we allow Mayor John's to discuss his campaign so that students can be informed on their vote, the dean said as he took out a handkerchief and mopped his brow. I've become informed that you announced that you're going to run against the mayor in the election. While I cannot control your activities off this campus, and I understand the temptation to have something like this to enhance a resume, I strongly advise against running for mayor. It would do you and the college no service when you lose. Excuse me? Paget began to feel offended. Really, who said who she was going to lose? Not that she had even signed up yet, or really had intended to, after her passionate outburst over the radio. Who says I'm going to lose? "'Mrs. Williams,' the dean's tone was patronizing at best. "'Really? What is your platform? What are you going to get funding from? Running for mayor is a full-time job. When would you complete your studies? I understand you are also in our work program. You cannot afford to miss time.' Missing time in the work program meant Paget might lose her position to another student. It meant paying full tuition instead of having hours of work time taken away from the total amount. She couldn't afford to miss anything that helped pay the bills. Paget gritted her teeth. I understand that I need to make college my priority, but I cannot agree with Mayor John's policy against the homeless persons in this city. You don't have to agree, Mrs. Williams. You just need to be silent about it. 
There was a distinct threat in the dean's voice as he leaned over the desk, his balding head shining in the light. I understand you are up for an important internship. I'd hate for anything to jeopardize that. Paget hated her husband's last name. She wanted nothing to remind her of her dead husband, but she didn't have the money needed to change it back to her maiden name. She promised herself as soon as she got a job, Paget was going to change it and never listen to some balding, comb-over, know-it-all threaten her again with Gary's last name. Are you threatening me? Of course not. I'm just saying it would be a shame. Drop out of the election, Mrs. Williams, the dean said. He straightened his tie and then nodded to Mrs. Brown before exiting the room. Is the door closed? Mrs. Brown peered around her. Paget checked, slightly confused. Yes? Good! Mrs. Brown got up and pulled up a chair next to Paget's. She leaned forward excitedly. You need to run for mayor. But the dean just said not to. Paget was confused. He's part of the old boys' club. Him and John's go way back. No, you need to run and you need to win, she said. Her eyes sparkled behind her Coke bottle glasses. This thing has gone viral. The students are eating it up. Do you know on average how many listeners we have on a Thursday morning? A thousand. A thousand! We have a student body of twelve thousand and less than ten percent listen to us at any given moment. I've had so many kids dropping in and asking about you. They put the audio on YouTube. It has fifteen thousand hits as of this morning. Your campaign is practically writing itself. People are ready for someone to give it to Mayor Johns. Fifteen thousand? Paget was incredulous. No, not possible. Mrs. Brown nodded happily, practically dancing in her chair. I'm giving you more airtime. And a call-in segment. The kids are excited. Someone from their college, running for office, fighting for the little guy. Everyone likes the issue and thinks you're on the right side of it. It's free advertising. I'm going to use you for social media class. We can help you do the entire campaign. Film segments, posts, create videos, the whole bit. Won't you get in trouble for that? Paget asked, concerned for her. Mrs. Brown pushed her glasses up her nose and waved a hand dismissively in the air. The dean doesn't even know what social media is. He's a social dinosaur. We'll sweep right in under his nose. What about the internship? Paget was worried this would affect her chance of getting one. The dean had said as much just moments ago. That crappy thing where you run coffee for the local news crew? You don't want that. Besides, we do this right and you get voted into mayor. Think about it, Paget. That's a public office with a budget and a salary, a paid position. You won't be slaving in a free position where you'll learn nothing because all you do is fetch coffee. But you hope you get a good review so that it looks good on your resume. Being mayor could help our city. Help those homeless people you're so passionate about, and also help yourself with your tuition. What if I lose? Paget whispered. To miss out on a coveted internship, even if it was indentured servitude groveling to people who really weren't stars but managed to stay on the airwaves, was stupid. But to get a job as mayor? She didn't know half of what a mayor did. It will look brilliant on your resume, Mrs. Brown exclaimed. You can showcase the entire campaign as your port. Folio. You really want me to do this? Paget was amazed. She had no idea the argument she had with Mayor Johns would create such a stir. The whole class wants you to do this. It could be a rallying point for our school. We have political sciences classes, economics classes, social media, and broadcasting. Who knows what other departments we can get involved with your electoral debut? This would be really good for the school. The dean doesn't seem to think so. Oh, who cares what the dean thinks? Mrs. Brown waved a hand, dismissing him. The important thing is what you think. Yesterday you were impassioned about the plight of the homeless. Are you going to leave them in this situation that the mayor is making? Or are you going to keep your word and run for office? Paget felt pressure from so many sides. She hadn't meant for this to happen. Her big mouth had run away with her again, and indignation had fed the fire. It was true, though, she did care about the homeless. Or, perhaps more accurately, she cared for one of them very much, and Paget really didn't want Mayor Johns to force him to move. It wasn't like she could have a relationship with someone who was homeless, but maybe they would be good friends. Hmm, who was she kidding? 
Padgett didn't want to be friends. She wanted something far more. She wanted Max back. She just wasn't ready to admit it yet. Padgett took a deep breath and committed. Okay, I'll run. Mrs. Brown actually clapped her hands for joy. Great! Let's go to the lab, download any relevant information, and get your nomination confirmed. Now? Why not? She smiled enthusiastically and looped an arm through Padgett's, practically dragging her from the office and down the hall. Mrs. Brown chattered nonstop about how this was going to be so great for the school and students. Padgett realized Mrs. Brown was probably closer to her in age than she originally thought. She's probably prematurely graying and hadn't bothered to find a dye or wash to cover it. Plus, the Coke bottle glasses weren't exactly doing great things for her. Nor was the frumpy sweater and tweed skirt. One thing was for certain, Padgett wasn't going to need to find a campaign manager. She had her right here. Mrs. Brown, would you be my campaign manager? Who, me? Mrs. Brown blinked, surprised by Padgett's question. Absolutely. You know all about the social media platforms. You have the contacts in the other departments. You've got most of my campaign mapped out already from what you've told me. With you overseeing the part, I can concentrate on the issues and still keep up with my schooling and job. I know that you'd be great at it, especially with help from the class. Oh, I don't know. She seemed a little overwhelmed by the idea, but intrigued. Please, I can't do it without you, Paget begged. All right. Mrs. Brown practically beamed with pleasure. Please, call me Lydia. In class, you'll still have to call me Mrs. Brown, but when in campaigning, you can use my first name. This is going to be so much fun. Paget gave a weak smile and wondered what she had let herself in for. Thank you for listening to Chapter 5 of The Reverse Cinderella. Keep listening for Chapter 6. Please subscribe or like the videos, as it helps with my algorithms. If you'd like to be notified when future videos are coming, press the bell. Chapter 6 The next couple of weeks were hectic. Paget became the center of attention for a number of classes who submitted platform ideas for the campaign, social media ads, and how to polish her image for the public. Paget was glad she had enlisted Mrs. Brown. The woman was a drill sergeant and seemed to know exactly how to proceed. Paget was consulted, but that was about it. She had a photo session with the art class, and the next thing she knew, there were posters all around campus telling people to vote for her. It was crazy. Adam, Sasha, and Mariah set up a booth, taking turns manning it and trying to educate students by handing out flyers. She suspected Adam was responsible for the sudden ads she saw of herself on Facebook. Total strangers were coming up, asking for selfies and wishing her luck against Mayor Johns. Mrs. Brown gave her a spot on air every single day for a half-hour show. Paget couldn't believe her luck. She was going to graduate with an amazing amount of practice. It was during one of the shows that she came up with an idea. I'd like to talk to you today about the homeless issue in our city. We all know Mayor Johns' plan to ship them away to other cities so that they aren't our problem anymore. That would be the easy thing to do. However, I happen to think that sometimes the easy way isn't the right way. Paget swallowed and put down her notes. She was going to say this from the heart. She leaned forward to the microphone. I happen to know a few homeless people. I've shared a sandwich and tea with Ed. Ed is an elderly man who lives in the Elm Park. He doesn't want to live there, but our local shelters only allow a man to stay for one month before they need to move on. Then they can return after another 30 days. The thing is, a lot of our shelters are full, so even if a man like Ed wanted to stay, there isn't always room. Ed didn't choose to become homeless. He had to sell his home, his car, everything he owned. He did it because his wife Colleen had cancer and he needed to pay for her treatments. He took care of her until she passed. They were married for 65 years. Ed is saving up his pension so that he can move away and find cheaper housing. He has no children to take care of him. However, someone from the community has been looking after Ed. Max is homeless too. I don't know his living situation exactly because he hasn't told me. Yet he has a job and he uses some of his earnings to help Ed and many others. He buys breakfast from a local cafe and distributes it to a number of people who live under the bridge near Edgemont. Max is a generous, kind man who takes care of so many others. 
Anyone who knows Max is very lucky. Paget swallowed the lump in her throat. I dated Max for a short time. When I found out he was homeless, I broke up with him. Not exactly because he was homeless. I hope I'm not that much of a snob. I broke up with him because I felt that he had lied to me. He hadn't been open to me about his situation. Being homeless has a stigma attached to it. Max doesn't have a mental illness. He's not an addict. He's just in a situation where he finds himself unable to afford a place to live. How many people have to choose between groceries, rent, or utilities every month? They juggle their finances until finally they can't juggle anymore. Yes, there are people who are in need of services, mental and physical health services, and they are on the streets. There are even some very scary people out there. Yet there is an amazing people like Max as well. Paget sighed. I can understand why he didn't want to tell me. When the common reaction is to just shove these people away, like what Mayor Johns wants to do, or just to ignore them, how could he expect that I would be okay with him living this lifestyle? I propose we try to find funding to help these people in any way possible. No one should have to live on the streets if they don't want to. I know that means we'll have to cut other programs or figure out a way to raise the funds. However, I don't feel it's right or fair to simply send these people away. They have names. They have stories. They are important, too. Paget could see Melanie grab a tissue and wipe her eyes. Paget gave her a watery smile. I know all our budgets are tight. Sometimes I don't know if I'm going to make my rent, too. But I would like for us, the students of this college, to come together and put on a dinner for the homeless people of this city. I'd like us to make and carry warm meals to the hundreds of people who don't always get them. I'd like us to talk to these people and understand that they are nice, they care, and they have hopes, too. I've put together a sign-up sheet and a donation sheet. If you can't give money or food that we can use, then please give your time. And Max, I know you're probably not listening, this being a college station, but I'm sorry, and I'd like a second chance if you'll give me one. Melanie came on the air. We'll be opening the phone lines for calls. If you have a question or would like to volunteer or donate to Paget's Feed and Talk to the Homeless campaign, please call. She put on a commercial and smiled at Paget. That was good. You're natural. Thanks, Paget said wryly. I just hope we don't get into trouble from the dean when he hears about this. Oh, I think Mrs. Brown can handle him, Melanie winked. Paget gave her a confused look. What do you mean? Rumor has it Mrs. Brown was spotted in the dean's office doing some extracurricular activities. I think she's looking to change her last name, Melanie grinned. His comb-over was a little must when she came out. No, Paget breathed. She couldn't believe it. Lydia and the dean? Really? Melanie nodded. Hey, we've got calls. Isn't that normal? Paget asked. Not really, Melanie laughed. Students tend to listen to other more popular mainstream stations. They took the calls and pledges. Patchett was really surprised and happy with the level of enthusiasm and participation that was happening from her simple speech. Then she saw Melanie get excited. The student producer made a motion for Padgett to wrap it up quickly with her current caller. Padgett did and gave Melanie a confused look. We have a caller on line five. Melanie spoke over the airwaves like it was any other caller, but she was practically dancing in her seat. Hello? Padgett asked, hitting the button. This is Uni 5, Paget here. Hello, beautiful, said a familiar sexy voice. There was a hitch in Paget's voice as she replied, Hi, Max. I guess you were listening. I was. It took me ten minutes to get through, so I imagine a lot of people were listening. Sounds like your program is a success. It's been doing pretty good, thank you. Paget fiddled with her pen. Max, I want to say sorry for how I reacted when I found out about... "'About your housing situation. "'It was a bit of a shock, and I was upset. "'I felt like I had been lied to. "'My husband, Gary, he used to lie to me a lot, "'and I didn't want you to be lying to me. "'But you were right. "'You didn't lie. "'You just hadn't told me. "'I'd found out before you were ready to tell me, "'and I should trust that you would have told me "'when you felt ready. "'I'm sorry.' "'I'm sorry,' Max said. "'I should have told you sooner.' I promise I will never intentionally lie to you, Paget. You mean far too much to me. Paget smiled and wiped away a tear. Thank you. 
Does this mean I can walk you home from work again? Max asked, hopefully. Paget gave a small laugh. Please. That's all the time we have for today, Melanie interrupted. Please sign up on our Facebook page. Paget listened as Melanie gave the details, and her on-air light went out. Max, are you still there? I am. He seemed a little amused by the interruption. I missed you. Tell me what time you get off tonight, and you will miss me no more, he promised. Paget felt as nervous as if she was going on a first date again. She checked herself in the lady's mirror five times in the past hour. She was jumpy. She got three customer orders wrong. "'You're off the till,' Dix said grimly. "'I don't know what is wrong with you, but you can go clean for the last half hour shift.' Chastised, Paget grabbed the spray bottle and a cloth. Time was going so slowly." It felt like twenty minutes had passed, and yet when she looked at the clock, only a minute had ticked by. Does that clock need batteries? Dix looked at the clock, then at Paget. She was annoyed. Do you not see the cord? It's plugged in. Sorry, Paget muttered. She scrubbed a table. Butterflies were fluttering through her stomach. Dix gave her a funny look and helped a customer. Once she was finished, she came over to Paget, grabbing the cleaning cloth. You've been cleaning this table for the past five minutes. If you aren't going to be useful, you can go home, or you can tell me what is going on. Paget grinned. Max is coming to walk me home. Dix blinked. You made up with him? About time. Hey, I had valid reasons, Paget protested. Maybe, but it's not like guys like that grow on trees, Dix dimpled. This means maybe you'll be back to normal and not so mopey. Paget grabbed the cloth back. She rolled her eyes. Love you, too. You know you do, Dick said happily. Now, get this stuff done properly so we can get out of here on time, and you can go take your midnight walk with Prince and Popper Charming. Paget smiled back and found a new table to scrub. They rushed through the closing routine and were ready when Max showed up. He had a single red rose for Paget. What, nothing for me? Dix demanded. Max smiled down at Paget, and she shyly took the rose. Sorry, Dix. She sniffed. That's okay. I wouldn't want my boyfriend to get jealous. Max raised an eyebrow. You and Adam have moved to that stage in the relationship? Dix rolled her eyes. Like you don't know, since you and he talk every single day. See you later, kids. Good night, Paget called after her. She took Max's arm, and they walked along in silence, enjoying each other's company. Paget enjoyed the feel of being on his arm again under the street lights. They took a leisurely pace and eventually went through the park to her building. When they got to the entryway, Paget wasn't sure what to say. She fiddled with her keys. Paget, I want to thank you for giving me a second chance, Max said solemnly. If you don't mind, I'd like to tell you why I've chosen to live this way. I like that, Paget gave him a tentative smile. She invited him up to her apartment and they settled on the couch. Max held her hand, tracing her fingers with his free hand. I used to work for a large pharmaceutical company, Max sighed as he began his story. My job was to get drugs approved quickly by the FDA so they could help people. I believed in what we were doing. Then I found out that one of my drugs, one that I helped to get through the FDA tape a little quicker, had some serious side effects. My friend Dylan, his daughter Shannon, was on that drug and things had started to go seriously wrong. I have a bachelor's in science. I went through the clinical trials and found discrepancies. The drug helped to metabolize food so that patients would need less insulin. It also affected kidneys and livers, leaving irreversible damage. I brought the matter to the head of the company, and he ignored it. We weren't in the business of making people better. We were in the business of profiting from their illness. The company had a class lawsuit brought against it by the parents of numerous children that were impacted. Because the company had so many lawyers and money, it crushed the lawsuit. I couldn't bring forward the clinical results because the originals had been changed, and I couldn't prove otherwise. When I had confronted the head of the company, I foolishly left the documents that I had created about the discrepancies of the drug with him, because I trusted that he would do the right thing. I was wrong. After the trial, I talked to the defense team and set up a fund for all these kids to help for medical expenses. 
to help the families endure a problem that we created because all the children who took our drug have either died or are dying. I personally apologized to any family that wanted to meet with me. When the head of the company found out about the fund, he was furious. I had opened the company up to liability. He told me to dissolve the fund, and I refused. We were responsible. It was the least we could do. Max gave a joyless laugh. I was responsible. I had helped fast-track this drug. The owner and I argued, but I wouldn't back down. I was fired from my job, although they termed it better. I believe they said I left over personal reasons or some such thing. I was blacklisted from all other companies of the same distinction in a quiet, unofficial way. I sold everything I had, and I put it in that fund. Every penny that isn't for my basic survival, I give to the fund, and I've done it. All of those children's medical care has been covered except one. Shannon isn't covered because Dylan won't let me, but he understands what I'm trying to do. Now there are only two survivors left, Shannon and a boy named Rubio. Rubio is a fighter, but he's the last stages and it won't be long now. I'm just trying to do the right thing. The hospital bills are huge. I've sold everything I own to put money towards them. I've fundraised. I've begged old friends. I can't justify using money on an apartment to make myself more comfortable when some of the parents couldn't pay the hospital bills or they themselves would have been homeless. I know it's hard to understand, but this is something I just had to do. I feel responsible and I'm doing my best to help them. I work for a demolition company. I'm not in labor so much anymore. When the boss found out I was good for getting permits and organizing things, he made me a manager. He's ready to retire, and I've been working toward taking over the company. It's how I've managed to keep paying the last of the hospital bills for the past five years. Once I settle Rubio's bills, it will be over. Then I can work on starting over financially. I'm sorry I didn't tell you. Oh, Max. Paget didn't know what to say. It put a whole different light on his situation. She felt badly for how she had reacted. Can you forgive me, Paget? There's nothing to forgive. She hugged him tightly. Isn't there something that could be done to make the drug company pay? I know you feel responsible, but you shouldn't have to shoulder this burden alone. They are very powerful. No one wants to go up against that company. Max sighed and savored the feeling of holding on to her. He pressed a kiss into her hair. I'm not shouldering the burden alone. I'm sharing it now, with you. I'm glad that you are, Paget leaned against him. Is there any way I can help? You said you fundraise. I know some people who might be able to contribute to your fund. I think I'm at the point where to fundraise might mean getting too many contributions. Then I wouldn't know what to do with the extra money. Max shrugged. It's just Rubio, and then I'll be done. I think in less than a year I can start putting money towards my future. Basically, you're as broke as I am. Paget drew circles on his shoulder with her finger. Yep, he agreed. Financially, sure. But I think we're rich in a different way. Paget looked up at him. How's that? We have each other. Paget smiled. She was very glad that she had forgiven him. You're sleeping on the couch tonight. Why? Because I'm not going to worry that you're somewhere out there, sleeping on the street, waiting to get murdered by some thug, Paget said seriously. Max laughed. You sound like my brother Noah. Well, maybe Noah has a point, Paget poked him in the chest. If you don't, I'm not going to be able to sleep for worrying about you. Being on the streets isn't great. However, it's not as unsafe as all these crime shows and nightly news make it out to be. Plus, I'm not actually sleeping on the sidewalk right now, Max said. Right now? You mean that you have? Paget questioned with some alarm. Hey, it's okay. I'm either in the company truck or at the men's shelter, depending how crowded it is. He gently pushed a strand of hair behind her ear. Would you like to see the shelter? It's not that bad. Not that bad, Paget murmured. Compared to what? Max smiled. Come and see. You understand that there is no need to worry. Fine. Tomorrow, Paget decided to go and see the place. But tonight, you're staying on the couch so I can sleep in peace. Okay, Max agreed. I can do that. Just for you. Good. 
Paget leaned her head on him again, closing her eyes. That makes me happy. Well, Max's voice rumbled in her ear. Anything to make my girl happy. After Max cooked her breakfast in the morning, they went to see the local men's shelter where he had been staying. It was run by a group of volunteers with some funding from the city and a few church groups. Paget was pleasantly surprised to find it clean, despite the run-down old building that it was housed in. Cots lined different rooms for people to sleep in. There were eighty beds, which the staff confided weren't really enough for this part of town. There was a cafeteria where three meals were served each day. There were washrooms and showers. It was painted a depressing hospital green. Everything was old. The cots, the tables, the chairs. But it was clean, and while some of the inhabitants looked a little shady, they all seemed to brighten up when they saw Max. He knew so many of them by name. He knew their stories. Max introduced her, and they spent the better part of an hour greeting people and asking how they were. It made Paget both proud of Max and sad that these people had fallen on such hard times. She found out that the shelter was always in need of donations, and decided that while Max might not have need of her fundraising skills, these people certainly did. She would make a few inquiries today from her old acquaintances to see if she could help some of the shelters around the city. It would be her surprise gift to Max. Finally, Max needed to get to work, and she had classes so he left her at the bus stop to catch the bus to campus. As she rode the bus, Paget realized that she had a voicemail from her mother. She wondered what her mother could possibly want, and listened as Judith Forrester announced that she was going to drop in on Paget later that afternoon. She was going to inspect Paget's apartment, and then perhaps they could catch dinner. She announced a time, and then hung up. Paget stared at her phone. In the entire year that she had been living in the Elm Street apartments, her mother had never once indicated any interest in seeing where she lived. There was probably some material motive involved, but Paget couldn't think of what it might be. Well, she wouldn't have to wait very long, she reflected. It was a good thing that she wasn't scheduled to work at the cafe later today. If she had been, she would have had to reschedule with her mother, and Paget knew the hard way that Judith liked things on her timetable. In class... Paget found herself doodling Max's name again. She really had to find out his last name. Sighing, she pulled herself out of her schoolgirl crush and concentrated. Adam found her in the hall and grinned happily. I heard from a little birdie last night that the two of you patched things up. He practically jiggled for joy. Paget shook her head, but she smiled. What can I say? I'm a sucker for him. I still want an invite to the wedding. Adam called as he headed down the hall to get to class. We're not that far yet, Paget yelled happily back. Paget made sure to catch the early bus back after classes. She frantically cleaned the apartment until everything was hidden and what was visible was shining. Her mother wouldn't look in the oven anyways, so that was where most of the mess went. And since Paget rarely cooked using the oven, she felt pretty safe about using it as a storage compartment in emergencies such as this. She knew her mother would look down her nose at the place. While it was run down and tired, it didn't mean that it couldn't be clean. Paget wondered if she should have called her mother to ask why the visit. She might have saved herself and her mother the aggravation of the inspection and disdain. Judith Forrester did not frequent this neighborhood, nor would she normally deign to do so. It simply wasn't in a neighborhood that was acceptable to a person of her social standing. So it was with some surprise and suspicion that Paget went to meet her at the entrance of the park. She came out of a couple of minutes early to make sure that she was there when the car arrived. It didn't do to be late when it came to her mother. The black town car was there, perfectly on time. The driver opened the back door and helped Judith out. She looked around with disdain, and Paget took a bracing breath before doing the customary greetings and air-kissing of both cheeks. I don't know how you can live here, her mother said, looking around as they walked through the park. It's filthy and it's not safe. It was true that there was a little bit of garbage on the ground. Things were tired and worn looking. There was a piece of cardboard in a broken window that hadn't been fixed the entire time Paget had been there. The lighting was spotty at best at night. The park itself was a little overgrown and not well maintained. Yet in the months that Paget had lived here, it had become home. 
Besides, it was all she could afford, which really meant that she couldn't afford it at all. But it was better than the slums. Paget was just about to protest her mother's opinion when suddenly her mother gasped and pointed into the park. Is that a homeless man? Her voice dripped with disdain. Paget didn't know what came over her. She just couldn't help herself. Paget followed her mother's pointing finger to see that she was pointing at Max. That's when Paget got really angry and she didn't know why. Her mother was right. He was homeless. That was an indisputable fact. He was there, ripped jeans, a couple of holes in his black tee, hair a little long, talking to old head who sat on the bench. Paget just didn't like the way her mother had said it, so judging, about such a nice, smart, charming man. A man who bothered to talk to old Ed when so few did. A man who made sure that other people were taken care of. A man who walked Paget home on dark nights through the half-lit park. Her mother didn't know him. How dare she look down on him? Biting her bottom lip, Paget marched across the brown sparse grass, hooked her arm through his, and walked a startled Max straight back to her ever-immaculate mother, who stared in a horrified fascination that Paget would bring this specimen of human failure to her. "'Max, this is my mother, Judith Forrester. Mom, this is Max,' Paget smiled brilliantly. "'He's coming with me to Trisha's wedding.' Her mother simply looked at Paget non-pulsed. Max held out a hand. How do you do? Quite well, I'm sure. She looked down at the dirty calloused hand proffered to her and simply chose to ignore it. Darling, could I speak with you a moment? Paget continued, smiling determinedly. Max and I met in a college bar on 5th. He's been simply wonderful. I've never had to worry about my security at night because Max has been so kind as to walk me home. Isn't it fortunate that he lives so close to my building? It's true. I take Paget's safety very seriously. Max gave her a slightly odd look, but decided to play along, smiling for her mother's benefit. How nice. Paget's mother smiled tightly. What do you do, Max? Right now I'm working with the demolition cleanup crew. There's an old building near the docks that has been torn down, and we're just clearing away the debris before they start construction on the site. If you know anyone who could use the work, it's cash daily and will be steady for the next couple of weeks. I'll be sure to pass that along. She sniffed. Her tone said otherwise. Her look told Paget that he was beneath her. Paget, you can stop this joke now. The smile faded from Paget's face. What joke? This farce. This rebellion of yours. Your father and I have been giving it some thought. We've decided to invest in a condominium which is why I wanted to talk to you today. You could be our first tenant, just until you get your feet again. Her mother adjusted her purse strap. Mrs. Milton says Earl's lost a little bit on that new Cato diet fad. I'm sure if you fix yourself up a bit, you could convince him to take a second look at you. Earl Milton. Paget couldn't believe her. Why, yes, she smiled happily. Betty says he's finally ready to settle down. If anything, it would be Paget doing the settling. Her teeth ground together, and her chest got a little tight. Max cleared his throat and wrapped an arm around Paget's waist. I'm terribly sorry, Mrs. Forrester, but Paget isn't available for Earl. Pardon me? She arched an eyebrow. Isn't that right, honey? Max kissed Paget on the forehead and grinned down at her. In for a petty, in for a pound, Paget thought and smiled back, wrapping her arms around her. I was thinking I could take Max over for Sunday dinner, if that works for you. To meet Dad. Paget Emily, her mother huffed. Stop this nonsense. Sunday doesn't work, Paget innocently said. That's too bad. I guess we'll just see you at the wedding. We're meeting with the realtor on Tuesday. I'll send the car for you. Her mother began picking her way back to the gate of the park, where the town car driver patiently waited for her. I like her. She doesn't like me, but I like her, Max looked down at Paget. She groaned. I am so sorry, Max. I don't know why I did that. I should be used to the fact that she's not going to accept my life, and goading her doesn't help. Hey, I haven't been to a wedding for a while. It'll be nice, Max touched a finger to Paget's forehead. I can see where you get that little furrow from when you aren't happy. Your mom has that, too. Paget swatted away his finger. You don't have to go. I was just... Honestly, I don't know what I was doing. 
Who's Earl Milton? Max cocked an eyebrow. Should I be jealous? A snort erupted from Paget before she could stop it. Anyone actually jealous of Earl? She doubted it. She tried to explain. He's a nice guy. He is... He's just... Just what? He's nice. He's like a family pet. A little overweight, a little overeager. Once in a while you throw him a bone. He's nice to have around, but mostly he's just ignored. Paget shrugged. He's nice. And I feel bad about how I just described him, but it's true. Your mom seems to think he's a good catch, Max pointed out. My mother is blinded by a person's social status and balance sheet. Paget rolled her eyes. Plus, she's friends with Earl's mother. So, are you going to go out with this Earl guy? He asked a little too casually. No. Why are you asking this? Paget was surprised he kept pursuing this. You can't be jealous of him. No, I'm not jealous of a guy I've never met. Max shrugged a shoulder. Maybe for the first time in a while, I was just thinking that it might be nice to be solvent. To be able to introduce myself to your parents and not see your mom wince. To keep you exclusively to myself. Max, Paget tried to say it gently. My mother is a snob. She always will be. It doesn't matter. I know I'm not much of a catch, but I'm working on it. I'm employed. I'm working on bettering my situation. I'm not a creep or crazy. The back of Max's hand pressed tightly against Paget's cheek. It's not easy dating in my situation. I haven't actually asked anyone out in a long time, but I think you're pretty amazing. I think you're pretty amazing too, Paget said. She wondered what he meant exactly about exclusivity. She liked that idea. And I understand that things are hard financially. They're hard for me as well. What would you say if in a year or two I did ask you to marry me? Max wondered. He watched her intently. What would you say to your parents? Suddenly it was hard for Paget to breathe. He really was serious here. Paget didn't know what to say. He was homeless, said her mother's voice in her head, and Paget wondered, was she as much of a snob as her mother? No one knows what's going to happen in a year or two. He closed his eyes and leaned his forehead against hers. I was thinking, he said softly, maybe in a year or two I might have my life back together. I might be able to help you with the bills so you're not always so worried. I would be able to cheer for you when you graduated, with honors, because I know you're smart. I might wake up next to you each morning, which would make my day. It's too soon, Paget blurted out, a little panicked. She didn't know what she was thinking, if she even was thinking. Part of her was afraid of making a mistake again, getting involved with a man who might hurt her like her husband Gary had. Part of her wanted very much to find out what being with Max would be like, Waking up next to him every day? The thought was both thrilling and scary. I can wait, Max said, stroking her hair. I'm very patient. We can take all the time you want to get to know each other. I just want to put it on the table that I'm looking at a future with both of us in it. It's not that. It's... Paget scrambled to say something, anything that might not hurt his feelings, but give her time to examine her own. I have only been a widow for a year. Of course. Max took both of her hands in his. I entirely respect that. You must have loved him very much, and I... Paget snorted. She couldn't help it. She briefly closed her eyes, embarrassed. I'm not sure that I did. Well, I did at some point, but not at the end. Gary and I... It was complicated. The thing is, I don't trust my judgment with men. Then we'll take it slow. Snail pace slow, and you'll find that you can place your trust with me. Max lifted her hands and placed a kiss on each of them. We have all the time in the world. I know I'm ahead of you thinking all this. Patchett's hands reached up to cradle his face. She didn't want to disappoint him, but she needed to be truthful, too. You are ahead of me, Max. I'm not sure what the future holds. I do know that I have a few hours free tonight, and I do okay at making spaghetti if you'd like to come to dinner. Max smiled. I'd like that. Good. I'm sorry I dragged you into all this. I put you on the spot, and that wasn't fair. She was just... She was looking down her nose at everything. The neighborhood, where I work, 
what I'm trying to achieve, and then she looked at you and Ed. She just made some remarks, and I couldn't let it go. Max raised an eyebrow and said dryly, So you held me up under her nose like a muddy frog? No, Paget looped her arm through his and steered him toward the street. She needed groceries if she was going to make dinner tonight, and he didn't seem to mind her dragging him along. Okay, maybe just a little like holding up a frog? She was really making me so mad. I don't know why I still want her approval. I'm an adult. I should be fine with what I want. All kids want their parents to accept them in their choices, Max said quietly. Sometimes we have to accept that's not going to happen. I shouldn't have done it, Badgett apologized. I'm sorry. Where are we going? Max asked. I need a few things for the spaghetti. I like to add to the sauce so it tastes better. There's a market right around the corner, Paget explained. It was her go-to place for groceries since it was so close and she was always walking. Nothing sucked more than having bag break or carrying something heavy over a long distance. I have to ask, do you actually want me to be your plus one for the wedding, or was it just to goad your mom and you'd rather I didn't? Paget was a little surprised by his insecurity. Usually he was Mr. Confident. I want you to be there. She realized that she did want him to be there. It felt right to bring him to meet her family. Her mother wouldn't like it. But it was past time Paget stopped seeking her for approval. Good. Max dropped a kiss on the top of her head. Besides, you need someone to buffer you from this Earl guy. Paget laughed. When you meet him, you'll understand he's absolutely no threat. As they entered the little corner store, a woman stopped them and asked for a selfie with Paget. Max was amused. Does this happen often? Are you suddenly famous and didn't tell me? Paget sighed. It's this campaign for the mayoral race. Adam came up with this brilliant idea of anyone who supports me to take a selfie with me and post it to their social media accounts to tell their friends. I'm getting stopped all the time now. That's a good thing, right? Max helped her to get his jar of spaghetti sauce off the top shelf. It means a lot of people are supporting you. True. However, I was almost late for class the other day. Paget grabbed some noodles. She wasn't sure just how many she had at home. Then there's all the paperwork and trying to memorize things for the debates. It's like I've added another class to my schedule, which is already full. Max turned her to face him and put his hands on her shoulders. Hey. If you don't want to do this, you don't have to. I'm worried that I'm not going to be a good mayor, Paget said softly. I don't know half of what a mayor does. If I actually win, will I be so busy that I have to give up college? You're not going to give up on your dream, Paget. I won't let you, Max hugged her. Why are you doing this if it's not what you want? I don't want him to win. He's despicable. He doesn't care about the people in this city. He wants to ship off the homeless and make them someone else's problem rather than helping them. She leaned into Max, enjoying his comforting presence. He couldn't even pronounce my name right. Max chuckled. That is definitely a crime. I know. Paget sighed. I don't want him to win, and I'm the only one who has stepped up so far to stop him. When does the application process close? Next week? First debate is this week, Paget groaned. I'm not ready. I don't like talking in front of people. Max chuckled. You talk every day to people on the radio. That's different. I can't actually see them, she complained. I'm going to freeze up there. I just know it. Maybe you could get a bunch of students at the college to set up a mock debate for you to practice with, Max suggested, so that you feel more comfortable with the real thing. Paget looked up to him. Do you think the college would let me? I think... What did you call your teacher? Lydia? At Paget's nod, Max continued. I think you are her favorite student, and she will definitely help you out with a mock debate. That's a really good idea, Paget molded over. If Mrs. Brown was willing, then it would help her to have the practice. Now, let's get whatever else you need for the spaghetti. Then we'll go back to your apartment and make up all sorts of cue cards for you to study from so that you feel better about these debates. Really? Paget asked, thankful that Max would do this for her. He smiled at her. What are study buddies for? Thank you for listening. If you enjoyed this chapter, please look for the next chapter of The Reverse Cinderella, book two of the Ramsey Brothers series. 
Also, please share this video for others to find it. This is free for you and would really help me grow my audience with the algorithms. Thank you. Chapter 7 Bright lights glared down at her. There must be a hundred people or so in the audience. Paget nervously fiddled with her jacket. She had bought a second-hand suit set at the thrift store and paired it with a nice blouse. She looked professional, except the butterflies were starting up a storm in her stomach. She pressed a hand to her abdomen and watched from behind the curtain as people found their seats. Tonight's debate was her first, and she tried to review all the facts that she had learned over the past week, but they were gone. It didn't matter how many people were reported as homeless in the city, or how much the city budget was and where it was spent. There was nothing in her brain but fear. The butterflies picked up momentum. She was worried that they might fly away with her. She idly wondered if she should have smeared Vaseline on her teeth like a professional dancer did, so that she would be sure to smile for the whole debate. Did politicians do that? Smile through everything? The moderator stepped up to the stage, announcing the candidates, the rules of the debate, and generally welcoming the audience. Paget could feel the fear ratchet up a notch. Mayor Johns came to stand beside her and gave a jolly laugh. I love a good debate. Paget murmured something. She did not like a good debate. Not when a hundred people were watching her and judging her. She barely glanced over at Tom Bailey. A city councillor and late entry into the mayoral campaign joined them. They were announced to the stage. Paget stepped forward into the light and was blinded for a moment. Her feet skidded to a stop. She couldn't see. Mayor Johns bumped her from behind and she stumbled forward awkwardly. Flushing red, she forgot to shake hands with her two opponents and rushed to her podium. Tom Bailey came over to her and shook her hand anyways. He gave her a smile. First debate, Mrs. Williams? Paget nodded, mortified. I had a smear of butterscotch pudding on my forehead for my first debate, thanks to my son. Everyone called me a lot of poop names in the paper and online. However, it was memorable, and I won a seat as counselor. He put a comforting hand on her shoulder. Take a deep breath. You'll do fine. Paget smiled up at him in relief. Thank you. Bailey went to his podium, and John smiled evilly at her, happy that she was already messed up and the debate hadn't even begun. The moderator asked them to introduce themselves. Mayor Johns was a husband, father, and grandfather of eight. He had been mayor of the city for two consecutive terms and was looking for a third. He had a proven track record and hoped the good citizens would remember his dedication to them. Mayor Johns told his background with a jolly laugh that he was so well known for. He also enjoyed playing Santa Claus for the little ones each Christmas at City Hall. He sounded like a wonderful man. Too bad he wasn't, Paget reflected. Councillor Tom Bailey was a husband, father of two, and an experienced council member. He talked about how he enjoyed being a protective member of the city council and wanted to make a difference in the community. He had chosen to run against Mayor Johns because he felt that some of the mayor's policies would not be beneficial to the citizens of the city. He believed that the city had a bright future and wanted to be part of ushering it in. He supported numerous charities. When it was her turn, Paget smiled and began tentatively. My name is Paget Williams. I'm a student at the local college studying my passion, which is journalism and broadcasting. I have no children, but there is an amazing man in my life named Max. Max has been my inspiration for doing this. He has helped so many in our community out of his own goodwill, and I hope to help the citizens by his example. I don't have the experience that my fellow candidates do. I'm a bit of a klutz, as you've already noticed. Yet I do want to help our city and all the citizens in it, not just those that are deemed worthy by Mayor Johns. Thank you. The moderator thanked them all, and they began to discuss their platforms. After that, it was time for the questions. There were some questions from the audience, so Paget had no time to prepare for them. She felt underqualified and ignorant. Her nerves were stretching thin. She knew Max, Adam, and Dix, and a few others were in the audience, and she wanted to do well. As people began lining up to the microphone to ask their questions, Paget was surprised to see people she knew. Her friends, students from her classes, students had been helping with her campaign, some customers from the diner, 
They were all hogging the two microphones so that no one else could get a question in. She was overwhelmed as they asked questions. Some gave Bailey intelligent questions. Many gave Mayor Johns a difficult and angry questions about his stance on the homeless in the city. The rest gave her easy questions, questions that she knew from the practice debate that Mrs. Brown had allowed her to hold to help polish her skills. Paget couldn't believe how many people were rallying around her, making her first debate a wonderful experience. Suddenly, she was just talking to people she knew, telling them answers that came from her heart. The butterflies went away, and she felt that she was really shining. Then it was all over. The candidates shook hands, Mayor Johns angry but determinedly jolly, Tom Bailey a gentleman as ever. Paget just relieved that she hadn't entirely embarrassed herself or the college. Some of them greeted people, and it wasn't long before Paget was surrounded by her friends and well-wishers. "'I vote we go to Barney's to celebrate,' Adam said excitedly. "'You did an amazing job, Paget.' Paget grinned. "'I had a lot of help. Thank you.' Dick shrugged. "'It was fun to stick it to Mayor Johns. I should help organize protests.' "'This was your idea?' Paget couldn't believe so many people had come out to help her and make her first debate a memorable event. "'I had some help in the execution,' Dix allowed. "'She wanted to just egg him. "'Well, we convinced her this way would be better.' Adam grinned as Dix elbowed him. Hey, no one has cash to bail you out of jail. That's right, Max agreed as he threaded his fingers through Paget's to hold her hand. We're all broke. So to Barney's, where there is cheap beer and cheap nachos? Paget asked. The group agreed and split a cab, since it was a special occasion. Once at the bar, they managed to snag a table at the back. Max went for the usual run of orders. Paget took off the suit jacket and popped off her shoes happily. "'Have you returned the application for mayor yet?' Dix asked. She knew that Paget had been holding off on it, delaying. "'I thought I'd procrastinate until the last possible minute,' Paget sighed. "'At first, during tonight's debate, I thought it would be a good thing if I dropped out. Mr. Bailey seems like a really good candidate, and I'd want to split the vote making Mayor Johns get elected again. Plus, when I stumbled, I just thought I couldn't do it. I couldn't go through any more debates.' Then everyone came through for me and asked those questions, the really easy ones for me that I'd had practice with. It shows how many people are supporting me and want me to do this. I can't let them down, Paget fiddled with a coaster. I'll finish the application and get it in before the deadline. I can't believe so many people believe in me. Why wouldn't we believe in you? Adam asked, puzzled. I suppose I've had so many years where people didn't believe in me that I'm surprised that people do now, Paget shrugged. Dix grabbed her hand and gave it a squeeze. Well, we believe in you, and we want you to go for it. You're amazing, Paget, and we're happy that you're our friend. Totally, Adam agreed after Dix elbowed him. Max came with their orders, and the group happily chatted about how much they had managed to irritate the current mayor. The next evening, Paget looked at the pile of papers she was surrounded by. There was the application that she was nearly finished that had to be done tonight. There were questions for the next debate that she was supposed to prepare to answer. This is crazy. I'll never learn it all. When I go on stage, it all flies out of my head anyways. You don't need to. You only need to know the basics of everything and the direction you want to go in on the issues. Focus on the positive directions to get people to follow you. Max took another slice of pizza, his eyes not straying from the game. Focus on ten things to learn about. Be an expert on four of those things for your campaign. How do I get to be an expert on homelessness and what the city does to help people living out on the streets? Paget asked. She felt entirely overwhelmed. Max thought for a moment. You could live outside for a while, use the amenities and experience it for yourself. Or I could utilize the expert that I have already sitting beside me. She smiled prettily at Max, hoping he'd take the hint. "'What do you mean?' Max asked, his attention fully hers now. "'You know I'll help you out.' "'Really?' "'Of course. I wouldn't offer if I didn't mean it.' "'What do you say to be my running mate?' Paget asked. Max laughed. "'There's no vice-mayoral position. It's not how it works.' "'There are counselor positions,' she countered. "'You could run for one.' The application process doesn't close until midnight. You could still do it. 
and I could really use your help. It would be so nice to have someone else at City Hall who knows the issues and is a friendly face. Max slung an arm around Patrick's shoulders and gave her a gentle squeeze, leaning his head against hers. That's a cool thought, but didn't you say that you had to fill in out all sorts of forms online, including an address, which I don't have? Oh, Paget felt defeated. Here was an opportunity for him, one she was certain he would be great at, and he was disqualified just because he didn't have an address. Then, as usual, her mouth spoke before her brain could think. Move in. What? Their eyes met, and for a moment they were both speechless from her blurted-out words. Move in, she repeated softly. I need a roommate, and you need an address. Then you could run for counselor. For a moment he looked a little disappointed before turning his attention back to the game. What? I think you'd be great on city council. You know the issues. You've talked me through so much of it already. You volunteered to summarize all of this for me. You're smart. You care. You're charming. I... I think you could do it. You think I could? He asked, a little bit hurt. I know you could, Paget replied. She did believe that he could. Max was amazing. He already knew more about this sort of thing than she did, and she was the run running for the position. That's the only reason you want me to move in? He asked quietly. Paget wondered how she was supposed to answer the question like that, especially when her brain hadn't been functioning when her mouth offered. I suppose... I mean, it would help you out, and you wouldn't be on the streets any more. Plus, I like you as a person, and I trust you in my home. And it would be a really good chance for you to turn your life around. Is there something wrong with my life? He questioned. No, Paget protested. I didn't say that. I just mean that having an address could open up a lot of opportunities for you. You said it yourself. If you don't have an address, you can't apply for this or other programs and stuff. Am I just a project of yours? Get a homeless guy off the street? His voice had a bit of an edge to it. Definitely not, Paget said defensively. I wouldn't offer just anyone access to my home. I believe in you, and this would solve the address problem. You think I couldn't get an address of my own? Max pulled his arm back, and suddenly she felt bereft, like she had lost something and was on the precipice of losing even more. What? When did I say that? Paget asked in confusion. She couldn't believe he was getting mad about this. It was just common sense. It wasn't like anyone could just put no address on a resume or other important documents. I could do it, you know. Get a higher paying job and join the rat race again. Be the man. I've done it before. Max stood up. I used to own a home, have an exorbitant income, have a fast car and a fast life. I wasn't born homeless. No one said you were. Paget stood as well, muddled about how things had suddenly turned around. Max, why are you mad? I'm not mad, Max practically shouted, backing away from her. Then why are you yelling? She shouted back, following him, but she knocked into the coffee table, jostling the papers and what was left of the pizza box onto the floor. In a last ditch effort, Paget tried to avoid stepping on the pizza, but slipped on the papers. Her arms windmilled as her foot flew forward, and gravity pulled her backward. With an oomph, she landed on the couch. There was a moment of silence. Max's shaking shoulders gave him away. Don't you dare! Paget pointed a finger at him accusingly before he burst into laughter. You should have seen yourself. He could barely get the words out as he held onto his side and wiped his eyes with his other hand. With a sigh, he looked down at her as Paget stared crossly up at him. He held out a hand, and grudgingly, Paget let him pull her to her feet. He then coaxed her into a hug. "'Why are we yelling?' Paget asked. At the same time Paget spoke, so did Max, saying, "'This is why I love you.' Paget froze. "'Say what?' Max's heartbeat was steady in her ear. Slowly she pulled back to look up at him. Her mouth went to speak, but Max firmly put a finger against her lips, which was probably a good thing, because her brain was not functioning after such a loaded statement. "'Before you ruin it,' Max said softly. Paget's eyes narrowed. Before she ruined it? What sort of thing was that to say? She opened her mouth, but this time Max replaced her finger with his lips, and Paget forgot all about what she was going to say. It had been a while since she'd been kissed like this, with desire, and Gary was no comparison. This was a toe-curling, belly-clenching, lightning-filled set of kisses. Have mercy. 
Max slowly lifted his head with a self-satisfied smile. Paget tried to find her dignity back and untangle herself from him. He was far too sure of himself. Paget opened her mouth to say so, but once again a finger found its way to guard her mouth. I'll see you tomorrow. Move the finger or I bite it. Paget waited for him to comply. Tomorrow? Trisha's wedding? Max lifted an eyebrow, and it was obvious that he thought he was such a good kisser that he'd erased the event from her mind. Ego. Paget closed her eyes. That. She was dreading returning, poor and pitied by family, former friends, and country club associates. Everyone would be sugary sweet while gossiping the moment her back was turned. Paget also had that dress in her closet, which was the worst idea that she had in a long time. But what could she do? It was name-brand or not bother going. The event itself was going to cost her well over a hundred grand, and one did not show up at a niece's wedding wearing Salvation Army, even if it was what she needed to wear the rest of the year, maybe even for her life. Bad enough she was renting jewelry. Hey, if you don't want me to go, Max trailed off uncertainly, probably thinking Paget was regretting inviting him. Homeless guy, Paget thought. What was she doing bringing a homeless guy? What was he going to wear? Could her credit card stretch that far? Don't you dare bail on me, Paget pointed a finger at him, much like her mother did at her father when she wasn't getting what she wanted. I need moral support. Then you've got it in spades. Max's smile was back, full force. Pick you up at four? Three. You need to be here at three. The family dinner is at five, followed by torture with cocktails at eight for friends, she said. Paget grabbed his sleeve, suddenly conscious that she was likely going to have to rent a suit for him. They would need time to do that. Maybe two would be better. Max kissed her on the forehead. Three will be fine. It's going to be great. You'll see. Glad well, somebody has confidence, Paget muttered as he left the apartment. She ignored the mess in the living room area and walked to her bedroom. Laid across the bed was the not at most expensive dress she had ever worn. Paget had sold all her other clothes at a consignment shop to get the deposit for this apartment. And food. And bus fare. Plus whatever other essentials she could get, including a computer and printer for school. She wished she had held back one or three dresses, but then she hadn't thought of Trisha's impending nuptials. She had been more worried about being homeless at the time. Now Paget had this dress, plus two more in the closet picked out just for this weekend. None of them were up to the standards her former life expected, but they were all that she could afford. Truth was, she couldn't afford it at all. Nor the jewelry, nor the shoes, or the trip to the hairdresser on tomorrow's agenda. But what was the girl to do? With a sigh, Paget popped down onto the bed beside the dress. For sure she was having a Cinderella moment, only it was a lot more expensive since she had no fairy godmother. Not only that, but how was she going to change her handsome, homeless frog into an acceptable prince for the posh and snotty society they would be encountering on the weekend? Maybe she should call it a reverse Cinderella moment. He loves me. The thought pushed unbidden into her head. He couldn't. They barely even knew each other. He couldn't, could he? He said he loves me. Maybe it was just a slip of the tongue. Just something he felt comfortable saying. There were all sorts of levels of love. Maybe what he really meant was that he liked her, loved her in a friendly, you're cute sort of way, warm and fuzzy, but not love you forever sort of way. Like she liked him, sort of. Why was she disappointed with that idea? Why was she lying to herself? She knew that she liked him a great deal. Maybe was edging closer to the word love every day. He couldn't really love her, could he? It had to be somewhat romantic, she reasoned since he had a habit of kissing her and calling her his girl. Boy, what a kiss. Even now her belly clenched just remembering it. He would be so much better in bed than Gary. You don't know that. It's just a kiss, Paget berated herself and got up. She had an application for the post of mayor to finish before midnight. Thank you for listening. If you enjoyed this chapter, please look for the next chapter of The Reverse Cinderella. Also, please subscribe to the channel to enjoy other audiobooks, helpful videos, and insights into writing. This is free for you and would really help me grow my audience with the algorithms. Thank you.
Chapter 8 Paget checked her watch another time. She was being stood up. Or maybe he'd been pit by the proverbial bus. He'd better be in critical, having a broken leg or something. It was nearly four in the afternoon. There was no way they were going to have time to get him a suit now. They might not even be able to make it in time for dinner. Fashionably late was one thing. Late late was another with Paget's mother. She had known this was a bad idea. Love her? Ha! He couldn't even be on time. Finally, Paget grabbed her suitcase and locked the apartment door behind her. Lugging it down the stairs, she managed to bruise the back of her legs with the silly thing. It felt like she had packed bricks instead of a few necessities. That's one thing she missed about having a man or money in life. Before now, Paget had always had someone else to handle the bills, the arrangements, the suitcases. It was a lot easier. A businessman was getting out of a cab and asking it to stay. She made a bee line for it. Perhaps she could bribe the cabbie to leave the guy behind and take her fare instead. With what money, her brain asked. Okay, so she would have him call another cab on his radio thingy. It would be the quickest she could get one. Hey, taxi! Paget skidded to a halt, and once again the rolling suitcase banged into the back of her legs, causing her to stumble. With a grin, the guy she had mistaken for a businessman gently grabbed her elbows to help keep her upright. Paget simply couldn't believe it. Shiny black loafers, dress pants, belt, tucked in iron dress shirt, tie, shaved, hair freshly cut, showered, and what was that? Cologne? It had to have some sort of pheromones in it. It smelled that deliciously male on him. Her lips parted in a breathless word. Max? So I clean up okay, all right? There was definitely some satisfaction in that non-question. Sorry I'm a little late. We got caught in traffic. A water main broke on Wellington. You look gorgeous. Something new with the hair? Highlights. Her voice came out breathy. A fortune in dye and styling. Who was this guy in front of her, and how did he afford this? Unless Paget was mistaken, he was wearing Brooks Brothers. Gary was enough of a suit snob that she was sure it was Brooks Brothers. While it wouldn't be the most expensive at the wedding, it certainly wouldn't be the least expensive. His suit had to cost more than her three dresses put together. Your curls are gone. Will you miss them? He gave a roguish grin. With the shave, you don't look like you. Paget's voice was coming out in confused chatter. It did that sometimes when her brain had yet to catch up and absorb what was happening. Like her tongue needed to fill the space where her brain should operate. You're handsome. I mean, you always were, but now it's just not you. Max grinned and put Paget's suitcase into the trunk of the taxi. I promise you I'm still me. So, do you think I'll pass muster for the wedding? I have a suit jacket. Oh, you'll definitely do, said Paget. Suddenly, she felt a little shy. Here was comfortable, flirty Max, changed into this confident, soft male who could walk off the cover of GQ without a backward glance. Paget had one of those, and her husband had been stupidly in love with one of those before, and look where it had ended. She wasn't sure what to do about this new side of Max that she was seeing. He looked amazing. He opened the door and gestured for her to enter the taxi. Paget shook herself mentally out of her drooling and quickly got into the cab with nerves like she was going on her first date, which she certainly wasn't, she reminded herself sternly. Max got in and took her hand in his. It was both comforting and uncomfortable at the same time. Here he was, the same sounding happy man that she knew, but yet a stranger with a whole new identity. Tell me about your family. What should I know before we get there? Paget let him know about her mother, the control freak who loved everything perfect in her society life. She talked about her laid-back, often confused father who was an upstanding member of the country club board and somehow a partner in the law firm. Tiffany, her perfect older sister, who had married Charles, a lawyer from Dad's firm, and had three perfect children, the last of which, Tricia, was getting married to her fiancé Jordan, son and heir of one of the older fortunes in the world. Money meets money in class. As she chattered on, Paget felt herself relax. He was such a good listener, and asked all the right questions. For a moment she found comfortable Max back. Somewhere in warning him that Aunt Lucille was a drunk with an eye for good-looking guys, Paget realized they were going the wrong way. 
Did you give him the right address? I hope you didn't mind, but I thought you might want to arrive in a bit more style than a cab. I have a friend who owes me a favor, and he has a sports car, so I asked if we could borrow it. Really? Friends with sports cars now. She wondered who this new Max was. Max smiled. It's just up here. Selection is limited, but you can choose whatever make and model he has. The taxi pulled up to a stunning house with a large garage attached. A man stepped lightly down some stone steps to meet them. He was handsome and dark blonde, golf and country way, except for the glasses he wore. Paget wondered if he preferred them or if he wasn't a candidate for laser eye surgery. Max helped Paget out of the car, the cabbie taking out their bags. Hey, Dill. Thanks for helping us out like this. Max had the country club man shook hands. This is Paget. The lovely Paget. Good to meet you. Dylan firmly shook Paget's hand with a broad smile. Shannon's out right now, but uh, maybe when you return the car you can see her again. That'd be great, Max replied. Paget recalled what Max had confided in her about Shannon being ill from that drug and the fun that he was using to help other children with the same issue. So, here are the cars. Take your pick. Dylan clicked a remote in his hand and the garage doors opened to reveal a collection of twelve vehicles. All were glossy and in perfect condition. Some were classics, while a few were brand new toys. Paget, She looked at Max. You want me to choose? It's your party, Dylan grinned. Hey, Max, you did keep up your license, right? I promise you, I remember how to drive. Max shook his head. I do have a company truck now, you know. I have insurance. All is good. Dylan explained the inside joke. I run an insurance firm. Max snorted. Your daddy owns the insurance firm. Dylan immediately held up a hand, and Paget could see this was an old, running, friendly argument between the two men. Daddy may have owned it, but I manage it. Believe me, if I didn't do it well, he'd fire me right away. How is the old man, anyway? Max asked. Eh, still king of his piece of the world, and showing no signs of slowing down. I'll tell him you said hi. Dylan got a little more serious as he watched Max pay for the cab. The offer still stands if you get tired of the job you're working at. Thanks, Dylan, but no thanks. I'm good where I am right now. Max flashed a smile, but it was a little tight. Paget wondered if she should offer to pay for the cab, but she didn't want a chance insulting Max in front of his friend. Uh, how about the blue one? Paget asked at random, trying to cover up the tension between the two men. Nothing gets men on the same page like discussing cars. The Ferrari F60 America. Dylan had a slight wince. Max rolled his eyes. You haven't driven it yet, have you? Well, no, it's, it's fine. It's in good hands. If you don't want us to take it out, we can choose another. Look, Paget anxiously watched the cab leave. We're happy to take whatever car you are willing to give us. I just need to get there. Nope, a deal is a deal. Dylan went to a small box on the wall, full of keys, and tossed a set to Max. Have fun, but no dents. Thanks, Dad, Max teased. Within moments, they had the suitcases in the Ferrari and said their thanks to Dylan before zipping along the highway. Paget waited a bit before asking, So how do you know Dylan? Old friends. His brother and I went to college together. Dylan had a habit of trailing us around. Plus, he's amazing at scuba diving. We used to go see shipwrecks in the Caribbean together. Paget didn't see how Dylan could be anything but Ivy League. His very nature said that he would be comfortable in the world which she had grown up in. This meant that Max would have to have come from a very prestigious background. The Max she knew had been more of a blue-collar Max. This Max, the Max of Brooks Brothers suits, driving a Ferrari, looking all male and GQ. She could see him going to an Ivy school. It was hard to reconcile the two different sides of Max, and now Paget wondered what she really knew about him. Barely on time, they arrived at Tiffany's sprawling house. For the weekend, she'd hired a valet service and had the help going in full force. Someone was there to take the bags, and Tiffany met them in the foyer, effusing good cheer as she hugged Paget. Paget, don't you look lovely? I'd let you go freshen up, but dinner's about to be served, and you know how Mother gets. A couple of minutes in the bathroom, and I'll be good, Paget said. Perfect. Tiffany turned a thousand-watt smile on Max. This must be Max. Mother told me a little bit about you, but she didn't mention how handsome you are. As she enveloped Max into a hug, she gave Paget a look that clearly said they were going to have to talk later.
Now, unless you need the little boy's room, you just come right this way, and I'll introduce you to my husband, Charles. Charles works at Hewlett's, George, and Stillman's. He's a senior partner. Tiffany kept chapping up a storm of social nonsense, and Paget quickly made her way to the washroom. A pad of the hair and a reapplication of mascara and gloss were the best she could do under the circumstances. Thank goodness she had put on her first dress selection for the weekend before leaving the apartment, since there was no time to change now. Fortunately, the fabric was forgiving and hadn't wrinkled on the drive over. Paget made her way to the dining room and was greeted by Tricia and Jordan, a happy couple to be. "'Jordan, do you remember my Aunt Paget? She now lives in—' She cocked her head. "'What neighborhood was it?' Her tone indicated that it was one that she was sure not to know, since no one of her social status would ever go there. Paget supplied the name of her neighborhood, Riley, fully expecting Tricia to put it down in a disdainful manner. "'That's right, and you're going to college as well!' Tricia made it sound like Paget was a bright child for supplying the right answer. Jordan held out his hand, and she shook it in greeting. "'Always nice to see you again, Aunt Paget. We're so glad you could come.' "'Thank you,' Paget's eye caught Tiffany's. "'If you'll excuse me?' As she made her way to Tiffany, Paget could hear Tricia explain to Jordan, "'Grandmother says she's going through a midlife crisis. If I ever get that way when we're old, put me in therapy or something.' Paget winced. She knew her life choices weren't going over exactly well with her family, but for her mom to put it down to midlife crisis? Paget definitely wasn't that old. Tiffany grabbed her arm and blathered something about needing Paget's opinion on cheese balls before dragging her into the kitchen while the catering staff was busy working on the evening's menu. She turned on Paget in astonishing speed. First of all, how dare you say he was homeless to Mother and I? He's obviously not. You gave her a week of worry, and I had to put up with it. I don't have time for that since we're hosting all of this, and I've been working myself to the bone trying to make it perfect for Tricia. Tiffany, when is the last time I lied to you? Paget asked sweetly. That time you said Gary was the best man that you'd ever met, and he couldn't possibly humping his secretary, to which I replied Gary was like any other man with a twenty-year-old gorgeous and underqualified secretary. Screwing her? Tiffany replied with some venom. Besides that, Paget furiously whispered. There was no need to bring up how stupid she had been. I don't know, but there's no way that Maxwell Ramsley is homeless. Tiffany rearranged an oar to Irv's tray, perfecting what was already perfect. Who? Paget asked, stunned. Maxwell Ramsley was huge. The Ramsley family was up socially from the Forrester family. It was rich. They had estates and vacation homes. They had a private jet. They owned so many businesses, pharmaceuticals, insurance, hospitals, and more. Maxwell Ramsley had been on the cover of GQ. Paget knew it because Gary had complained bitterly about it. Suddenly, she knew why Max had looked so familiar. Maxwell Ramsley. Of the Ramsleys, Tiffany rolled her eyes. It's very funny of you to say that he was homeless. How did you manage to snag one of America's most eligible bachelors? Paget realized that Tiffany was jealous of her. For the first time ever, she had something that was considered better than what Tiffany had. Yet she didn't know how she felt about Max any more. He lied to her. At the very least, he'd omitted his entire identity. Paget's stomach turned sour. I had no idea. Seriously, scoffed Tiffany. Their mother opened the door and hissed around it. Tiffany! This is the mark of a poor hostess to make her guests come to the kitchen. It's ten past, and dinner should be served before it gets overdone. Neither Tiffany nor Paget commented on the fact that their mother was calling herself a guest in her daughter's home. Mother never frequented the kitchen as she found it beneath her. Both daughters hurried out to the dining room to do the polite, and Paget found herself seated between Max and Earl Milton. Earl wasn't a bad guy. He came from a good family, with old oil money. He was a friendly, nice guy who always tried a little too hard. He still carried his baby fat, and it started a nice comb-over in deference to his balding plate. Everyone liked Earl in a family pet sort of way. His mother managed his life nicely, and some day, when she snagged a wife for him, Paget was sure the wife would manage his life nicely as long as she could manage Mrs. Milton as well. 
Mrs. Milton and Paget's mother were good-standing friends, which meant they shared a polite social call at each other's homes every month, where they commented on the cheesecake, discussed the latest diet fads, and dished the gossip while lamenting or praising their offspring's achievements as the moment required. It was the reason her mother had been promoting Earl to Paget. Paget looked around, and the table was a little off. Mentally, she gave a quick tally. One more male than female. The numbers weren't even, which meant they hadn't expected her to bring Max. Which meant Earl was a setup. They were hoping that she would be the next Mrs. Milton. Considering her circumstances and his limited mental scope, they probably thought it was a fair trade. Paget made polite conversation with Earl, who, to give him credit, was interested in her schooling and attempt at running for mayor. He offered to be a sponsor, which she accepted since she would desperately need cash for the campaign, and there was no way she was going to ask anyone else here for donations. Although politics was long known to be an acceptable thing to do, Paget somehow suspected when it came to her they would think it was a quaint that she was trying her hand at the political arena and then firmly ignore her. After all, what did a former housewife know about politics? Paget turned to Max and sweetly greeted him. "'Are you enjoying your dinner, Mr. Ramsley?' Max winced. "'We should talk about that.' "'Wrong tense. We should have talked about that.' Paget took yet another large sip of wine. How she had missed the good stuff. All she had done was push food around her plate and drink the wine. She had the feeling she might be sloppy drunk before the night was through. Good. It would make it easier to deal with her mother. I didn't want to say anything because I knew you might treat me differently, Max whispered near her ear. Paget gave him a cool look and a little sarcasm. Really? You think I might have treated you differently? Why might you have thought that? All right, we need to talk. Max took the wine out of her hand, forestalling her next large sip, and pulled Paget to her feet. He kept her hand firmly in his and another on her back, pushing her along the huge dining room table headed for the hall. Excuse us. Part of Paget wanted to make a scene right there in the dining room, but she knew it wasn't done. Her mother would be angry, and she had no right to embarrass Tiffany at her party. Besides, Paget did want to have this out. Anger was simmering, and she wasn't a redhead for nothing. Paget and Max ended up in Charles's study, where she jerked her hand out from his and slammed the door closed. Her voice was seething as she threw her hands up in the air. "'Treated you differently? Why would you think that? You're a Ramsley, one of the most prestigious families. Your family owns pharmaceuticals and insurance. Your family could buy my family without a blink. You've gone to Harvard. You've done extreme sporting as your Hosby. You've been on the cover of GQ. You dated a different girl every week. Why would I treat you differently? Why would anyone?' "'I'm not that person any more.' Max ran a hand through his hair in frustration, but it didn't have the same effect on his shorn locks. I've changed. Really? Why on earth are you posing as a homeless person? Was it a big joke? Who does that? Paget hugged herself, angry and hurt. Hanging out with Adam and his friends? What was that? It's not a joke. Max took a deep breath and lowered his voice. It's not a joke. I am homeless, and I like Adam and his friends. They're a lot of fun. You, homeless, one of the Ramsley. Paget snorted. Even Tiffany told me I was stupid for believing that one. It's true, he insisted. It's a long story, but you need to believe me. I haven't lied to you. I don't know what to believe. I don't know anything about you. Paget ignored the stricken look on Max's face and headed for the door. Let's just get through the weekend. Do you want me to leave? Max asked. Paget paused at the door leaning her head against the wood as her hand rested on the knob. Her heart twisted her chest and she remembered all of the outrageous stories he told the kids at the bar and the advice he gave them. She remembered all the times he walked her home and flirted with her, telling her about the stars in that book of his. Paget remembered his kindness to the homeless people like Ed, always making sure he had something to eat. She remembered amazing kisses and touches and looks. She wondered if it had been real or not. Her heart throbbed, and she knew that he had found his way in there somehow. She was in love with this big oaf, and she didn't know who he was any more. Paget wanted the Max that she had been championing, not this man who could easily have championed himself. 
he turned her whole world upside down in so many ways. Paget. Max slowly placed a hand on her shoulder and then turned around to face him, his other hand cupping her cheek. I'll do whatever you want. Paget looked at him miserably. You lied to me. No, I just didn't tell you everything. My husband had a habit of not telling me everything. He didn't tell me about the three or four pieces on the side that he had. Those are the ones that I know about. There might have been more. He didn't tell me that he had no intention of having children. He didn't tell me how bad our finances were. He didn't tell me a lot of things, Paget said sadly. She couldn't help that a tear had found its way out and was going down her cheek. I can't do that again. Then you won't. Max pulled her into his arms, and even though her heart felt like it was breaking, it also felt like it was coming home. Paget just wanted to hold on for a few more minutes and pretend that the last hour hadn't happened. But pretending and ignoring had gotten her bad place before. Paget wiped her eyes and resolutely pulled back. Max gave her his handkerchief and tried to explain. I was born Maxwell Arthur Ramsley, youngest son of David and Rachel Ramsley. I had a blessed childhood with two older brothers, no sisters. I went to Harvard. I enjoyed some good adventures and did some dangerous stunts with my friends at the time. Then I followed my father's footsteps in the family business like he wanted, like all of us Ramsleys are expected to do. My father, David, is the one who owns Ramsley Pharmaceuticals. He's the one who covered everything up with the diabetic drug I was telling you about. Because I refuse to back down, he doesn't talk to me anymore. Neither does my brother Michael. The only one I have any contact with is Noah. I haven't felt like a Ramsley for the past four years, Paget. I don't like using my last name because people expect things from a Ramsley. I'm just a guy who works for a demolition company. I don't want to be judged by my last name anymore. Max ran a hand through his hair, frustrated. I was going to tell you. You were going to tell me, Paget repeated angrily. It seems like you're going to tell me a lot of things, but you never get around to it. What would you have said if I had told you? Max asked. I don't know, Paget exploded. We'll never know, because once again, you didn't tell me. I had to hear it from other people. It makes me feel foolish, like I don't know who you really are. I'm Max, the guy who loves you, Max said a little desperately. That's who I am. Really? Because people who love people don't keep secrets from each other. I don't have any secrets from you, Paget waved her hands around. I don't want to be in a relationship where the truth is being kept from me. I did that already with Gary. It's not fair to me. You're right. Max tried to grab her hand, but she pulled it away. I promise there are no other surprises about me. I'll make sure to tell you absolutely everything about me. It's too late, Max. Paget sighed, the fight going out of her. Let's just get through this weekend. I'd like to keep up appearances in front of my family for the wedding. What about after the wedding? Max asked softly. I don't know, she said tiredly. I'm going to go wash up and redo my makeup. You should go back to dinner. Paget, Max protested, but she waved his words away and left him. In the bathroom, Paget looked at the mirror and reflected on what a fool she had been. She was in love with a chronic liar. Well, maybe liar was too strong of a word, but certainly with a man who withheld the truth when he thought it was convenient to him. She sighed over her aching heart and then washed her blotchy face. Fortunately, she still had some of her good quality makeup left. It was supposed to have gotten her through the wedding, but it was more important to cover up her mottled face right now. She'd go back to department store makeup tomorrow, since it would be all that she had left. A few extra flicks of the mascara wand, and she was ready to go, but she still lingered. Her mother was going to pitch a fit when she found out it was Max Ramsley who was Paget's date. She would think that Paget had played a joke on her, making her think he was homeless. Tiffany already thought that. They would both be angry at her, and it would just make the weekend a lot harder. Paget supposed she'd have to weather their disapproval. It wasn't like they accepted any of her life choices anyway. Mother would be demanding some sort of explanation over the course of the weekend. Paget wondered what she could say to smooth things over. Then suddenly she decided she didn't want to smooth things over. Paget straightened her shoulders and blew out a breath. She could handle her mother. Sort of. With some wine for fortitude. She could handle Max, too. She was just going to pretty much ignore him throughout most of the weekend. 
It didn't take long to find out that the group was on dessert by the time Paget re-entered the dining room. That was fine. She was ready for something sweet and soothing to calm her nerves. It helped that her wine glass had been refilled. Max helped her into a chair. Paget allowed it because she was choosing not to create a scene. Like she had told Max earlier, she simply wanted to get through the weekend. Everyone pretended not to be curious as to why she and Max had left in such a hurry. Mother sent her a silent glare sheathed in a perfect smile that Paget knew so well. She'd be hearing about this whole episode later. Paget spent the rest of the meal ignoring Max and flirting with Earl Milton, who had no idea what was happening. Either no one had ever flirted with Earl before, so he didn't recognize what she was doing, or she was a total failure at it, despite the wine coursing through her veins. It was depressing. Finally, the meal ended with the men going to the library for drinks and the ladies retiring to the parlor for gossip. Paget mingled with the people that she hadn't seen in the year that she had been widowed. Everyone was polite, but Paget knew that she was off their radar. They really didn't want to associate with her. However, she was the aunt of the bride, so they did what was necessary. Paget caught up on the news of people that she no longer had anything in common with. So, Max Ramsley. Pretending he was homeless. I don't know what I did to deserve that, Judith murmured in her ear. Paget sighed. There was no way to win that particular argument. She chose to change the subject instead. Trisha is looking really well. I'm sure she'll make a beautiful bride tomorrow. He's purported to be quite a catch, her mother remarked, undeterred from her original comments on Max. I'm surprised you managed to get him to attend. Charles has been trying to get Ramsley Farmer to switch to become clients of the law firm for some time. This could be quite a feather in his cap. Or he could just focus on his daughter's wedding rather than making this a business weekend, Paget replied sweetly, taking another sip of wine. Socializing is business, Judith slid her sharp look. Where did you meet him, anyways? You wouldn't believe me, Paget said a little bitterly. For a moment she wished Adam had never introduced her to Max. With a delicate sniff, Judith let Paget know what she thought of her answer. Well, it's certainly good of him to come. He's my date, Mom, Paget replied dryly. Don't call me Mom. It's so gauche. Judith gave a delicate shudder. There really was no talking to her. Did I tell you that I've decided to run for mayor? Why would you do a silly thing like that? Her mother looked at her with confusion. Politics is a male sport. Women who enter that fray are seen as unfilled or as domineering. I shouldn't like people to think of you that way. The mayor has some policies I can't agree with, Paget said firmly. I've decided to try to make a difference in the city, to change things for the better. Really, darling... Leave it to the men. It gives them something to do. Her mother smiled as she greeted Mrs. Milton. Betty, you remember Paget. Of course. She brought Max Ramsley. What a coup. I always knew you would land on your feet. Mrs. Milton smiled, but it didn't reach her eyes. And if things don't work out, you just let me know. Earl is currently available, but he might get snatched up as soon as Mercy Whitrow is back in town. Paget highly doubted Mercy was that desperate. But what did she know? Mercy could be on the hunt for her husband number four by now. Paget offered an insincere smile in return. Mrs. Milton, it's so nice to see you. My daughter Sally has finished her schooling. She couldn't be here tonight, but she'll be here tomorrow. Mrs. Milton gasped as though an idea had just occurred to her. You should introduce Max to her. Why would I do that? Paget asked, all innocent. She could see Mrs. Milton's angle. Two single children and a Ramsley was a catch. Mrs. Milton tittered. I'm sure she's just his style. She's turned into a beauty. Paget remembered Sally, and she had looks. They were about the only thing going for her. She also had an error in her head. If Tiffany was right, the plastic surgery had catapulted the girl into every housewife's guard the husband from her list. She was also only twenty-four. I wasn't aware that you knew, Max, Paget said sweetly. He never mentioned. Excuse me? Mrs. Milton was confused. Well, if you know his style, then you must know him. I'm sure you can shove Sally at him without my help. Paget smiled in satisfaction over the barb as she took a sip from her wine glass. Mrs. Milton's false smile disappeared very quickly. 
I know you've come down in the world, but there's no reason to be rude. I believe my daughter is just staking her claim, Padgett's mother chimed in coolly. To get people thinking that her daughter was dating Max would put her one above them. Mrs. Milton gave an ill-mannered humph. Men can be fickle, as Paget here knows. The smile left Paget's mouth. Max isn't. She hoped she was telling the truth. She really didn't know. Although why she should care if he was faithful or not was beyond her since she was mad at him. His track record certainly didn't help him as he had been a serious player when he was younger. We'll see. With that parting shot, Mrs. Milton made her way to another group of people to socialize with. Paget raised her wine glass for another drink and turned to her mother. Thank you for defending me. Oh, I wasn't, Judith remarked as she looked over the crowd. I was just making sure that she remembers that it's our connection to the Ramsleys, not hers or anyone else's. She should have known, Paget thought. There really wasn't one maternal bone in her mother's body. The groups rejoined, and everyone went out onto the terrace as more arrivals slowly filled out the numbers. Oars de herbs and champagne flowed. It was a long night of socializing, and Paget was bone-tired after keeping face to previous sorority sisters, old friends, and old acquaintances. She hated how they looked down on her and called her ambitions quaint. She hated it more that they all seemed surprised that Max Ramsley was there by her side for most of the night, both of them pretending in strained silence to be a couple. It was as if no one thought she was good enough for him. By the time the evening was drawing to a close, Paget felt all of two feet tall. She wondered why she had even come. Perhaps all she was good for was Earl Milton. What a depressing thought. Paget managed to locate Tiffany while Max was bogged down with Charles hounding him for a day to discuss changing law firms to represent the Ramsley's empire. "'What a wonderful evening, Tiffany. You must be so pleased,' Paget automatically complimented her sister. "'It went well enough. I wish the caterers had been better, but it's hard to get good service these days.' Tiffany made the usual noises, even though she knew it had all gone off without a hitch. Paget nodded as though she agreed with what Tiffany had said. The catering job had been superb, in her opinion, but to say otherwise would be to contradict her sister, which just shouldn't be done. It was easier this way. "'What rooms did you put Max and I in? I should have asked sooner, but with being late for dinner—' "'The Rosewood Room,' Tiffany replied. Paget waited, but Tiffany didn't add to her reply. "'And?' "'And what? You're both in the Rosewood Room,' Tiffany nodded and gave a wave to a couple who were departing. Together? Since when are you in a liberal view? Paget reminded herself that no one had actually expected her to bring a date. However, she really did not want to share a room with Max right now. Tiffany sighed and explained her reasoning like Paget was a little slow. You've been a married woman. It's not like there's your virtue to protect. Even Mother didn't object. All the other rooms are full, so unless he wants a sofa... The rosewood will be fine. Thank you, Tiffany. Paget said a little stiffly. She joined Max and Charles, hooking an arm through Max's. I am simply fatigued. You don't mind, do you, Charles? Charles, being polite, could not refuse her taking Max from him. Paget steered both of them inside and promptly dropped his arm before heading up the stairs. Thank you for rescuing me, Max said carefully. Charles is harmless, Paget replied sardonically. He may be harmless, but he certainly is tenacious. Mother thinks it would be a feather in his cap if he could get Ramsley Pharma as a client. Paget turned right at the top of the staircase. I tried to tell him I was no longer with the company. Max was cautious to keep his voice neutral. Paget was talking to him, and he didn't want to ruin it. He wouldn't take no for an answer. What did you do? Paget inquired. She supposed the wine could be to blame for her asking. She certainly wasn't curious. At least, that's what she told herself. I gave him Michael's number. It took Paget a moment to place the name. Your oldest brother? Max smiled, then abruptly sobered. Yep, maybe he'll get mad enough to call me. Paget felt a kinship with this Michael that she had never met. They were both mad at Max. They had that in common. She wondered if he was single. Maybe she should give him a call, and they could both give Max the silent treatment together. Only, she wasn't doing very good at the silent treatment, since she was still talking to him. I should warn you, 
Tiffany put us together for accommodations, Paget said as she opened the door to the bedroom. You can have the floor. I'm good with the floor, Max said easily. He was surprised that Paget was going to allow him to sleep in the same room. He supposed it was all part of her saving face in front of her family. Well, as long as it kept him close to her, he wasn't going to complain. He had this weekend to figure out a way to get her to forgive him and to win her back. Paget checked on her dresses for the rest of the weekend. She knew it was silly, but she needed to make sure that they had been hung right so they wouldn't wrinkle. Little things like this were important. Tomorrow was just as much about how everyone else looked as the bride looked. The gift she had gotten for Trisha and Jordan was still wrapped perfectly and sitting on the side dresser. It wasn't much, but hopefully the bride would like it. It was a canvas painting by the up-and-coming artist that Paget knew was going to go places. Dix's art was amazing, and some day Paget hoped this piece would be worth much more than what she had paid for it. It was an investment of sorts. Max offered her the washroom first, and Paget grabbed her nightwear. It was nothing more than a dark tee with her cut-off shorts. She hadn't expected to share a room, and so had opted for comfortable. Washing away her makeup, she stared at her reflection in the mirror. What was she going to do? She was in love with a man who didn't always tell her the truth. She wondered if she could get her dad to do a background check on Max, to see if he was telling her everything. The problem was, as much as she loved him and as much as he might promise to tell her everything from now on, she wasn't sure she could trust him. Look where trust had gotten her with Gary. The problem was her heart still ached for him. Even now, she just wanted to go into the bedroom and let him hug her, talk to her with his sexy voice, tell her it was all going to be all right. Paget groaned. She sure could pick men. She left the washroom and let Max have his turn. While he was there, she threw a pillow on the floor and followed it with the extra bed cover. He was the homeless one. She was sure he'd slept in work circumstances. Paget settled herself into bed and shut off the light. She wondered how she was going to get any sleep. She listened as Max got settled on the floor. Thanks for the blanket and pillow, he said. I promise I'm going to make this up to you. Paget sighed. That's the problem, Max. I don't want you to make things up to me. I wish you'd just been honest in the first place. Here's the honest truth, Max sighed in frustration. I want to watch sunsets and sunrises with you. I want to hold your hand every day I get a chance to. I want to take long walks through the autumn leaves with you and have snowball fights with you in the winter. I want to explore every inch of your body. I want to have kids with you. I want to marry you some day soon and watch the most amazing, gorgeous, talented woman I know come up the aisle to me. I want to surprise you with gifts and romantic evenings. I might even swallow my pride and get my brother Michael to teach me how to write some poetry for you, because you deserve poetry. I'm not going to sing for you. I'm an awful singer, and I know you wouldn't want to hear dogs howl and babies cry. I want to take you to the beach. I want to take you to the Yankees game. I want to grow old with you and end up in some little retirement community in Florida, discussing how badly our dentures fit and if the grass was cut low enough or whether we should buy some of those plastic long flamingo ornament things. That's what's honest, Paget. Paget bit her lip. She wanted all of those things, too. She wiped away a tear and made a decision. Maybe it was all the wine she drank tonight. She might regret it, or it might be the best one of her life. Paget got out of bed and grabbed Max's blanket. She threw it back on the bed. Hey! Max sat up and gave her the opportunity to grab his pillow and throw it back on the bed as well. Alarmed, he scrambled to his feet. Paget, honey, please, I'd like to stay. Don't throw me out. If you ever, ever lie to me or withhold the truth from me again, we are done. Do you understand? Paget stated in a wobbly voice, poking him in the chest with a finger for emphasis. Yes, totally, I, I promise. Max was quick to respond. Unless you mess it up. We are getting the plastic flamingos, she said as she poked him again. Absolutely, anything you want, he is quick to promise. Okay, she sniffed. She turned on her heel and got back into bed. Um, Paget? Max asked cautiously. He wasn't sure what to do since she had confiscated his bedding. You can sleep in the bed, but you have to stay on your side. I'm still mad, she fluffed her pillow then punched it. And you're going to stop sleeping on the street. Either you get a place of your own, or you sleep on my couch, so I don't have to worry about you all the time. Okay. Max gingerly got in the bed, making sure not to cross into her territory. He was thankful that this meant that she might be taking him back, and he had no intentions of screwing it up. Anything else you'd like? I'll let you know when I think of it. She sniffled again and wiped away a tear. 
She turned over so that he was to her back and hugged her pillow. Back rub, foot massage, whatever you want, he offered. Paget had a watery life. He might regret that offer when we're old and I've got corns and bunions. I promise I will rub your bunions, darling, Max said. Paget turned back to him. How about just a hug for now? That I can definitely do. Max sidled closer and pulled her into his arms, gently holding her. Paget snuggled close and listened to his comforting heartbeat. She was still mad, she told herself, as she drifted off to sleep. Thank you for listening. If you enjoyed this chapter, please look for the next chapter of The Reverse Cinderella. Also, please click the bell for notifications so that you don't miss any videos. This is free for you and would really help me grow my audience with the algorithms. Thank you. Chapter 9 Paget spread cream cheese over a toasted bagel and bit into it with relish. She was one of the few people who had risen in time to enjoy the breakfast spread that had been set out for the guests who had stayed overnight. Brunch would be much better attended. Right now everyone was scattered across the terrace in small groups enjoying the cool morning air. She had left Max sleeping upstairs. For a few minutes she'd simply stared at him, enjoying the luxury of trying to memorize his face. He was a handsome man and she wondered what he would look like when he was older. She looked forward to finding out. I'd laid off the bagel and cream cheese, Tiffany remarked as she sat down at Paget's table. You've gained weight. The creamy goodness turned to sawdust in Paget's mouth. She dropped the rest of the bagel on her plate. Good morning, Tiffany. How are things going? Looking forward to today? Why would I look forward to Trisha's wedding? She's my youngest. Now everyone will remark how good I look for my age. Tiffany sipped her green tea. No sugar, of course. I'm going to need another facelift. Paget didn't answer Tiffany's comment. Her sister looked perfect as always. She'd stirred her own strawberry tea and took a sip. I hope you're going to wear something nicer than the dress you wore last night, Tiffany remarked. Excuse me? Paget looked at her sister in surprise. Tell me you didn't find it in some discount store? Tiffany shuddered. It looked awfully cheap. That dress had put a dent of twelve hundred dollars in Paget's credit card. She bit her lip. I can't afford the best any more, Tiffany. Well, the way that dress looked, you might as well have showed up in a paper sack. Tiffany sipped her tea and wrinkled her nose. Please tell me of something better for the wedding. Paget had two dresses upstairs. One was paid for, a chance find at a second-hand store that she had paid a fraction of the retail price for. However, if Tiffany had pulled her nose up at last night's dress, then there was no doubt she would abhor this choice. The other dress was on discount from a shop that Paget used to frequent. It was still expensive, and Paget had crossed her fingers when she slid her credit card through the reader. It was too much. Paget knew that she should just return it. Otherwise, she was going to be in rougher financial shape than she already was. I do. I'm just not sure if I should wear it, Paget murmured. Well, if you come in something worse than last night, you might as well just go home. It would be better than having everyone pity me, because my sister can't be bothered to dress appropriately. Tiffany dumped the rest of her tea into a potted plant and stood. Really, Paget, you still represent this family. Now is not the time to go freestyle and hippie. Paget's mouth dropped open as she watched her sister leave. She and Tiffany had never been especially close, but her sister didn't normally make a habit of openly insulting her. A cell phone rang, and Paget realized it was hers. She didn't recognize the number, but chose to answer it anyways. "'Mrs. Williams, this is Helen from First National Credit. Am I speaking to pay Paget Williams?' "'Speaking. Paget wondered why her credit card company would be calling her. "'Mrs. Williams, as a courtesy, we'd like to inform you that you are overdrawn on your credit card by two thousand eight hundred. $73.12. Your current balance is $14,683.08. You have missed your last two payments. We require payment of $2,706 by the 17th of this month. Otherwise, we will have to pursue collections. We will not be extending you any further credit until payments have been made. Do you have any questions, Mrs. Williams? Paget wondered how the numbers had gotten so big. She didn't have $2,700 for a payment. She could feel panic unfolding in her chest. 
She knew she had spent extravagantly for the wedding, considering her budget. Paget swallowed thickly and replied, trying to breathe normally. No, no questions. Thank you, Mrs. Williams. We look forward to your payment. Have a nice day. Helen ended the call. Paget put her cell phone down and stared at it. She needed to return the expensive dress. It was the only solution to her credit card problem. However, Tiffany said she might as well go home if she wore anything inferior to the wedding. Paget knew Tiffany would never lend her a dress. She wouldn't fit them anyways. Tiffany was a size one. Paget had bloomed from a size three to a size six since Gary's death. Could she wear the dress and then return it? If she was careful and ate nothing at dinner, drank nothing but water, kept it clean as possible, and removed it immediately after the reception, could she do it? Did she dare? Paget dropped her head in her hands, and Tiffany's scathing words rang in her ears. What choice did she have? The wedding was a complete social success. Paget saw reporters from People's Magazine and a couple other magazines taking photos and asking questions. Tiffany would be pleased to see her daughter make a splash. Trisha was stunningly beautiful, and Jordan looked very handsome. They made a gorgeous couple. The doves went up into the sky without a hitch, despite Aunt Lucille worrying they might poop on someone during their flight. Speeches were given, and everyone toasted the bride and groom happily. Paget did the best she could to keep the dress perfectly clean. She had carefully tucked the attached tag inside with a bobby pin. Her hair was a mass of curls, left down to camouflage the bump the tag made. She knew the dress wasn't up to the standards of the majority of women in attendance today, but it was the best she had. She only hoped that she could get through the night and return it next week. She pushed her food gently around her plate and didn't eat. She drank only water. Thankfully, she had loaded up on brunch before the wedding, so she wasn't entirely starving. Max leaned in and asked if she wasn't hungry. She smiled and replied that she was fine, then took another sip of water. So far, the dress was okay. Paget, on the other hand, felt like a bundle of nerves. She wouldn't be able to relax until she got the dress off and safely back in the garment bag. At the reception, she danced with Max. She felt good about turning down Earl. He tended to be sweaty, and she really didn't need a palm print on her waist. She turned down a bunch of others and simply enjoyed being with Max. It was a lovely wedding. Max went to get them a couple of drinks. Correction, he went to get himself a drink and her another glass of water. He was being very attentive. Then again, he usually was. Paget loved this about him. She was thinking about all the other things she loved about Max while she sat at their table waiting for his return, when Paget felt a sharp tug at the back of her dress and turned to see her mother. Judith grabbed Paget's hand and put the sail tag in her palm. Your tag was sticking out. Her tag. The tag that had to be attached to return the dress. The dress that had put Paget's credit card over its limit, causing the company to call her this morning and suspend her credit card. Paget gulped in some air, but didn't feel like she was getting any in. She felt like she was drowning. Paget knew she shouldn't have worn this dress, but Tiffany's snide remarks about yesterday's dress at breakfast had compelled her. Now what was she going to do? She couldn't return the dress and get her credit back. Paget could see black spots in front of her eyes. Quickly, she leaned down and ducked her head near to her knees, the dress being too constricting to let her put her head between them. She closed her eyes and prayed that she wasn't going to faint. Oh, don't be so dramatic, Judith remarked snidely. It was just a tag, although if you were going to advertise how much you paid for a dress, you could have bought a pricier one. No, mother, I couldn't. I couldn't afford this one, Paget said, fighting hysteria. I shouldn't have worn it, let alone even bought it. Sit up. It's embarrassing, her mother hissed at her. Of course you could afford it. Why wouldn't you be able to? Gary died in debt. There's no money. Haven't you figured that out by now? Paget blinked back tears of frustration. If that's the case, I don't see why you won't take our offer of the condo. Judith sat down and sipped from her champagne flute. Could you please get Max? Paget asked miserably. He was the only one who would understand right now. He was the only one she wanted right now. Paget's life was a mess, and she had only made it worse. She just wanted the one person that she knew, without a shadow of a doubt, who would put her first, who would help her figure this out without putting her down, who believed in her, who loved her. 
With a sigh, Judith set down her fluted glass and got up to find Max. Thankful, Paget closed her eyes and concentrated on breathing slow and not passing out. After a few long minutes, Max was crouched beside Paget, one hand on her knee and the other on her shoulder. Paget, what's wrong? How do I help? Please get me out of here, Paget whispered. Without further questioning, Max simply had her wrap an arm around his neck and picked her up. He took her through the patio, into the house, and then to the bedroom that they had shared. He sat her on the bed and knelt in front of her. Do you want to talk about it? I don't know why I came, Paget sniffed. They belittle me. They insult me. They don't believe that I can accomplish anything with my life other than being someone's plus one. Your niece got married. You love your family. You made the effort. Max gently opened her hand and looked at the tag. What's this? Paget wiped away tears. I overextended my credit to try to match their expectations. I'm overdrawn on my bank account. I only paid a partial for this month's rent. I was stupid. Four thousand two hundred dollars, Max gave a low whistle. I was planning on returning it after the weekend, but my mother ripped the tag off. She thought she was doing me a favor. Paget gave a bitter laugh. She looked at her manicured nails and wished she hadn't gotten them done. I've never had a budget before this year, and I find that I'm not terribly good at it. I've been trying hard to economize. This was supposed to be one last party, and then it was all over. I don't know what I'm going to do. You're going to wash your face, redo your makeup, and then you and I are going to go back out there. We're going to ignore all of them. It's a party, and we can enjoy it together, the two of us. He looked at Paget so sincerely that she didn't have the heart to tell him that she didn't want to. Then, on Monday, we'll find a consignment shop and we'll put up the dress for a loss. I'll put up two of my suits. Max, you can't do that, Paget protested. Pick the one you like the best, and that's the one I'll save out of the three I have, Max said reasonably. We'll get the money to make you more comfortable with your finances. It's only a short-term solution. What you need is a roommate, and I'm volunteering. I'll sleep on the couch, pay half the rent, utilities, groceries. It should help ease some of the financial burden you're under. What about paying the hospital bills? Will you be able to afford helping me? Paget wiped another tear as it rolled down her cheek. It will just take longer to pay back. That's okay. If we do this together, we'll both slowly get it all sorted out. Max rubbed her arms gently. Paget nodded. Thank you. Hey, I love you. Max gave her a lopsided smile. If you like, I'll budget for both of us. I'd rather you teach me, Paget smiled back in spite of her misery. He really was an amazing man, and she was lucky to have him. Okay, I can do that. Paget took a deep breath. I'm going to change into my less expensive dress so that I don't have to worry about ruining this one with some spilled wine or something. Is that why you were only having water all night? Max asked gently. She nodded. I know it's wrong to return a dress you've worn, but it was all that I could think of to do. Max leaned up and kissed her on the forehead. Well, if you change, does that mean you can have cake tonight? Paget gave a watery smile. Yes. Well then, get changed. You and I want some of that cake. Plus, I know you don't want to miss out on the wine. It's the good stuff. She laughed, then gave Max a kiss. It took him moments to change, fix her makeup, and take his arm so that they could return to the party and eat cake together. Thank you for listening. If you enjoyed this chapter, please look for the next chapter of The Reverse Cinderella. Also, please like this video. This is free for you and would really help me grow my audience with the algorithms. Thank you. Chapter 10 Paget smiled until it felt like her face was going to crack, and then she smiled some more. She was at Barney's with Adam, Max, and a multitude of others, waiting for the results to be announced from the mayoral race. There were even reporters there, waiting to catch her statement. It was a wonderful night with her supporters, but she would be glad when it was over. Adam checked his phone for the up-to-date status on the race. The preliminary findings should be released any moment. Finally, he saw the end results and showed them to Paget. Someone had given her a microphone, purloined from the karaoke machine, no doubt. Max helped her so that she could stand on a table and everyone could see her. 
Paget cleared her throat and tapped the microphone to get everyone's attention. I'd like to thank all of you for being here. Many of you were involved directly with my campaign, and maybe some of you even voted for me today. I really appreciate your support. None of this would have been possible without you. The good news is that Mayor Johns is now the former mayor of the city. There was a cheer from the crowd over this, people raising their drinks in a toast. The other news is that Tom Bailey, the late comer to the race and former councillor of the city, won the post of mayor, Paget announced. There were some boos from the crowd. Paget held up a hand and they quieted down. I have to say, I am a little relieved. I was underqualified and not ready to take on such a demanding, prestigious role as the mayor's office. I would have done everything I could to be the best mayor possible, but I am glad that someone of Mr. Bailey's experience and caliber has been elected to the position. Mr. Bailey and I agreed on a number of key issues that the city faces, including helping those who need it most, from our school children to the homeless on the streets. Mr. Bailey hopes to implement his Back to Home program, which will include more funding for shelters, counseling services, and assistance for those looking to apply to the lower income housing programs. I am very happy to support Mr. Bailey with this program. I am also very pleased to be able to focus my attention back to my schooling and my passion for broadcasting. I propose a toast to Mr. Bailey. May he be the best mayor this city has ever had. Paget raised her glass of wine and everyone cheered. She handed off the microphone and Max helped her down from the table. See, I think you would have made a great politician, Adam said. You certainly have a knack for speeches. Paget laughed. Honestly, I was terrified and forgot all my talking points. I just let my mouth run. It was great, Max's husky voice was in her ear. You are natural. She leaned happily against him. I've never been so relieved to lose. Now life can get back to normal. I think you would have made a great mare, Dix said. I would have come and bugged you at the office every day. In fact, I would have demanded to be your assistant or something. I would have loved to have you with me, Paget smiled. You know you would have set the city on its ear. Maybe you should run for mayor next election. Dix shuddered and took a drink of her beer. No, not me. So where's the ring? Adam asked. Excuse me? Paget raised an eyebrow. What do you mean, where's the ring? She doesn't have it yet, Max said dryly. Oh, dude, I thought you were going to... Before... Adam slapped a hand across his face. I am so sorry. I decided to set a couple of things up for after the race, Max sighed. The fireworks would have worked better that way. Fireworks? Paget turned to look at Max and raised an eyebrow. Are you withholding things from me again? Whoa! Max held up his hands in surrender. It was a surprise for tonight. Surprises aren't surprises if I tell you what's going to happen before they happen. What's this about a ring? Paget tilted her head and waited. Well, I'm kind of thinking I should cancel everything and try something else, Max said. Give it up, Max, Dix laughed. She heard the word ring. No woman is going to let that word go, so you might as well go ahead with it. You knew as well, Paget looked at her friend. Yep, Dix grinned unrepentantly. Tell me, Paget narrowed her eyes at Max. We're supposed to go to the roof, he sighed and played with Paget's hair. There's champagne up there. There's a telescope up there. We're supposed to go look at the harbor, where I have a lot of boaters setting up a nice message for you. Then I was going to go down on one knee with the ring, and I'm pretty sure you'd say yes. I hope you say yes. Then there were fireworks scheduled. Really? Paget breathed. He really was the most romantic and creative man. Max shrugged. Well, the surprise is ruined now. Paget leaned up and gave Max a kiss. Yes, I'm saying yes. Dick snorted. Paget, he didn't even ask. Then I'll fix that. Max grinned as he got down on one knee, holding Paget's hand. Paget, will you do me the honor of becoming my wife? Paget nodded through her tears. People around them started cheering and clapping. She was sure a reporter got a picture, but she didn't care. Let it end up in the newspapers. Her night couldn't get much better. Max took a small ring out of his pocket and gently put it on her finger. It was delicate and understated. Paget instantly fell in love with it. Max held her in his arms and whispered in her ear, I know it's not much since we're on a budget right now, but maybe we can replace the diamond for something bigger later. 
Don't you dare, Paget scolded him with a smile. It's perfect. They had a wonderful night at Barney's, and many came up to the roof to watch the fireworks later. Paget and Max walked home, hand in hand, enjoying the night. She noticed that Ed was no longer on the park bench. Ed saved enough to put a deposit down on a little apartment on this place about an hour away. It's in a small town, and everything he needs is in walking distance, Max replied. He left today. I'll miss him, Paget said. I'm glad he's going to be okay. Max smiled. I got his address so we can send him cards for the holidays and maybe the occasional care package. Paget teared up and hugged Max. That's a wonderful idea. Max held her. He looked uncertainly into her eyes. Are you sure about the ring? I really do mean about getting a larger diamond later when we can afford it. I'll hide it before I let you change it, Paget warned. She gave Max a kiss. I love it and I love you. Max smiled. He really was the luckiest of men. Thank you for listening. If you enjoyed this chapter, please look for the epilogue of The Reverse Cinderella. This will give you a sneak peek into the next Ramsley book, Words Unspoken. Also, please subscribe to the channel to enjoy other audiobooks, helpful videos, and insights into writing. This is free for you and would really help me grow my audience with the algorithms. Thank you. Epilogue Paget had graduated with honors, and Adam had introduced her to his friends and employers at an internet vlogging and podcasting show. They were impressed by her portfolio, and she was able to start part-time co-hosting a show with a chance at full-time work should things work out. She also landed a part-time job at a local radio station, which saw her getting coffees and doing research work, but she didn't mind. It was a start, and both were steady paychecks. Max was working toward managing the demolition company. The owner wanted to retire and was slowly handing over the responsibilities and the company over. It would be a long process, but Max was happy to have the opportunity to work hard for such an achievement, even if he didn't enjoy all the paperwork. Paget was very proud of him. Finally, except for the student loan, both of their debts had been paid off. It had taken over a year of hard work and careful balancing. Now they could breathe a lot easier about their finances, which is why they had been planning the wedding. A classy but less costly country club just after Thanksgiving when it was cheaper to rent. Flowers that were in season rather than imported and expensive. Fewer guests than most society weddings. Paget didn't care. It was going to be wonderful. And if she chose to get her dress from the discount rack, at least it was paid for. They argued gently about who to invite. Mostly, it would be friends. However, Max's family was a problem. While he wanted to invite his mother, his father had rejected him. He wasn't certain if she would come. Noah and Elle were already friends with Paget and a great support. Elle had managed to steer Paget through a lot of the wedding planning hoops already. It was Michael that concerned Max the most. All they could do was invite him and hope that he would come. Paget moved the wedding invitation samples across the kitchen table and tried to think of what script she would like best. Max had stated a preference for red to match the bridesmaids' dresses, but Paget wasn't sure. The doorbell rang. Paget looked at Max in surprise. I thought you said you were going out to grab dinner. I am. I'll get it in a minute. Max smiled at her as he opened the door. The smile slipped away as he looked at the man before him. Older impeccably dressed, with just a touch of grey at the temples. Paget could tell that they were related. It took a moment before Max could say his brother's name in surprise. Michael. If you enjoyed Max and Paget's story in the Reverse Cinderella, book two of the Ramsley Brothers series, then continue the magic with Michael and Anne's story in Unspoken Words, book three of the Ramsley Brothers series. Unspoken Words just his secretary. Anne Schaefer has loved her boss for years, but he's never picked up on any of the hints, small or large, that she's given him. Finally, she's decided he never will, so she's put in her resignation and is going to find her happily ever after without him. What he never said. Michael Ramsley is the oldest of billionaire David Ramsley's sons. He's been in love with Anne for a long time, but the boss doesn't date his employees. 
Now Anne has quit at the very worst time, right after a life-threatening prognosis. Finally, Michael realizes the worst thing that can happen is losing Anne. Can he convince her to stay when he can no longer say the words? You can find Unspoken Words and the other books from the Ramsey Brothers series on Amazon. If you have Kindle Unlimited, they can be downloaded there as well.